awake about lunchtime. My calendar on my watch tells me that it's the 15th of December. Christmas is coming. I get showered, the side of my face still swollen and tender, and I dress and head next door. Blades is still asleep. The cunt sleeps deeply. He's half blind without his specs. There they are on the bedside table. I pick them up. Leaving the hotel, I take a stroll over by the canal streets, and I spot a likely corner cafe for a late breakfast. En route, I pull the specs out of my pocket. These lenses are so thick. I put them on and lean over the green balustrade and watch a distorted tug go down the canal. How could any cunt wear those? Thick though they may be, in a contest with the grinding, seg-ridden heel of Bruce Robertson's shoes, there was only going to be one winner. I twist, grinning at the satisfying crack they make on the cobblestones. Then, with a piece of footwork so deft that it would have Tom Stronach hitting the rewind button on the VCR in appreciation, I flick the broken specks into the Herengracht and watch as its still waters claim them. When I get back to the hotel, Blades is in a hell of a state, sitting in his bed. Bruce, is that you? I can't find my glasses. I, I don't know what I've done with them. I had them last night. Oh, hey, you were three sheets last night, I tell him. Yes, but I had my glasses. Oh, listen, Blazy, come to think it. I didn't mind you having glasses on last night. Oh, my God. I can't see, Bruce. Never mind, Brother Blades. Bruce Robertson will be your eyes. I'll pick the horse for you, son. Denny, you worry. Premium minge. But the only butts that come into it are the ones we'll be fucking doing that red light district. Now fling that coat on and let's paint the tune red. It's our last day. I'm leading Bladesy over to the red light district. The hurdy gurdy wheezes out some atmospheric Dutch music. The guy that winds it up has his hat out for change, but he's wasting his time with me. Every red cent is designated whoring and drugs money. Even grub is a luxury at the moment. I turn away from the outstretched cap and scramble to avoid an approaching bike as we're standing in the cycle lane, but blades is too slow. It rams him, though not at force. The cloggy cunt starts shouting at him. Glutzak! Asshole! I keep a tighter grip on him. The wee cunt shaking through pish withdrawal in fear. After a bit, I steer him into a fat whore's den and leave him. Bruce, I, I, he stammers. Look after my mate, doll, I wink at her. He's lost his specs and his mince pies only too good. I look after him good, she says in a Caribbean accent. I, 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 blades he moans. I take special care of you, big boy, the whore says, leading him into her den. I then set out on my day's hooring, leaving the wee cunt to find his own way back. I go back to my wee student girl. I got so carried away, I just clean forgot about my mucker, Brother Blades. An oversight on my part. When I return back to Cock City a few hours later, Blades is home, and he's pissed off. He looks terrible. I told you to stay there, Bladesy. Where did you get to? I was worried sick. I, uh, actually, I uh, uh, took a taxi. You were gone so long. She wouldn't let me stay until you came back. The girl in the room. Well, you missed a good time, I tell him. I was sorely tempted to leave the half-blind cunt in the dam. But I decide that he has his uses. In the airport lounge bar at Schiphol, I wait until Blades has gone to the lavvy. Then I put a porn movie and some of the Charlie I scored earlier into his bag. It's a no-lose situation for me as we go through the customs back in Edinburgh. 
either have the pleasure of seeing Bladesy's coupon as he gets huckled, leaving me to explain to Bunty that I wasn't into Amsterdam. I was convinced that we were going to Scarborough, but Cliff insisted. Or, alternatively, he gets off scot-free, and I've got some quality sniff and wallpaper paste mix. It's the later scenario, as Bladesy strolls through the customs with ease. I'm more relieved that they didn't open my bag. The flannels, shirts, socks and kecks were kicking up a real eye-watering furore in there. And while I'm obviously happy to have some quality gear as I retrieve the goods while Brother Blades takes another piss at Edinburgh Airport, I'm a little disappointed that Bunty hasn't had the opportunity of seeing the essentially depraved nature of the creature she married. But there's time enough for that. Post-Holiday Blues My first day back after a holiday, and that cunt Toll calls me into his office. There's something different about that spastic, and it takes me a second to realise what it is. Then I see it. He's dispensed with the brow cream and blow-dried his hair, back-combing it. A new Toll. A media-friendly, softer, slicker, more youthful, trendy image for the modern law enforcement officer in a democracy. He looks like a fucking simpering poof, self-conscious and effete. Oh, that barn that will take some getting used to. Oh, no, you don't, sister toll. Same fucking rules. In your absence, Amanda Drummond's been taking the leading role in the investigation. I've decided after a great deal of deliberation that I want this state of affairs to continue. I feel my holiday euphoria evaporate in the face of the heat from Toll's bombshell. My response is unformed and undignified. A silly wee... I stammer. I expect you to give her full cooperation, Bruce. Since you've been away, the media have got interested again. The forum's been making a lot of noises. It seems that you've been a bit lax on the community relations side. It's exactly that area that Amanda's strong in. It's horses for courses, Bruce. Toll nods semi-apologetically. You'll have to go with me on this just now. He snaps truculently as I feel the words, Listen, brother Toll, dry in my throat. I can only stand there like a fag hag outside the bogs of some Nancy boy meat-packing disco just before last orders, as Toll picks up the phone. Amanda, Bruce is back. Can you come up here and brief him on what's been happening? He puts the phone down. Look, uh, Gus Bain has filled me in, I start. I just want to go. I need to take stock before I can face that gloating dyke Drummond. Gus isn't on the ball, Bruce. He's going nowhere, Toll says impatiently. Well, that makes me feel good, as I had Gus marked down as almost a serious rival in the promo stakes. It's out of order, though. Toll bad-mouthing the old cunt like that. Good news for me, though. I'm feeling a bit more up as Drumsticks comes in and gives me a look of distaste, and it makes me feel even more comfortable that she evidently hates doing this as much as I do. Hi, Mandy, I smile. Did you have a good holiday, Bruce? she asks with a forced civility for Toll's sake. Not bad at all. Holland, wasn't it? Yes, it's a regular jaunt, a very civilised country. Now, the landscape's a bit flat, though, isn't it? Toll interjects. I like it, I shrug. It provides an interesting contrast with Scotland's more rugged terrain. What is there to do there? Drummond probes. She wants me to say whores and drugs in front of Toll. It's a very relaxing place. You can sit in a cafe and just watch the world go by with a nice coffee. I shudder slightly as the hangover kicks in. Fucking cunts are trying to wind me up. 
But what do they know? Nothing. Zilch. Sweet fuck all. Some total the big fucking zero. I've heard that Amsterdam has a lot of drug problems, Toll says, looking at me challengingly. Yes, that's the downside of the city. It's far too liberal, and as a result, it does attract scum. Anyway, enough idle banter about holidays. What about the case? I say coldly and briskly, making Toll and Drummond look like the frivolous lightweights they are. Toll looks a bit knocked that I've stolen a mark on him. He'd better get used to it, because once I'm promoted, that's the way it'll be. I'm fucked if I'm taking any of his bullshit then. Drummond starts rabbiting on a load of shite, which, however you dress it up, amounts to fuck all has happened since I've been away, just as I guessed. How the fuck did they ever expect to make progress with a case like this in the absence of the main player? That's the problem with this wee team of ours. Too many Stronachs know enough Dalglishes. And uh, Valerie Johnson, the girl on the cloakroom, has stated that Alex Settrington and David Gorman were definitely in the club that night. Drummond's wearing a white blouse and has a darker coloured brow and which is visible through it. Uh, I'd give they tits a wee squeeze. Only as a personal favour to her, mind you. That would give her something to frig about. She catches where my eyes are and ostentatiously does up her jacket. Aye, you wish, you fucking daft cow. So what we have to do is to pull in Settrington and Gorman for questioning, she continues. I don't think that that would be the way to play it, Mandy, my sweet, I pleasantly interject. And she goes to pull me up, but I talk over her, raising my voice. Settrington and Gorman are hardened criminals. They're veterans of questioning. They'll give away Scottish Football Association, and they'll have a smart ass lawyer like Conrad Donaldson doing here straight away. I note Toll's mouth puckering in resigned distaste at the acknowledgement of my point. If they know we're on to them, they'll just close ranks. I know these bastards. I think we should keep them under observation, see what they're getting up to. One of their mates is a grass, and I can lean on him. Drummond has lost the moment, and Toll's nodding vigorously. I agree, Bruce, he says. These are crafty bastards. We need to have hard evidence before we make any move on them. Uh, this informer, you know, do you reckon he'll come up with something? A racing certainty, I smile. Good, says Toll. Right, Amanda, keep on with the surveillance. Uh, Bruce, could you hold on for a minute? Drummond coughs a nervy, <coughs> certainly, Bob, and departs. Kip, as red as my cherry after a night's hurn. And Toll's probably ready to tell me that the inspectorship is as good as mine. Do you have a problem with Amanda? he asks. Not at all, I tell him. She's complained to me about your manner. Do you have to refer to her in that condescending way? Her name's Amanda. It might be better if you called her that, rather than Mandy, my sweet. Fucking stroppy dyke. Come on, gaffer, I smile, using the casual but respectful tone to soften toll up, which it does. She's being far too uptight. I'm just being friendly and informal, that's all. Bruce... You're a good and experienced officer, but you're going to have to relate better to all other officers, particularly if you become an inspector. These things are important in the modern police force. Mark my words, Toll reprimands, sweeping a hand through his bouffant hair. But it's a gentle reprimand, and he can't keep the underlay of complicity out of his voice. I hear what you're saying, Brother Toll, but it takes two to tangle. I suggest you have a similar word with our Ms. Drummond. I'd like to turn off the gas for Ms. Drummond. Fucking well, turn it off for good. Toll sits up in his seat somewhat pompously, as he tends to do when I play the craft card. I have spoken to Amanda and made her aware of her responsibilities. I'll fucking well bet. 
That wee slag thinks that crawling up Toll's earth is the way onto the fast track. Wrong. Later on, I'm in the canny, catching up on some of the gossip, and the wee cow comes over to me. Bruce, can I have a word? She nods to the corridor. A uniform spastic from the craft raises his eyes. This wee cunt's going to rub my face in it already about her new role. No way am I taking any bullshit for the likes of Drummond. I don't know if you've heard, Bruce, but it's Gus's birthday tomorrow, and we're planning a wee surprise party for him, in serious crimes. So that's all it is. Yeah. Nick can't tell us. Lennox, or any of them. Bastards. I was aware of that, I say, haughtily. I'm just making sure, she smiles and turns to leave. See you later. She thinks that she can get round me with a softly, softly approach. Wrong. Same rules apply. I head back downstairs, but it's typical post-holiday blues, and I'm hating it at this shite house. I'm sifting through the papers on my desk for the case file, and I see out of the corner of my eye that a woman has come into the office with Drummond and Hazel the clerical. She looks vaguely familiar. Drummond's pointing over at me. The woman has a wee laddie with her, and they tentatively approach my desk following Drummond. Bruce, my colleague, informs me. Somebody to see you. It's Mrs. Sim. Who the fuck's this? I came last week, the woman says meekly, but they told me you were on holiday. I wanted to thank you personally for everything that you did for Colin. She turns to the wee boy. This is a good man, Ewan. This is the man that tried to help your daddy. She stifles a sob. The wee boy keeps his head bowed, but raises his eyes up at me and pushes out a smile. He'll be about ages with Stacy. His heart was bad. It was a family thing, hereditary. I'm watching her lips moving. He never let it bother him. He was a good man. She whimpers and sobs, and Drummond's got her hand, and she looks back at the wee laddie and then at me. And this is a good man. This man tried to help your dad some, tried to help him when the rest just stood by and gawped. He tried so hard for your daddy. How did you feel? I just wanted to say thank you, Sergeant Robertson. Bruce, I just wanted to say thank you for trying to help him. Um, I'm sorry I, I couldn't save your husband, I tell her. Thank you. You did all anybody could. Thank you. This is a good man, Ewan, she sniffs, as Amanda leads her away, looking back at me in a deep, soulful and human way. Gus comes over and grabs my shoulder tightly. Bear lassie. An awfully Christmas for her and the wee fairy. She doesn't know, the woman. She just doesn't know. I have a bash at the crossword. I can't concentrate, and I decide to take an early finish. It's Stronach's testimonial match at Tynecast overnight, but no way will I go there and line that spastic's pockets. It would be too much to see him poncing around full of himself. I can't see there being much of a crowd. It'll be Gary Mackay or Craig Ravine size, I should imagine. So the evening finds me down at the lodge, listening to some referee twat who's a building inspector with the district council. He's holding court, and it's not a bad crack. Bladesy's lost. He comes over to join us, sporting his new glasses. But like most English cunts, he kens now about Fippa. Ray Lennox appears with a couple of uniform spastics who aren't wearing their uniforms, but are still uniform spastics and always will be. 
I nod to him to come over, and he's squeezing in beside me. I've tipped him off before about hanging around with these non-entities. Associate too much with losers, and that's exactly what you'll become. This referee's some cunt. So there I was at Ibrox, and they need the three points to clinch the title. I mean, they're about thirty points ahead, so it's a foregone conclusion. It's mathematically impossible for them to be caught. It's a gala day, and the families are all out, the bairns with their faces painted up, the lads looking forward to celebrating. Coisty's put them one nil up with a close-range tap-in at the back post. Ha, ha, ha! He's some character! Suspicion of offside, but Oswald Beckton's flag stayed down. Oswald, Lodge 364, you'll count his face, the ref prompts. There's a few nods and knowing smiles are in the table. So anyway, the whole place goes up and it's party time. Everybody's singing, we're up to our knees in Fenian blood, and it's a gala atmosphere. But then, with a couple of minutes left, a long ball gets punted through the middle towards the Rangers' goal. This young lad nips in between Gochby and McLaren, and they bring him down heavily inside the box. Now, it's a blatant penalty, but of course, there's no way I'm going to give that and spoil the party. I mean, they'd have had to have gone to Fir Hill the next week to win it, stuck with a 15,000 capacity. How could I spoil it for them to lift the flag at home? They were going to win it anyway, by the length of Argyle Street. No way was yours truly going to be a killjoy. Imagine what the boys in the lodge at Whitburn would have said. My life wouldn't have been worth living. Spoiling a gala day out. <laughs> so I waved play on. As you do, mate, eh? Councillor Bill Armitage said. I had to send off this tube for arguing. The ref's decision is final. Oh, this asshole wouldn't he let it go, even after I'd booked him. There's always one, eh? Fenian bastard, Bill Armitage scoffed. I don't mind telling you, the ref continues, that it was a bit embarrassing watching it on Scott Ball the next day. The boys were great, though. They kept the replays to a minimum and avoided any reverse-angle showings. Anyway, I spoke to the SFA observer at the match in the blue room afterwards, and he understood the situation fully. It turns out that he's in the same lodge as wee Sammy Kirkwood. Do you mind a wee Sammy? He says to me. I nod. Wee Sammy used to get me magazines. Good stuff and all, though not quite as good as Hector the Farmer's. I'll have to bell that old fucker and see if he's got any new gear. Anyway, thank God for the presenter. He said there was no way I could have seen the incident as I wasn't up with the play. Well, the guys at the press were great as well. Played the whole thing down. Didn't let on that the switchboards were jammed with callers. Passed off the odd one or two as token Tim bigots who would say that anyway. Yeah, these cunts are paranoid. Armitage laughs. A chief sports writer for one of the dailies told me at the lodge, he says, normally we'd have made a bit more of a song and dance about it, but it does nobody any good to keep running Scottish football down. We then listened to Armitage going on a bit about the new Scottish Parliament. It'll be a good thing. Mere opportunities for our people. Of course, We'll have to deal with the papes, but there's nothing new there. The party in Scotland's always had that horse trading between the Catholic Mafia and the craft. I wouldn't mind giving them anti-abortion legislation in exchange for some plum chairmanships of working parties or committees, uh, particularly licensing, he grins. It just means that some daft wee hairy that gets knocked up the duff has to get on the bus to Carlisle to get clean out. Hardly a staggering blow, I would have thought. Right enough, Ray nods, then turning to me, whispers, Fancy some coke the night? I fancied some fucking coke, all right. In fact, I had some on me. Especially after Toll's news, Drummond heading up the team. Toll. The cunt will not be happy until he turns me into a fucking junkie.
Me answering to a silly wee lassie. Aye, right. Eating. Oh, I'm doing it hard. Eating. Perhaps there are others like me. I can certainly conceive of this. The notion that I am not the only one of my kind. Or should I be? Perhaps there are others in here sharing the parasite role with me. I even fancy that I can feel them in here, twisting and writhing in the host's gut with me. But this may be just a response to my melancholic state of mind. I am my host, my friend, who gives me everything I need to survive. But to live, I need much more. I need to feel part of something bigger, perhaps something that is a part of me. Joe Simmons from Aberdeen. Masonic rituals really control a deep down repressed sexuality in that it keeps the randy fuckers like myself in pain. Eating on and on, eating. Nasty, non, no, nasty. Has to be said that this laddie's diet is not that nutritious. This points to my host coming from perhaps a poor disadvantageous starting out point in this great journey of life. He's eating all sorts of cheap and useless garbage, but on the other hand, the sheer volume consumed goes against this. So maybe we can postulate that the laddie has grown up in a world of privation, and although he has been able to accumulate more resources, he has not quite been able to shed himself of all those proletarian habits. The host's philosophy of life seems then shake off bladesy after I've pumped the sorry cunt for more information about Bunty's mental state. Then we abscond back to his flat. Ray's place is furnished post-Thatcherite nouveau schemey single shagger style. That is to say, no real style at all. It's dominated by a red suite, a two-seater velvety love couch and matching chair. It's like a whore's room back in the dam. I'm not sitting in that couch. Lennox should be so lucky. If it was fucking Inglis, he'd be on it like a shot. Know that he would feel anything if it was Lennox that was up in. Ray's looking for the mirror, spoon, and razor blade kit I brought him back from the dam. He reckons that it gives extra quality to the chop and never uses credit cards indoors now. I realise that the set cost me the equivalent of twenty quid in UK cash and feel a resentment rise up in my chest. It was a moment of weakness giving Lennox a present, even if I only gave him it in order to encourage him to sort me out with Posh. I idly pressed the tip of my fag against his velvet cushion, feeling a satisfying rush of adrenaline and a lump rise in my chest as it browns and parts on the first, second, third and fourth contact. Then I admire my handiwork before quickly flipping the cushion over to conceal the four new holes. Lennox returns and chops out some lines. He's been on DS duty and has nabbed quite a bit of high grade, the lucky bastard. I've divided up the stuff I brought back from Amsterdam, and though it pains me to admit it, Lennox's gear is even better. The perks of the job. Okay for some. What about me? What perks do you get on topped coons? Going round community groups talking to chip-on-the-shoulder darkies who hate your guts and that daft wee lassie drumming sticking a roar in. Fuck that for a game of soldiers. Big time OT on this one, mind you, especially with that docile mutation tolls breeks full of sludgy soft shite. Same rules applying in that case, I kid you not. The last sniff I got off these morons I busted. I'm telling you, Robbo, what a total waste of time. There was so little coke in it, I should have just left the spastics to it and saved myself the fucking paperwork. They'd have felt a hell of a lot worse if they had done that rubbish than they did get an epoxy 200 quid first offence fine. Lennox is letting his mouser grow a bit. That's fucking disgusting. 
Two hundred poxy quid. Who's the magistrate? Urquhart. Surprise, surprise, Lennox says, not looking up, firmly engrossed in the chopping up of the lines. He's got patience, Lennox. He knows that I want that line, but the cunt will play around until he's got it as fine as fuck. Mr. Fucking Pat on the heed and penny out of the poor box. I heed shaken in disgust. Uh, Conrad fucking Donaldson defending the cunts as well, Ray scoffs. I smile at that name. I wonder how his wee lassie's doing. We could handle another gam for that little sweetheart. Yes, I kid you not. Ray nods at me to come ahead. I'm on the first line. A twenty's already rolled. I close one nostril and snort for Caledonia. It hits me hard. Good gear. Phew! You are fucking cunt that you are. My mouth is instantly numbed and I start gabbing. Listen, Ray, you should have heard that cunt toll on about you the other day. It was Ray Lennox this, Ray Lennox that. I said to the cunt, there's an awful lot of things getting attributed to Ray Lennox here. I think Ray Lennox would be balking at some of the stuff his name's being mentioned in connection with. Eh? What's this? Ray asks, looking at me tentatively. Between you and me, Ray, I wouldn't be surprised if you get drafted into the team on this coon case. Like, fuck. <laughs> I've been stalking these fucking Sunrise community hippies on this cannabis bust for months. I'm just saying, Ray, you know these cunts. Same rules apply. One other thing as well. This is between you and me, likes. I drop my voice, canteen style even though we're in the privacy of Lennox's gaff. What? says Ray, trying to be cool, but obviously alarmed. Watch Gus. Gus Bain? Precisely. Gus is all right. He's been good to me. Of course he's all right. He'll have been all right to you as long as he sees you as a young laddie, his second fiddle. The thing is, Ray... You've earned a lot of respect in this department, and it's starting to get to the old boy. You get what I'm saying? I look Lennox in the eye. He's getting the drift I want him to get. It's the young stag syndrome. Gus is set in his ways, one of the old school. But he fears the new breed, and he can be quite a vindictive old cunt and he's been taking an unhealthy interest in the career progress and extracurricular activities to date of a certain Mr. Raymond Lennox. You saying that Gus is a squealer? Known for it. Watch what you say about Cousin Charlie when he's around. But I never say anything about Charlie. Aye. Well, mind and keep it that way. Right. Lennox nods thoughtfully. I appreciate this, Robble. This is all bullshit. But life is one big competition. Ray is a pal, but he's also a potential or actual competitor. And the only way to handle competitors is to control their level of uncertainty. That's what life is all about. The management of your opponent's uncertainty levels. We don't want this cunt getting too big for his boots, thinking that he somehow counts. It's a troubled-looking Ray Lennox who snorts his line. The drug instantly restores that veneer of arrogance, but the seeds of doubt have been planted, and the come-down will see the harvest of confusion just ripe for us to reap. A Testimonial I got in early last night, but I couldn't sleep leap. I'm back in the office early this morning, but I'm totally fucked with that cocaine. I was wired. My sinuses are shriveled and my nose is running constantly. My nerves are jangling. I'll have to be stronger. That's what makes me better than the scum, than the weak Ray Lennoxes of this world. I can laugh at all that shite but I have to get it together.
The phone goes, and I jump and shake before lifting the receiver, and, predictably, it's that spastic toll. This is all part of his psychological warfare, but that imbecile has been desk-bound far too long to be able to outmanoeuvre Bruce Robertson. Well, Spazwit, we have news for you. The same fucking rules apply. He tells me that he wants to see me in his office straight away. Never mind our routine, the selfish cunt. Think of nothing but his ain fat airs and how to keep it covered. Does fuck all but write that film script. I can with the cunt's up to. I put the paper down and head upstairs. I feel nauseous by the time I get up to Toll's office. The lifts are out of order, and I'm out of breath after these two flights. Those fucking maintenance cunts, they fuck all. Bruce, we need to have a wee blether. Nedry has called a team meeting up at his office this afternoon, this sweetie wife tells me. He's using a distasteful Nedry rather than a pally Jim, or a respectful the super. He's obviously had his gangrenous nuts chewed and is looking for pals. Or perhaps not. The cunt could just be fucking me around. Drummond still hasn't been in touch. Playing silly fannies again. What time? I ask. I need to spend some time with the paper. That Claudia shiffers in it. A fucking raid, nay two ways. It says she's opening a restaurant or something like that. Who gives a fuck about that? Show us your ass and your tits, doll. That's what we want. Three. Page three. Could be t t toiling. I said I'd be at uh, a forum meeting then. Oh, God. Amanda should be handling that side. Well, she ain't been in touch with me to tell me not to go. Are you saying I shouldn't go? Oh, God, no. That's what Nidri's been doing is nut about. The forum people have been talking to Malcolm St. John of STV and Andy Craig of the News. Seems they've been very critical of the investigation again, he puffs sourly, as if it's a personal criticism of Toll himself. Mind you, it fucking well should be. He's the cunt in charge of this investigation, or meant to be. I've got a copy of last night's late final downstairs. The clerical brought one in. I never saw anything about the case. I remember glancing through it, the back page and the leader column, but all I mind of was the piece on Tom Stronach's testimonial. The Edinburgh footballing public can hang its head in shame at the derisory attendance of under 2,000 at the testimonial of one of its favoured sons, Tom Stronach. Granted, the recession has meant that for many fans, extra games are now a luxury, particularly just one week before Christmas, and the Edinburgh weather had a lot to answer for. However, this level of support for such a loyal servant to the capital sporting scene is nothing short of an undeserved snub. I also read that Tom's idol, Kenny Dalgleish, had been unable to attend due to other commitments but he did send his congratulations to Tom on his gala night. Dalgleish was probably washing his hair or something. He had the right idea. Keep away from all that shite. I wish I could keep away from all toll shite. Nothing's happening, Robbo. This investigation just won't move forward. We've been checking all the stores, but we can't trace that bloody hammer. He whinges as if I give a look and Matt goss about that. I see. So Nidri expects Scottish television and the evening news to solve the case today. What spastic journalist has ever solved a fucking crime in his puff? Answer me that. I'm as upset as you are, Robbo. Toll's old woman's mouth twists. That mouth. The gob of a thief who can he help but gossip about what he's knocked off 
and then is stupid enough to be surprised as the cell door slams behind him. Anyway, have you got any other news? he asks. No, I'd liaise with Amanda, as you said. That will be shining bright. Hmm, right, says Toll. I can already feel his disenchantment with this silly wee tart setting in. I'll rearrange the forum meeting and come to Nidri's at three. Uh, no, I'll go to Nidri's. You go to the forum meeting. Right, I tell him. Then, as I exit, I think, What the fuck is that wee Amanda drumming Dane? I should go back in and tell Toll this, but I can't be bothered. My arse is itching like fuck. Why is it always me that has to do this fucking shite? If I just jacked it in the morn, that would show the cunts. See how they get on then. This whole fucking place would grind to a halt simply because it's stuffed foo of the most clueless cunts that ever hid behind a policeman's uniform. They cunts wouldn't they last ten minutes out in New South Wales or even doing in the Met. Don't know what real fucking police work is, any of the cunts. Fuck. Ahead, downstairs, stopping off at the bogs, where I give my hole a good clawing. The flannels are damp with my sweat, and I have to take some toilet paper and place it between my skin and the saturated material in order to try and dry the fuckers out. Then it's back to the grind. I study the papers on my desk, then look around at my clueless colleagues. I've never, ever seen such a motley crew of useless spastics gathered under one roof. Aye, it's a strange one, all right, Peter, I say to Peter Inglis. But what do you mean? I feel it saying, you, ya poofy cunt, you're the fucking strange one. But instead, I scrutinise the documentation on my desk. Sometimes I look at this and think, the clues are staring us straight in the face, but we just can't fucking crack it. Just one breakthrough and it would all fall into place, Gus shrugs. That's it, though, Robo, Peter says. Always the same story. 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. We'll just have to keep at it. Too true, Peter, I nod, lifting up the paper. Across. One. Speed. Eight letters. Seven. Across. Lowest of the low. Four letters. Eight across. Twenties short hit aisle. Four and four. Nine across. From France. Six letters. Ten across. Sheen. Luster. Six letters. Eleven across. Sight organ. Three letters. Twelve across. Telling fibs. Five letters. Fourteen across. Dark beer, five letters. Sixteen across, grieve loudly, three letters. Eighteen across, bespatter, six letters. Twenty across, divisions of foot or yard, six letters. Twenty-two across, day after today, eight letters. Twenty-three across, Orange skin, four letters. Twenty-four across, buyer's snips, eight letters. Down. One. Stand in for monarch, seven letters. Two down. Sharp citrus fruit, five letters. Three down. Work play space, six letters. Four down, group of players, six letters. Five down, falls, plummets, five letters. Six down, spotted jungle cat, six letters. Thirteen down, straight, six letters. Fifteen down, incompetent, seven letters. Sixteen down, 
Himalayan Guide, six letters. Seventeen down, Knob, Dignitary, six letters. Nineteen down, Flat Antlered Deer, five letters. Twenty one down, Bay of Naples Isle, five letters. Come on, guys, let's see some fucking action. Gus, I shout over at him. Twenty one down, Bay of Naples Isle, five letters. Come on, crime, together we'll crack it. Gus screws his face up. We were in that part of the world, Edith and me. Sorrento. We took the hovercraft over to Naples for the day. I didn't see any islands, Bruce, and we were right across Naples Bay, coming for Sorrento likes. Well, they've obviously got them, Gus, according to the fucking paper anyway. Mind you, it's a plebs paper. I only buy it for the tits, the telly and the fipper. What about one doon? Stand in for monarch, seven letters. Regent. That's one, two, six, nah. Jeanette Charles. Eh? That Jeanette Charles, the Queen's double, stands in for the, for the Queen. I'm just not getting this at all the day. Here's one, though. Lowest of the low, four letters. Toll. <laughs> nah, we should get this one, all right. Scum. We deal with them every day. Mind you, toll. The same fucking thing, eh? Later on, I see Lennox in the canny. He's still in the trail of those hippies. The cunt's been avoiding us a wee bit. We run him into town. We pass one of those posh girls' schools, Mary Erskine's, James Gillespie's. Oh, the sound of the posh schooly citadels. It sets up the horn in you, eh? Airy, airs, skin, lesbians. It was some dirty cunt that named these schools, some fucking pervert. Lennox laughs, shakes his head. <laughs> You're some man, Robbo. I tell you, eh, I say. Maybe lashes, like wee angels. Then they grow up. That's the problem. They grow up into cows and fucking whores, and a cow's worse than a whore. At least you can where you stand with a whore. A cow... You never fucking well can. Lennox is looking uncomfortable. Well, I... Doesn't he understand a thing? That's his problem. Thinks he kens the fucking lot, but what does he know? He knows nothing. Absolutely sweet fuck all. Too fucking big for his boots, that cunt. We stop in for a bite to eat at the pie shop on the South Bridge. Eddie Monker from the South Side office is there with a uniform spastic. I nod at them. There's a slow, lazy, overweight cunt serving us, or who should be serving us, but he's taking his time. Who ate all the pies? I start up a slow chant, but Mr. Cool Wanker Lennox refuses to join in. Ah, above and beyond it all, is he? I think not. A couple of pints later, but airy. No way am I going back into that place this afternoon, that's for sure. Ray looks at me as if I'm mental. You're forgetting something. Gussie's surprise do. Of course. How could I forget that? I get to thinking that there might be a surprise for Mr. Ray Cuntyboz Lennox as well. Surprise Party it was a good idea to throw a wee surprise party for Gus, as it's the old cunt's 55th. Christmas is all but with us, so any excuse for a piss-up. Gus, but he should be thinking of early retirement, no fucking promoted posts. What an old spastic. Spoiling things for every other bugger, or trying to spoil things. Think again, old man. However, We've got a few cans and bottles in, and there's a fair crowd here. Yes, even Drummond's here. One glass of wine, eh? Then making a big point to every cunt about needing to get back to work. Any cunt takes a blind bit of notice here, though. 
even if the atmosphere lightens up as she leaves. Neat copped badly that in. For every other cunt's peace of mind as well as her own. Anyway, I'm more interested in real Fanny. That big city piece, the size queen, she's around. Lennox is smarming and getting nowhere. He's smarming, but he's no thinking. I am. We made a fifty quid bet on who'd be the first gent to get into the size queen's knickers, and that dosh is going in the Robertson coffers, I kid you not. I watch what I'm drinking and bide my time until every cunt's three sheets. Then I start shifting the conversation round to the topic of a gentleman's size, watching Lennox go all nervy and trying to change the subject. Mine, a back in Oz at the New South Wales Police Department. I carry on. We used to play this party game. In our station at College Street. The Aussies, well, <laughs> they can be a bit risqué. Oh, aye, what was that? asks Karen Fulton. Uh, she's a game cow, known for it. Gone a bit snooty these days, but the alcohol and the festive atmosphere of the holiday period are just the ticket to pull a slag back into the fold. They just can't help themselves. Uh, perhaps I'd better not say, Karen, my darling, our colonial cousins can be rather coarse. Come on, spill the beans! Fulton urges. Oh, this sounds intriguing, the size queen purrs. Mm, come on, Bruce, don't start something you can't finish, says Big Mooth Lennox, raising an eyebrow, blissfully unaware that he's signing his own death warrant. Well, OK, what it was right was that the guys would take it in turns to go into the photocopier room and photocopy their wedding tackle onto a sheet of paper. Then they'd write their names on the back and put them into an envelope. Once everybody's been done, somebody then tacks the prints onto the board. Get away, Bruce, Lennox scoffs. But to the cunt's embarrassment, everyone else seems captivated. I look at the big whore, the size queen, whose eyes are like saucers. No, but listen, I continue. The lassies would then try to match the cock to the guy. Let's do it, roars the size queen. A clock Lennox looking stricken, but there's nothing he can do. Even old Gus is up for it. Peter Inglis goes in first. The fucking animal. Fags are the biggest size queens of the lot, and a repressed, inadequate closet case like him must be drooling at the prospect of checking out all that meat. Aye, Inglis, I'll have you outed, you cunt. Promotion, that? Aye, sure. It might be some equal opportunities cunt's idea to turn the force into a bastion of buggery, but old values die hard here, especially in the craft. He'll ken, all right. Inglis emerges with a sheet of paper in an envelope. He hands the envelope to Ralph Considin who's only a uniform spastic and thus shouldn't even be here in the first place. And he goes in and does the business, handing the envelope to Gus. There's whooping and cheering from everybody, except a tentative Lennox, when old Gus goes in. Then Lennox reluctantly disappears, trying to brass it out. I'm next. But when I put my gear on the glass plate... Uh, wiping it first after the rest of these cunts have been against it, I turn the enlarger switch to full and take the copy before sliding it back to its normal setting. I stick the name on the back of my enlarged dick. Thankfully the rash doesn't look too noticeable with the black and white image and paper quality. I emerge with the envelope. Clell and some spastic who worked with Gus do their bit. Then we're away. The game is interesting. One cheeky cow marks me down for what's obviously Lennox's tackle. Yeah, that'll be fucking right. Eventually, they are all turned over and put in descending order. Bruce, Gus, Alan, Andy, Peter, Ralph, Steve, Ray, Philip.
It turns out that all Gussie's is almost as big as my enlarged one. No wonder the sly old fuck was raring to get a go. The biggest shock, though, was that someone was smaller than Lennox, a uniform spastic called Philip Watson. I'd have thought that impossible without him having a fanny. After the disclosure, everybody's giving me loads of attention. I catch the size queen's flirtatious eye. As time and drink pass, she's embarrassing herself over me, and Lennox has taken the hump big time. The moosey-faced rat bag. I'm playing it cool. Just flirty enough to keep the cow on the boil, making her suffer. Always the best way. I'm doing a James Bond here, firing out the suave double entendres left, right and centre. One or two of them across the bows of a certain Mr. Raymond Lennox. The same rules apply. I'm going to say fuck all to this big blonde here. I want the size queen off her high horse. I want her to proposition me. Which, after a while and more drink, she does. She sidles up to me and vampishly announces... The winner deserves a prize. Let's go back in there. And she takes off, and I follow her at a discreet distance into the copy room, clocking Lennox with a wink as I depart. She leans back across the desk, and I don't even kiss her. I lift up her skirt and pull down her knickers. Give it to me, she's saying. Just give it to me now. Her eyes shut. I push in and watch the size screen thrust and buck with an increasingly puzzled look in her face. She's doing all the work, and that suits me fine. After a while, I shoot my load and leave her wondering what's been happening. I collect my fifty quid from Lennox, then I'm off him, as high as a fucking kite. Even the short drive gets me hardened up again. It's the rhythm of the traffic and the heat in the car as well as the lyrical content of the Motley Crue album Girls, Girls, Girls on the stereo, which has more references to hot pussy than a Dutch newspaper would if someone had torched the floating cat home in Amsterdam. When I get home, there's a couple of letters. One's a gas bill. The other has a Chelmsford postmark, and it's from Tony and Diana. I feel my cock stir and think about the 400-mile drive to Chelmsford. I could do it through the night on Charlie, fuck myself blind for a couple of hours, then head straight back. Yes. I ignore the gas bill. I ignore all of these. Carol takes care of that shit, and I have enough fucking paperwork in my job, for fuck's sake. I eagerly tear the Chelmsford letter open. 14th of December, 1997. Dear Bruce, I hope all is well with you. We are writing to tell you that we all feel that it's not a good idea that you join ourselves and Lawrence and Yvonne next month. I am sorry that you and Carol are having difficulties, but I don't think it would be appropriate for you to join us without her. We've had some great times together, but I think that any period of experimentation needs a little bit of time for reflection. This is what Diana and I are currently undertaking. I hope you and Carol resolve your difficulties satisfactorily. Best wishes. Tony Crosby. Tony, the fucking twat. I feel a spasm of hatred twist through me as the power simultaneously leaves my cock. Fucking soft, churrer in fine art at the Chelmer Institute, or whatever you call it. All our frenetic fucking going on, and him being around like a vegetarian in an abattoir. Carol, fucking well shaking it as well, giving him a nervous hand job. Well, they don't have the big match temperament. That Diana does, though. Fucking hell. Oh, I could have done with going another fucking few rounds with yon big hoor. I think about phoning Jeff Nicholson of the Essex Police and telling him about this sordid little club. Solid in the craft is Jeff. 
I'm just about to pick up the blower when there's a knock on the door and it's Tom Stronach, his wavy fair hair sticking up in tufts. He's dressed in a grey Russell athletic sweatshirt and grey tracksuit bottoms. He looks quite downcast. Tom, how goes it? I ask in phony concern. I'm fucking zorbid, Bruce. One thousand two hundred and thirteen paying customers. I gave that fucking club twelve years of loyal service. I see. I thought the gate was nearer two thousand. No, the evening news bumped up a wee bit. Well, I was there, I lied. Some fucking chance. Versus a Derby County reserve side on a pissing wet Tuesday with only eight shopping days left until the gig. Tom shakes his head, then brightens up a little bit. I did get a nice note from Kenny Doglish. I'm sure he would have been there if he could, I shrug. Guys like that, they must get loads of requests. It's a bad time of the year. Aye, right enough, Tom concedes. Anyway, Bruce, I've a couple of tickets for you for the sportsman dinner for my testimonial likes. We're going to have it in that lull between Christmas and New Year. Any excuse to keep the party going? Nice one, Tom, I say, grasping the embossed tickets he hands over with the leaflet. Instantly, I see that it was a mistake. The bastard has stung me. The ticket reads, You are invited as a VIP guest to the Tom Stronach Testimonial Sportsman's Dinner at the Sheraton Hotel, Lothian Road, Edinburgh, on Monday, December the 28th, 1997. Dress is informal. Lounge suits. A donation of £60 for all ticket holders to the Tom Stronach Testimonial Fund. Donation. 60 bar. Stung by that bastard Stronach. I'm saying nothing, but the cunt straight in. I might have guessed. He's known for it. There's always a bit of jiggery-pokery, high drama and standoffs reported in the evening news when his contract comes up for renewal. The bastard isn't he slow when it comes to dosh. Sorry I can't let you have them buck she, Bruce, but it defeats the whole purpose if you can what I mean. Mm. Right, Tom. <coughs> I cough. I'll just get my checkbook. Cunt. I'm scribbling out a check and he's rabbiting away in my ear. Graham Soonis might be one of the after-dinner speakers. I'm hoping that Kenny will make it this time as well, and Rodney Dolliker's definitely coming up. He's a great speaker. Hmm. Rodney Dolliker, ex-England. I hear that he makes a bit of money on the uh, circuit. He's done some stuff with Bestie, Marshy and Greavesy. Aye, it was good of him to express interest. No way will Dalgleish... Soonest or Dolliker come to that tube's testimonial dinner. Stronach wastes little time in donning that mantle of arrogance which characterises most Fitba guys on a roll. If you want any mere tickets, Bruce, just give us a shout. I'm not saying I'll be able to get them, mind you, but you can, seeing as it's you in that. I'll bear that in mind, I snap, handing over the cheque, which is equivalent to twelve blowjobs from a leith hoor. Bastard. The cunt leaves with a smile on his face. He's all fucking pleased with himself because he thinks that he's got one hour on Bruce Robertson. Well, you are in for a shock, my dim-witted spastic footballing friend, because the news for you is that the same rules apply. Later that night, Chrissy comes over. Stronach's neck curtains twitch. But he's playing tonight. So it'll be that nosy gold-digging hoory, Mary. I pull Chrissy in and we start to turn the gas off for each other. The hoor's getting good at this. Her that wasn't into it at all in the first place. Tighter, Bruce, tighter, she groans, and I feel my own windpipe constrict a few centimetres as she twists her belt. I'm finding it difficult to keep enthusiastic. I keep thinking about the rivals and the promotion stakes. Gus Bain, Peter Inglis, John Armut. Fuck every one of you plebs. 
Fuck me harder, Bruce. Fuck me harder. Chris is imploring. Fuck every one of yous. There's Stacy's school picture on the sideboard. I can't look at it. I wish I'd turned it away or put it in the drawer. She's watching us. Stacy's watching me and this cow. This isn't he. I'm a good man. She said it. The woman. His wife. I tried to pump the life back into the boy. Pump. Like I'm pumping this bitch. Pump. Oh, Bruce, come on. Oh, 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 God. Oh, 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 oh. And I'm still pumping. But the mare you give this for the mare she takes. I'm really fucking well trying, and it's a relief when that horrendous shriek fills the air to signal that she's getting there, and I feel the belt slacken from my neck, and I twist my hips deftly and start to fire my own spunk home. Fuck's sake, Chrissy. I gasp as my ejaculations fade like the pulse of a dying man, and my gyrations settle to motionlessness. I collapse onto her, roll off, and we doze for a while. I wake up first and inspect the damage. The blood vessels in my eyelids have ruptured, and there's a thick mark in my neck. I'm a professional law enforcement officer. I have to deal with the public. I can't go around looking like this because of that selfish bitch. No way a promotion board coming up. Oh, that was great, she says, stretching languidly before getting up and getting dressed. Listen, Bruce, she says, as she moves fluently into her underwear, then her skirt and blouse. I know we need to talk about what kind of commitment we want to make to each other, but I don't see that there's a need to rush things. I think that's quite sensible, I say. She's looking smart, put on a bit of weight, had her hair tinted. There's more confidence and grace in her movements. I mean, I don't think that coming out of a relationship straight into another is something that's very sensible, she smiles, tossing her blonde hair back and tugging a brush through it. Let's just keep it on this basis until we find out what our real feelings are. I couldn't agree more. We should look before we leap, I tell her. She's worth the poke, all right. Why don't you stick about for a bit, have some nosh, and we'll maybe have a bit more fun later on? I move across to the sideboard and put Stacy's picture in the top drawer. I'd love to, Brucey, but I've got somebody to see. Oh, I say. See you later, Brucey baby. She swings her bag over her shoulder. She turns back to me and kisses my forehead and winks, and then says in an American accent, Glad we're parking in the same lot, honey. Then she's at the fucking door. Right. Gone. Fucking. Thinks that she can just go like that after trying to fuck up my promotion? Who the suffering fuck does she think she is? She'd never replace Carol. She's never the one. A ten-a-penny policeman's fuck, that's all she is. She's left her lipstick. A red, red lipstick. More Carol. I have to admit it, leaving Australia was a mistake. Bruce and I were at our happiest there. It was just that we went out to be with my mum, and when my dad died, she wanted to come back. There seemed no point in staying over there because Stacy was just a baby and she hadn't started school. I know that I was selfish and that I didn't really think of Bruce's career. He was doing so well in the Sydney police. I think it's diabolical that he had to return to Scotland on a lower grade than the one he was on in Australia. I'm looking forward to seeing Bruce again, so we'll be back together as a family. Me, Bruce and our little girl Stacy. She has to accept the wrong she's done and the hurt she's caused everyone with her silly little lies. I often feel guilty. 
I feel that I should have taught her better, taught her the difference between right and wrong. She's a good girl, really, though, and it's important for her to know that Bruce and I forgive her. All families go through these kinds of traumas, and it's important not to make more of these things than is necessary. It's a complicated world enough to grow up in these days. I'm back in the bar again. Two men are looking at me. One says something that I don't catch, but the hostility is unmistakable. Why is it that a woman cannot drink alone? You want me, but you can't have me. Robertson's my name. I took the name of my man. I am his. If he was here now, he'd silence you, your leering, sneering faces. You would never be able to stand up to my Bruce. You're not men. Private Lessons Worms. I'm not happy. I've been reading more about them at the library. There's a tidy bud works there as well. When I get bored looking at the books, I look at her. I've been here most of the morning, after another sleepless night. But it's soon time to relocate to the office, as Saturday means big-time OT. Predictably, it's mobbed out. Lennox is in as well. We agree to shuffle some papers for an hour, then head out. It's great to be cruising around in the motor. I'm well wrapped up and the roads are clearer. Lennox is obviously uncomfortable shivering away in an inappropriate suede jacket. Dressed for the weather, eh, Ray? I snigger. Fucking plain clay's allowance is rank, he grumbles. Moaning cunt. If he didn't spend all his money on designer labels, he might make the allowance run to some practical gear. Thinks that the taxpayer's not better today than to fund that fucker to prance about on an imaginary catwalk while he pretends that he's polis. As our trip progresses, it becomes abundantly clear that Lennox is keeping his cards close to his chest. The thing is, we are aware of that. Lennox is second division. He is not aware of that. There is a set of rules which apply, and those are rules that the likes of Ray Lennox could only ever have a rudimentary knowledge of, whereas the Bruce Robertsons of this world, we are moving off on a different tangent. We kid you not. Maybe call in at the fish factory, eh, Ray? OK, Lennox says. I turn off Junction Street into Ferry Road. Surely, we muse. My sister-in-law. Mind the time we both rode her. Aye, says Lennox, uneasily. Mr. Top Shagger Lennox. Huh? The one daft wee laddie couldn't he satisfy that piece, exposed as an inadequate. She's sucking me off, and Lennox puts it in her from behind, and she's backing into him, and after a bit she's gone. Change hands, Bruce. Fuck me, Bruce. Fuck me hard now. Shit, Bruce. Shit. Eat it all up. I told you it was good for you. They were right. You didn't believe them. But they were right to eat. Eat everything. The hoor will bite your knob off. She's as bad as any of them on the go. Lennox smiled. Eat everything. Not some lesbian piece of fish like Drummond. Eat it, Bruce. The fish factory is our name for a leith brothel which operates as a sauna. Or is it a leith sauna which operates as a brothel? Nay matter. Old Maisie, the most experienced madam in the city, is in, and the kettle's on. We put the squeeze on Maisie that often the ex hoor can hardly be chuffed to see us, but a good hoor, and Maisie was one of the best, is always a superb actress, so we get the red carpet treatment. That's the beauty about being polis. 
It doesn't really matter whether or not everybody hates you, as long as they're civil to your face and can put up a good front. You can only live in the world you can. The rest is just wishful thinking or paranoia. Bruce, darling, Maisie states correctly, with a wee peck on the cheek for yours truly. So, Maisie, how goes it? I inquired, flopping back onto the couch and putting my arms around the back of my head. I get a whiff from my armpits and almost lower them in panic. Fuck it. Let the cunt smell Bruce Robertson. Maisie Disney registered. A whore must learn to live with unpleasant smells. She's kicking on now, Maisie, but she's still a looker. Ooh, in a heavy print dress, matronly sort of way. No bad, Bruce, no bad. We've a new lassie stirred it. A wee lassie for Aberdeen. You want to check her out? Later, maybe, Maisie. I smile with a broad wink. She looks up at Lennox. And maybe your young pal here might. Lennox gets a flush in his eyes. He smiles stoically. I catch this and turn to him. I tell you what, Ray, Maisie here. She'd teach you things that your ma couldn't. Forgotten more than you were ever likely to learn. I keep trying to entice her back out of retirement, but she's having any it. Maisie's laughing and shaking her head as Ray continues to look uncomfortable. I lean forward and pull out a pen from my top pocket and start tapping with it on the glass top table. Uh, even for a fresh young piece of meat like Detective Sergeant Raymond Lennox here, Maisie. She gives Ray, who now seems in excruciating pain, a quick once over. Sorry, sweetheart. I just do it for love now. No for money. I'll leave that to the youngsters. I'm a one-man woman these days. Ray here's getting himself a bit of a reputation in the force as a stud, I smile, puckering my lips and poking the pen languidly in and out of the ball I've made of my fist. All right, Maisie leers. That puts our Mr Lennox in his place. And I'm not finished yet. Oh, aye, so if you're ever coaxed to a retirement, this is your man, definitely. They tell me he's the best. Maisie kens that she might have to do business with the up-and-coming boys on the force, like Ray Lennox, so it serves no purpose to humiliate him. She moves from the particular to the general in an obvious attempt to spare Lennox's blushes. Tell you what, Bruce... Maisie says with an air of confidentiality. If you could measure all the inches of cock I've had in the line of business and put them all together, you'd be reaching to the moon and back. Of course, I'm well white for this game, and I'm fucked if that spastic Lennox is squirming off the hook until I'm ready for him to do so. Well, Maisie, if you wanted to get your lips around the sweetest piece of prime scotch beef, I kiss my fingertips and shut my eyes in an exquisite gesture, then thumb over at Ray. D.S. Lennox here is your man. As I say, Bruce, those days are over for me. But if they were me, with this fine-looking laddie here, well, it'd be mixing business with pleasure, I can tell you. She licks her lips at Lennox who's looking like his fucking soul has just imploded. Aye, Lennox, you can. To save his further embarrassment, Maisie goes off on a story concerning one of our city fathers. There was one Lord Provost. Uh, this was way before your time, son. Maisie nods at Ray, then turns to me. You'll mind him, Bruce. Ah, oh, yes, by reputation alone, though, Maisie, I'm not that old. I didn't mean it like that. You're just a laddie, be Christ. She smiles with those cat's ass lips, the moisture having been sucked from those just as sure as they've sucked out the semen of millions of punters from here and overseas. No, I'm talking about Provost. Well, it would be improper to mention names. 
but this provost was well known amongst the local girls for wanting to conduct his liaisons wearing the ceremonial robes and chains of the city of Edinburgh. Uh, Rumour had it, I interject, that he couldn't he get it up otherwise. That's true, Bruce's son, and take that as coming for the horse's mouth. He told us himself, he said, Maisie, my wife doesn't understand me. She doesn't like me wearing the robes or in the house. The thing is, Bruce, Raymond, she wouldn't let him do it wear wearing these robes. But you know how the provost looked, an awfully indistinguished wee man. Nobody recognised them out of the gowns. The man's whole identity and sense of power came for their robes. One day, the administration at the provost's office sent the gowns away to be cleaned. The provost had to conduct his duties in his suit and tie. The thing was that every Thursday night, the pair wee man had booked in down here for a wee session with a couple of the lasses. The provost was nervous about having to perform without his ceremonial robes, so he had a few nippy sweeties for Dutch courage. As uh, one does, I smirk. Well, Maisie continues, taking my hint and refilling my glass. The provost got really drunk. When he come down here, he took off all his clothes and refused to leave or put them back on until he had his robes. He was screaming, I am the Lord Provost of the city of Edinburgh, and I will shut down this foul house of debauchery. You could hear him right across Leith. The only thing that would satisfy the provost was the return of his robes. No, they were in Pullers of Perth, the South Side branch who at the time were dry cleaners to the provost's office. We had the number of the provost's chief political ally, the chairman of the housing department. He got on to the chief constable, who did a deal with Alec Connolly, who was in police custody at the time, on a drunken disorderly charge. Post Alec, I smile. <laughs> He's still kicking about. A top housebreaker before the baby claimed him and he lost the plot. Spent a good number of years working for the GPO after that, before he got even too pished up to hard doing these duties. Aye, he's an awful man, is Alec, Maisie says with some affection. Well, she continues, they said that they would drop the charges against Alec if he broke into Pullers of Perth and recovered the robes. So Alec said, aye, nee bother. The thing was, and ye can Alec, Bruce, I nod with a smile. He was fleeing, that was the reason he was in your custody in the first place. So Alex breaking into the shop while the provost still doing here, and he's screaming, I want my robes, if you don't get my robes I'll close this place down. And mind, what he said went. Then he went to the kitchen and got a knife. The girls were terrified, but he got his own clays and started ripping and tearing them to shreds. I am the Lord Provost, I wear the robes of my office, I do not wear this fucking shite. That's what he was shouting. Well, Alec had broken in all right, but something went wrong. He either lifted the wrong packet, or it was unclearly labelled, and he picked up this bag he thought was marked Lord Provost's office. In the meantime, we'd got the Provost so drunk that he'd passed out. When Alec got down here with the package, we found out there was just a lady's fur coat inside. It seems that they'd taken the provost's robes up to the head office in Perth for specialist treatment. So we dressed the provost in this coat and stuck him in a taxi home. Maisie smirked. I nudge Lennox. Wait till you hear this bit, Ray. Well, the taxi driver, unknown to us, had just been bumped for his fare by a squad of laddies gone out to Nidri. He was enamoured to find that when he got to the provost's address, there was only an unconscious naked man in a fur coat with nae money in the back of his car. What did he do? Ray asks. Maisie takes a bracing sip of whisky. The driver thinks, I'll show this cheeky swine. He drives back into Toon and up the Calton Hill. He drags the unconscious provost out the car and lays him out on the monument. The big, half-finished chin with the pillars, the one they call the disgrace of Edinburgh. A patrol car came along a bit later and found a group of the young funny fellies that used to hang about up there, having a line-up with the provost. Ray's eyes widen. 
Provost Will, let's just call him Provost X, was well known for his hostility to the gay community, I explain. He'd knocked back permission for them to open a drop-in centre, said it would be a hotbed of sodomy. Anyway, the provost was found by that patrol car a little later on. The young queen scattered. It was kept out of the papers, but it was all around the grapevine. As you say, Maisie, that monument had long been known as Edinburgh's disgrace. But the name had dropped out of common usage. That incident certainly popularised it again. Rumour had it that the provost gave up the whisky after that, Maisie cackles. Reckoned it gave him a sair airs. We laughed for a bit, until I grew fed up and stopped abruptly and looked coldly at Maisie. The new lassie, Maisie. I think I'm ready to check her out now. Meet her and perhaps arrange a wee date for the night. Surely, Bruce, surely, Maisie says, rising from her chair and departing. She's some woman, Maisie, eh? Ray smiles. A real character. Aye, sure. That's not the way it works with women, Ray, I lecture sagely. Women are like tetrapacks. It isn't eh, what's inside that's important. The crucial thing is to get these flaps open. Never forget that, I tell him. The visit has a spin-off. This is clear. Maisie introduces us to this wee doll. Maisie's new whore is a class act who has split from her murderous bastard of a pimp in Aberdeen, and she's into doing good turns for the polis in order to get some level of protection. I take one look at this wee waif and volunteer myself for the job. Of course, she's anything but merely employing the whore's acting skill to the full. I crack this code straight away and arrange for her to call at mines tonight. This is a risky approach for all sorts of reasons, but if we wait for Carol to get sensible, we'll be waiting till hell freezes. Eat. Eat for the self. Eat and sip for freedom. Eat. Eat. I hear a little voice. Eat for the self. Eat. Eat. To satisfy my ravenous hunger, some scotch pies with chips, the way only Crawfords can do them, stacked high and smothered in grease. Just fucking flour, really, but they do the job. I'm looking forward to checking out Claire from Aberdeen the night, but it's time Ray and I were back at the office. It's expedient to hit the canteen first, as it always is. It's busy. But there's an eerie atmosphere, and I look over and see Drummond holding a huge card. I know something's wrong straight away by the quiet vibe. She looks devastated, as if somebody's told her some horrific news. I feel a sense of elation. I head over to Dougie Gilman. I don't know if you've heard, he tells me. But Clell tried to top himself this morning, jumped off the Dean Bridge. This news sends me into an excited rapture. Even more thrilling than Clell attempting suicide is the thought that he must have been so miserable to try, and that by failing he's merely succeeded in humiliating himself, and the pain will still be there. How did it make you feel? I tried to compose myself, to convert my feelings into a horrified shock. But I can't hide the glee and don't really have to try too hard, as Gilman is more than complicit. What happened? I cough. The trees broke his fall, but he smashed his hip to pieces. He's in the Princess Margaret Rose Hospital. They're operating on him the worm, a hip replacement. Is that all? I ask. Amanda Drummond has moved alongside me with the huge card which has been signed by everybody. I'd have thought that was enough, she says coldly. Of course, I didn't mean it that way, I protest convincingly, making her look a bit petty for suggesting that I did. Well, let me sign that card. It's all a bit of a shock. It's just that he got the dream move to traffic. I can't take it in. Of course it is. I'm sorry, Drummond says. I wasn't implying. Is there a collection? 
and Karen and I are collecting, she says. I thought as much. Nurse made a mental cripple while neglecting your duties. Carry on feather bedding vegetables. It's only a murder we are trying to solve here. I rummage through my pocket and produce a crumpled tenor which I hand over to Drummond. I know a lassie who'd suck every drop of spunk out of your boys for that note. Bruce, have you spoken to Bob yet? Toll, I correct her. Not today, why? He said to get in touch with him as soon as you came in. There's a note on your desk about it. I'll go straight up, I tell her, exiting. Toll's hammering away on his fucking film script as I go in, because he sneakily saves what he's got and switches the programme over to something else. He's trying to be cool, but he looks as guilty as a Begbie in a jeweller's stockroom. He asks me to excuse him for a minute. Nature calls, he says. As he exits, I move behind his desk. There's nothing in the screen, the crafty cunt. There are a set of keys in the lock of the top drawer of his desk. They're obviously house keys and car keys, so the one that sticks in the lock must be valuable to toll for him to keep it with those. I pull my jersey cuff over my hand and turn the lock. Inside is what looks like a thick report, only it isn't a report, it's a draft screenplay. The title page reads, City of Darkness, A Murder Mystery, Screenplay by Robert S. Toll. Who the fuck does he think he is? Does he think he's going to get out of this place? That Hollywood's going to come along and say, Aye, you're a thick Scottish cock who couldn't catch a cold and can't he write his name. Here's a million quid for a fucking screenplay. We'll get fucking Tom fucking Cruz and Nicholas fucking Cage to star and Martin fucking Scorsese to direct. Aye, sure. I want to just rip up that cunt shite. Fucking well burn it in the fire. Keep me warm this Christmas. The only fucking use for it. Alongside it is a key. It looks identical to the one in the lock. I take it and close the drawer. I'm going to get Toll's script and his discs. I should do the lot of them now. And there's fuck all the cunt can say about it either. Oh, that would be excellent. But the promotion board? No, I'll have to keep him sweet. He mustn't suspect that it's me who's fucking him over. Stick to the guiding principle of destroying without overtly making enemies. The corporate way. I sit back in my seat as Toll returns. He tells me curtly that Ms. Drummond is no longer lead officer on the case. Muggins here is back in the front line. I have mixed feelings about this. She's obviously been exposed as the dippet cunt that she is but it means more fucking work for me and I'm too fucking busy to chase around looking for some fucking criminal spastics. He tells me that he wants a progress report on his desk by the end of the day, letting him know who is working on what. He can stick it up his bouffant airs. I go downstairs and brief Drummond and Gilman. It's pleasurable telling Drummond that she is to oversee the clerical procedure of tracing the hammer. I want the net cast wider on this hammer search. Every B&Q in Texas in Scotland, I smile. She goes to say something, but composes herself, while I drink in her discomfort before asking, Is that all? I give Dougie Gilman a wink as Mrs. Drummond scuttles off in a most unprofessional manner. We once read some cunt saying that it was better to travel hopefully than to arrive. And just thinking this makes us want to smack the bastard out of the head with a truncheon, because if this is as good as it gets, then we are well and truly fucked. I sit down, trying to fill up three sides of A4 with Toll's fucking report. After two sides and a paragraph, I get him to tidy up. This means I pull out a black bin liner from under the sink and lob all the shite that's accumulated into it. I need a second one before I leave the front room. I would normally never go to such lengths for a whore. 
It's just that I need the place looking right for that sense of theatre. I get the desk and chair in from the garage, and I bring down Stacy's toy blackboard and chalk from her bedroom. That's me, ready. I stick one of Hector the Farmer's videos in to get me in the mood before the Roger Moore shows up. That wee Claire's a good one, all right. Nice one, Maisie. It's taken me ages to find a lassie that would be ideal for all this. The thing is, I know most of the girls through working on Vice, down Dock Street. I looked after them, and they looked after me. The best pimp those whores had ever fucking well had. This one's special, all right. She's done the biz as I specified. Short, permed wig, tweed skirt, green jersey with brooch on it. The brooch is fucking essential. Perfect. Just like Miss Hunter. Bruce Robertson, come out here, she commands us. This whore has the correct expression, pitch and tone. Maisie has briefed her excellently. We are compelled to obey. We, me, I. Yes, miss, I say softly. You're a disgrace, Robertson, she says to us. The sneakiest, most evil and vile little human piece of excrement who ever walked this earth. I suppose so, we agree. We are disgraceful, all of us. I start to pish myself. The hot urine trickles down my thigh, burning the eczema. But at the same time I have paradoxically never known a boy who places me in such an intense state of sexual arousal. The lips of my vagina quiver and widen when you walk into a room, Robertson, she gasps. Fucking hell! Are you aware of that, Robertson? Are you? Suppose, we tell her. I'm getting stiff, very stiff. I want you, Bruce Robertson. You make my cunt wet. I'm going to have you, Bruce Robertson. She's over to me and she's on me, pushing me back across the desk I bought recently, undoing my snake belt and pulling my soaking flannels down. She hitches up her skirt and she's got no knickers on. She's impaling herself on me, and she's fucking me slowly, telling me what a bad boy I've been to have caused her to do this, and I've got my hands clutching her buttocks, and I'm calling the frigid old whore for everything under the sun, and this is therapy in its purest and simplest form, and a mist rises and spots appear before my eyes, and my head spins, and the lesson today is Bruce Robertson. I sit down and compose myself lighting a cigarette. You're fucking excellent, Miss H... Uh, Claire. Anything else you need? She smiles sweetly, tidying her gear away. No, not just now, thank you, I consider, thinking if she'll be game for a little scheme that Hector the farmer and I talked about some time ago. Worth thinking about. She departs, and I shower and get changed. The dirty clothes are piling up. I've not much clean stuff left. I'll have to do a laundry soon. Refreshed, I decide to head out for a late-night drink down the lodge. George Mackey, the dug handler's there, looking lost and lonely in the company of a uniform spastic whose name escapes me. Poor old Dode looks three sheets. I order a triple whisky and a pint of Guinness and join him and the non-person. Dode's still greeting his eyes out over that fucking mutt that got topped through Lennox's incompetence. As the night wears on, he becomes increasingly tedious. Even the uniform spastic fucks off. At one point, the tears well up in gorgeous George's eyes. It's no something ye get out of robble. Man's best friend right enough, George, I nod, slinging back another double grouse. That Doug was my partner. That Doug, he looks leerily around the bar. Oh, that Doug had hurt. 
That dug was mere polis than any man in this bar. Sure, George, I say. Get them in, you daft old cunt. He was polis, all right. Polis through and through. I loved that dug and that dug loved me. It was a relationship, I tell him, considerately. A full and loving relationship between man and beast. George focuses on me in bemused shock. It was nearly like we were nearly like No, 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 I didn't he mean I tell him. I mean suppose the aliens landed. Aliens were out of space, I endeavour to explain. They would only see two species of earthling. I mean they wouldn't see like Homo sapiens and canine. All they would see was two earthlings. It's the relationship. I raise my near-empty glass in the hope that this sad cunt will see through his selfish grief and hit the bar. Two earthlings, I toast. He raises his glass slightly and mumbles some distracted rubbish which I don't catch. I stand up and think about getting them in. I decide against it and leave the wretched old fool. I flag down a taxi and I'm just about to say Collington, but I feel Toll's drawer key with the change in my pocket and I get a surge of excitement and decide to take it to Stockbridge. It's a short hop, so I get out and walk through the dark streets up towards our headquarters. There are still a few lights on, but the place is almost deserted. The cleaners are in, but they're on our floor. They have keys which fit all the office doors, which I obtained copies of some years ago. I used to fuck a clerical bird across the desk after hours. Maureen. She got married and left. No a bad ride. Pretty game. I take the back staircase, emerging on the records floor corridor. I go inside, open the drawer and take Toll's hard copy manuscript and stick it in my document wallet. Then I go into the hard disk and erase the file dark forward slash WKS from the C drive, making sure it's the correct one. I find the A drive disks and have to search through them in order to make sure I'm erasing the right ones. He's done two and called them different names from the C drive ones. Bob forward slash WKS and City forward slash WKS. They get the same treatment. I leave the spare key inside the drawer and head off. I hear the hoovers of the cleaner, and as I pass downstairs I look through the glass of the office door, shuddering to see Inglis and Drummond. Those cunts, putting in a night shift. They're obviously going through the clerical procedures involved in tracing the hammer. They'll never find where it came from, the sad bastards. I think I can hear Gilman's voice as well. Then my heart skips a beat. I hear somebody coming up the back staircase. I get down on my hands and knees and start to crawl under the glass section of the partition. I'd love to eavesdrop on what this motley crew are talking about. And as I creep along under the window space, I'm sure I hear someone say, Robertson. But if I don't move, whoever's coming up the back stair will find me squatting here in the corridor. I'm trembling with excitement, and I'm almost three sheets, and the thing is to get out undetected. The window space becomes the wall, and I stand up and strut down the corridor. Fuck! I can hear voices coming towards me, and a cleaner with a mop and a pail comes onto the first floor behind me, I jump into the shadows and turn towards the front staircase. I descend stealthily. Then I duck into one of the toilets on the landing at the bend of the stairs to compose myself. After trembling in the cubicle for a few minutes, I venture outside. The coast is clear. I'm out the door. Thank God we've no security here. I can't believe my luck as the building recedes and I skip down to Stockbridge and up into the city my feet light over the hard, compacted snow. I fall once and laugh, lying on my arse as it starts coming down again, the beautiful, perfect white flakes. I get up and walk for a while, singing in the snow. 
Though we sometimes go down, we can a go back up. The numbing wind is kicking up, and after a while I can't compete, so I flag down a taxi back to Collington. I can't stop laughing in the cab. The driver turns around and says, You've had a good night, mate. Certainly have, I agree. We blether away about Fitba and Hearts and how Stronach should hang up his boots. I'm almost tempted to give him a tip, but think better of it, drinking in the stoical disappointment on his face as I count out the exact fare. Ladies' Night Sunday morning, and I get the news of the screws and have a quick scan at the Saturday night telly I videoed after I get the fire lit. At least I manage to keep the coal deliveries going. This is one thing I can how to do in my house, to make a real fire. Carol could never do that. She always left it to me. I've tried to hand wash one pair of flannels in the sink using washing up liquid and I've hanged them on a collapsible clothes horse in front of the fire to dry. The telly's fucking pish as usual, but I've always preferred working at night. That dog's in the box with three rides who need fucked. One of them bears such a strong resemblance to that wee Annalise bird I fucked at the lay-by before we went on holiday that I almost expect her to have a Scottish accent. Turns out she is Leslie from London. The fucking questions get in my tits. I know what I would use for the blind date questions. Number one. If I were to ask you for a gam, would you give it to me? Number two. Do you take it up the arsehole? Number three. Have you ever eaten the worm-ridden feces of a non-uniformed police officer while he's working you with a vibrator? That's the real questions the nation wants to fucking well hear. It's so tedious that I take a look at Toll's script. Exterior. Street. New York City. Thursday night. 3 a.m. A solitary man is nervously walking down a darkened, cold, deserted street. He gives the odd furtive glance backwards, as if he is concerned that he is being followed. He heads down towards the waterfront, with the lights of Brooklyn Bridge visible ahead of him. Someone shouts, and he turns around. As this happens, we see, in slow motion, a youth with a crowbar running towards the fuck off toll. What a load of shit! The cunt's just ripping off whatever current bastard case we're supposed to be solving and setting it in New York. That's no fucking screenwriting. I rip off the title page and the first two and stick them in the fire I've built. The last copy of Toll's masterwork, and here it fucking well goes. I decide to get down to some real writing and try the news of the screws crossword. This crossword's getting harder every fucking day. The rings of Saturn. The rings of Uranus. The, the ring of that fucking phone. And I left the machine off. It's always a mistake to answer the phone at home. It's a weakness. A policeman's weakness. Nosiness. I needed to find out who it is, and it's fucking toll. This means that I'll have to watch what I put on the OTA 1-7. He's given us grief. He's not impressed with two and a half pages of a progress report. I mean, how could a prodigious writer like Toby? So, he's blabbering on about the top coon, this effing worry. He's a effing worry to me, all right. How the Sambo boy's old man sent a letter to the Home Secretary, who's nipped the Chief Constable's heed, who's nipped Nidri's heed, who's nipped Toll's, and now he's nipping mine. This is why he's taken Drummond off the case as lead officer. Too many big guns firing off in all directions for a lightweight. I feel like asking him, but what about DS Amanda Drummond? What about her pivotal role in this investigation? Surely she proved a capable enough team leader for the Home Secretary to directly address such concerns to her. Ha! But I can't speak up. Toll. 
He's given me grief, but only because he has grief. All I can think about is that boy's skull bashed in, the way his head was caved in and how it wasn't like a head at all, just like a broken silly puppet face, about how when you destroy something, when you brutalise it, it always looks warped and disfigured and slightly unreal and unhuman, and that's what makes it easier for you to go on brutalising it, go on fucking it and hurting it and mashing it until you've destroyed it completely, proving that destruction is natural in the human spirit, that nature has devices to enable us to destroy, to make it easier for us. A way of making righteous people who want to act do things without the fear of consequence. A way of making us less than human as we break the laws. But she was wrong. Wrong to do that. To try and prove something to me. Or try to get me to prove something to her about how I feel for her. I'll never turn her in, though. Never. But she was wrong. She shouldn't have fucking done it. Toll stopped rabbiting. He's looking for us to respond. We tell him what we have said in the report, that we have sent Dougie Gilman on liaison duty with the Forum on Community Relations, and sweet, darling Mandy Drummond has been given the task of overseeing the clerical procedures of tracing the hammer. We, I, on the other hand, am engaged in active surveillance of the enemy. The Ned enemy. Lean on these fuckers, these silly wee fascist cunts, Toll's telling us. I wonder if he sussed out the missing manuscript yet. Poor Tolly boy. Toll, of course, is the enemy. This is stark, crystal clear. We were compelled to engage with this man, as outright opposition would have aroused his suspicion. But our strategy of quietly finding his weaknesses, then undermining him, has paid dividends. We must continue to put our distaste for him to the side in order to keep achieving this. We have been negligent in our duties. Other matters have dealt with too much of our time. Possession by whores, running after witches, containment, control. We have to break free. We have to contain. We have to break free. Eat, eat. It's hostile outside. There is no food. In here. It's all around me. Eat, eat, eat. Grow bigger, grow stronger, grow thicker, grow longer. The host is now aware of my presence. Eat, eat, eat. But in here there is another presence. If there is me, there must be more. More like me. This awareness has been growing for some time. Now I can feel something other than the intestinal matter of the host around me. I can feel the one I must now refer to as the other. I am not alone. My soulmate is here. We engage with one another in that most delicious and intimate of congresses, that exchange of the chemicals through our bodies as our means to the joining of the souls, to merge, to become one with our universal identity. So much better than the bitter and lonely destiny I thought mine. This merger here, in the vast tunnelling that's the gut of my host. Our two organisms are too far apart in scale for him to regard the sorry we selves that we are with any equality. No, what this fine laddie feels towards us is that we are nothing but an infestation, parasites feeding off the bilious contents of his gut. We are under attack. As well as foodstuffs, we are bombarded with corrosive chemicals, but we love our host. Yes, we do, for love him we must. How can we help but love him? More than our own wretched selves? For I bear the laddie no harm with my trifling wee life, and God knows I would not wish any living creature ill to save that life. The other is different, though. The other understands. We feed each other through our breathing, eating, excreting bodies, entwined infinitesimally through the intestines of our most glorious mind host. Demon death must fall. Every bastard on this godforsaken planet knows when it's kicking off time. Thank fuck. I go into Toll's office and he's looking destroyed. 
The thing is, I can't seem to derive any pleasure from it. Something is wrong. With me, I'm feeling out of sorts. I must cut back on the drink. It's fucking well killing me. I'd been thinking that I'd perhaps be in a strong position to blackmail Toll into supporting my promotion application, as I have the only copy of his draft screenplay, albeit minus the first few pages. After shop talk on the fruitless Woody case, he says, It's not been a good time for me, Brother Robertson. Does Toll suspect that I've half-inched his screenplay, or is he just playing the craft card to cast the net? Uh, how so, Brother Toll? I ask haughtily. I've lost some files. He points at the machine on his desk. Computer files? Yes. Oh, I'm not a great fan of new technology. That's computer files for you. They're a bit like Brother Freemasons in the craft. It doesn't matter how full of shit they are. You have to remember to back them up. Toll smiles painfully, then looks thoughtful for a bit. Then he says something which confuses but encourages me. Often brothers are being supported in ways which they cannot imagine. Then he says, wearily, If you hear anything, Bruce, let me know. I'd appreciate it. You mean with uh, files and things? I ask playing the daft laddie to give myself a bit of space. Anything, he says, sniffily. The conversation with Toll has made me feel uneasy. What should have been a fucking triumph has a bitter and hollow aftertaste. I can't think why. Anyway, the day seems to be drifting away from my control. I keep thinking about stupid things. Stacy, Christmas, Carol. Fuck all that shite. She's fucking poisonous. A danger to herself and to other people. Well, I have news for her. And for Mr. Toll. And for Mr. Nidri. You don't fuck about with Bruce Robertson. Same rules apply. My methods are my methods are my methods. You think the day can't get any worse? Wrong. Things can always get worse. It seems as if they now can't fucking improve. A social ratchet, that's my life. What's a ratchet? A wee bit bigger than a moosey shit. But it is getting worse, Bruce, my sweet, sweet friend, because she's here, waiting for us, here, outside the fucking station. Bruce... She says, as we pretend not to see her and go to the car, that snake-like hiss of a voice, Bruce, Bruce, let's turn off the gas, Bruce, no, that's Chrissy, this is Shelley. Mine Stacy's Jungle Book video. That snake that used to sing Trust in Me. What was that cunt's name again? Sheer Khan? No, that was the fucking tiger. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Tiger feet. Mud, or less grey and mud as they became. Oh, Shirley, we cannot talk here. I shall see you in the pub on the corner in ten minutes. But Bruce, she says, her face twisting in that plea for clemency. But there can be no clemency. There is only the law which must be obeyed. The same goes for social laws, the ones we make in our daily interactions. She's trying to renegotiate the contract between us. The contract stipulates that there will be no fucking about with us in our private and personal life, and this fucking contract is being broken. No, no, and no again. Bruce, 
I repeat, we cannot talk here. Listen, because I'm not going to say this again, I kid you not. I'll see you in the pub in ten minutes. My eyes glint in the sunlight, which insipidly tries to negate the chill of a Scottish winter, blocking the hoor from my vision. I turn sharply away and out of the car park, stealing off down the road. Ten minutes, my ass. I can hear her following me, her creepy footsteps. I'm hoping nobody sees us. She doesn't realise that she's given those cunts weapons to destroy me, cunts like Toll, Lennox, Gilman, Drummond and the like. Her presence in my company could, in the wrong hands, be a lethal weapon. Tough Scottish cop Bruce Robertson could hear the footsteps of the broad behind him as her heels clicked the tarmac. He thought of the legs attached to those heels and that mecca they led to. No matter how many times he made that particular pilgrimage, Robertson always reckoned that another visit was in order. He could hear her breathing heavily, her pursuit of him causing her heavy breast to rise and fall, those warm and inviting mammaries that Robertson knew so well. There you go, Toe, ya cunt that you are. That's fucking screenwriting. Any cunt can fucking well do that shite. That's the right idea, though, that Toll's got. Get as many voices in your head as you can and hide in the crowd. We've got loads of them. Probably as many as there are worms eating away inside us. There's some billboards telling us to drink Tenet's Lager. We can do that. None for the purple tin bit. They know it's not a recreational drug any more than smack or crack is. There's another one telling us to test drive a new Fiat Uno. We can do that. At the same time as the tenants, if you want. Ha! <laughs> gotcha! Wrong. Come taste the bacon, baby. Come taste that motherfucking bacon. We go into the bar of the rag doll and get up some drinks. We are thinking that we should perhaps be more annoyed at this stupid cow than we actually are. Actually. Actually. Shirley is a funny bitch. Fucking desperate for it. Everything's fake about her. But with her skill at applying the makeup, she can approximate how she used to look, or at any rate, her makeup colludes with her hormones into making us believe she approximates it. After we've blown her muck, all we can see is her as a caricature of a former self. Motherfucking whore, that's all she is. That whore is desperate to taste the bacon. This gets us thinking of all the times we've, I've, fucked her over the years. Loads and loads and loads and loads and loads. We should be able to do things for each other. We, I, once told her. The laddies are at school, so is we Stacy. You're fed up, I'm fed up. We should be able to have a wee bit of harmless fun. Only get one life, eh? All those years of deceit. We turn round and see her. She reminds us more of Carol now that she's getting older. She was always heavier built than Carol. Come taste that bacon, baby. She opens her mouth, and there's a noise in her head, and we, I, we see her mouth going oval-shaped and pleading, and in her head, and we hear the message, Bruce, she's getting it. They're all fucking well getting it. She's telling us something as we sit at the table in the pub. The bar is almost empty. The sun streams in across the lino. We see a report of a game on the back page of the evening news. I wonder if Stronach is playing. We nod over to a uniformed spastic who comes in and says something to the publican. A uniformed spastic with a loose mouth in the canteen and the malevolent ears of the vicious gossiping faggot Inglis tuned into every salacious tidbit spewed from those embittered lips. Time to go. We can't talk here, I say, and we call for a taxi. Thankfully, it takes no time to arrive, and we get in it with her. 
The engine and the heat and her perfume make my flannel start to rise, and my mouth is on her silencing that whinging racket as I force my tongue as far into her gob as I can, poking it into every crevice. The taxi shudders to a halt, and we're back at her place. Gotcha! I, we, I take her to her unmade and smelly bed, full of stale spunk and crumbs. I'm straight down on her cunt with my mouth, slurping, devouring. It tastes of strawberries, the soap. She's loving it, but will not take my stiff cock in her mouth, my scaly, flaking, stinking cock. And she's pushing it away from her face and pulling at it, and we're about to come. So I pull away and go round and stick her cock up her. And she's disappointed, as she doesn't want the rancid prick that Rossi has been unable to cure inside her. But she wants to come, and we're fucking hard, and we come, and she does too. And it's the same rules. The same rules. She's lying chuffed and dreamy. She's had her dose of cock. Her sister's man. She's fucking well won. She's debased us again. We are empty. Bruce. We're in bed, sitting up in bed, and I'm lighting a fag and saying, Mind the first time I rode you? That's a horrible way of putting it, she pouts obstinately. What the fuck do you want us to say? Remember the first time we made love, darling? <laughs> Eighty-five, eighty-six. Over ten years ago now, anyway. Carol. We were no long married. You were at ours, and the pair of you were quite pished. Drove you home, mind that? I remember. Her face twists in recall at this shared but unacknowledged history. Rode you in the back of the car. Portobello. We smile. Mind what you said then? No. Never tell Carol. That was what you said. Ten years on and off, and you've been getting rowed by your sister's man. Mind the time you came out to Australia? You and me and the Abel bird. You know, the one I used to shag. Madeline. We had that threesome. She licked you. You couldn't you wait for it. As soon as Carol's back was turned. Mine. You can be so cruel. She's shaking her head. What do you get out of being like that, eh? Just stating a fact. Ten years it's been going on. Kicked off again as soon as I get back for yours. Hadn't you even unpacked the suitcase before I was poking you for fuck's sakes? That's a cow in any book. I shake my head, watching her simmering rage. Once, even twice maybe, an indiscretion. But ten years. That spells cow. C-O-W. Cow. I tell her. Yeah, well, have you ever thought what that makes you, son? She coughs out. We, I, we ignore her. Mind when you got together with Danny. The first time you brought us round to yours was when he was in the rigs. Funny. Mind a while back I brought Ray round. You mind the my mate Ray. He was a DC at the time. DS now. The Perius Roji. A right motley menage a trois, that in. That's you got the set now. A threesome with an extra bird and an extra guy. Well, that was... We were all drunk, you pair, Danny. Two weeks on, two weeks off. Know just how the cunt feels. She looks at us in a bitter, focused way. I don't know why I waste my fucking time in you. You're not that fucking good, she sneers. There's three reasons. One... Danny's in the United Arab Emirates. Two, I have a cock. And three, I am discreet. We smile at her. No wonder Carol's away. She did right to get shot of you. She's up, getting dressed in haste. There's nothing that excites the morbid fascination more than watching an old boiler you've just fucked struggling into her clothes without dignity. But we are injured by what she has said, and want to shout, she'll be back. But we say nothing on the subject. Just go, I command. Don't you fucking well worry, she spits back, and departs. 
after a while we, I, we find that we have become aroused again. We, I, we could have done with another go at it. Still, she'll be back. Nothing surer than that. We put on our frank side-bottom timperly EP. Then we, I, we put on a video in which this big blonde hoor takes on a couple of lumberjacks in an Alaskan forest. Now we are most definitely aroused and decide to call Bunte. Hello, Bunte. Frank, if that's your real name... Course it's my real name. You don't know what you're talking about, you fucking stupid big titted hoor. There's a bit of a silence. Not so sharp now, Bunty. I have got this fucking cow on the run, and my breathing's getting out of control. How do you know what size my breasts are? She eventually says, tentatively. She is now following the advice given to her by Detective Sergeant Bruce Robertson. Detective Inspector Elect Bruce. Robertson. We find that our cock is really stiffening now, and we are required to unbutton our trousers. I know everything. Now, tell me your sexual fantasies, Bunty. Shut up, you disgusting little creep. Leave me alone, will you? She slams the phone down. Oh, this cunt's riled. We wind on the video to the place where a tired-looking, greasy continental stud is fucking a stretch-marked boiler up the arse. Worn goods, but some excellent close-up shots. The pole must be well greased to get that kind of motion. We discharge over the Axminster. Later on, we decide to telephone brother Clifford Blades. He's a bit upset. Sorry, Bruce. I can't make the club tonight. Actually, Bunty's in a state. The pervert called again. Oh, God, Bladesy. It never rains, eh? Look, you console her and I'll be right over. Thanks, Bruce. I really appreciate it. She's beside herself. We go to the bog and give our ass, thighs and genitals a good clawing. Then we cut up a line of coke. This is washed down with a Glenmorangie to get the taste of diseased, druggy scum out of our tonsils. Then we realise that our car has been left in the works car park due to the self-centeredness of the hoor Shirley. We get a taxi out to Kostorfin, the meter running to the price of a gam from a half-decent hoor, just to be with our friends Cliff and Bunty Blades. Carol remembers Australia. The things my Bruce has seen, the things that have hurt him, they don't know. They would never know. But he shared them with me always. He explained to me why he went with that prostitute back in Australia. He needed to be with someone. It meant nothing. I failed Bruce by not being there for him. I was with my mum. Bruce had been working all the hours God sends. He'd been operating undercover in the King's Cross district on the trail of these gangsters. He told me about that terrible day. There he was, trying to open the huge, swinging doors of the garage. He couldn't get them open properly, only just enough for him to squeeze through. He looked into the darkness, venturing right into its black heart. Looking back, behind him, he could see a ray of sunlight across the garage forecourt. The odd car drove by, perhaps the odd working girl, swinging along in her short skirt and high heels. Inside, at the dark end of the garage, Bruce heard the low groans. He told me that it was the worst sound that he'd ever heard in his life. They were scarcely human groans. Something was in the office at the back of the garage. He moved towards it. Bruce opened the door and switched on the lights. There he was, Costas, 
or what was left of him. His torture had been systematic. He was lying across the table, face down on his belly. His chin is on the table, his head tilted up, facing Bruce. His jaw has been broken, and his teeth have been pulled out. They lie next to his amputated fingers. His eyes witness this. The eyelids have been cut away, and the eyeballs have been carefully removed from the head without severing the optic nerves. These had somehow been stretched like a cartoon character's, and the eyes lie, each one on a pile of books, each one facing some of the fingers and teeth and eyelids and ears, which have also been removed and cut off with surgical scissors. The scissors lie with the pliers, and the nail gun, which has secured Costas to the bench by his hands and clothing. The genitals have not been severed, possibly to avoid him bleeding to death. His tongue has been cut out. They wanted to keep him alive as a message to his associates. Bruce stood there, facing him, thinking, how could anybody do this to another human being? But all he said to Costas was, You've been keeping bad company, mate. He puts the gun in the man's mouth and fires. He cannot look, but the groans are no more. Bruce shakes and moves out of the office across the forecourt. The door is stiff, and it's a tight squeeze to get into the Sydney sunshine. He panics, trembling with anxiety. He tries to phone me, but I'm at my mum's. If only I'd been home for him. Bruce walks for a little bit, then runs into a prostitute, a half-Aboriginal girl called Madeline. He takes her to a hotel and pays her five hundred dollars just to talk to her. Just to talk. She sits warily as he speaks in measured tones, telling her about Costas and about the war he's having with the others and the consequences for him. It should have been me that was there, not that whore. I think that for Bruce, that image of Costas became a symbol for extreme possibilities of evil. That's why Bruce is how he is. Worms and Promotions I'm driving out to see Rossi, but Carol's in my mind. I used to tell her a pile of shite when I was knocking off Madeline, this half abo bird I used to leg out there. I made up a lot of bullshit about working undercover down King's Cross to put away a villain called Costas, a real thing. Eat, Bruce, eat. I wish I could make you eat more. You're a terrible man. There is somebody who could always make you eat. I sense this. Just moving around inside you, I can feel all your ghosts. You've internalised them, Bruce. Then I told Carol that hers and Stacey's safety couldn't be guaranteed. Carol was stubborn I can sense one that looms large in your life. Ian Robertson was his name. To arrest that miserable son of a bitch Costas. Yes, the cunt existed. But I had to expand the whole rigmarole as that half abble cow Madeline was putting pressure on me to leave Carol. She was very headstrong and less easily controlled than Carol. The old country called. Carol always believed every word I told her. She was happy in her own world with the kid. Always a domestic type, old Carol. Dirty cow in bed, mind you. Give her the meat in the dosh and she'd accept anything. It was all the dyke politics that fucked up her head. When I slapped her after she'd overstepped the mark and she freaked and went to that refuge. I apologise for that, but she overreacted. She'll come to her senses soon, though, nothing surer. I'm so lost in my thoughts that I missed the turning for Rossi's. A stop off at a newsagent for Playboy, Penthouse and Mayfair before pulling up outside his surgery. This Dr. Rossi cunt fancies himself. Swore the eye tie bastard. Dresses well, does Rossi. Nice suit, shirt, shoes. 
Betty makes a bundle in private consultations. Yes, we've got the test results. As I suspected, you've definitely got worms. We'll have to carry on with this treatment. Eh? I can't believe it. This is another price I have to pay for hanging around with schemies and criminals. It's only type worms, nothing for you to worry about. They're very common, but not at all dangerous. Something's growing inside me, and you say it isn't dangerous. It's not. But what you have to do is take this solution, and it'll help you move your bowels more frequently. This isn't anything fucking serious like cancer. More chemicals. Only my rash. More sophisticated warfare. No, that seems to be a persistent nervous condition. You don't have anything on your mind, anything you haven't told me about? Rossi's just an exploitative quack. But that's GPs for you. Fancy themselves as something else. Some want to be surgeons. Rossi evidently wants to be a psychologist. We can you, Rossi. Nothing in my mind at all, I say stiffly. Do your fucking job, you cunt. I'm glad to get away from Rossi and back to the station. I'm back just in time for lunch, so I hit the canny. Ina's haggis is on the day. Lennox and the closet faggot Peter Inglis are sitting together. I join them. Drummond and Fulton were behind me in the queue and they come and sit with us. Karen Fulton, Drummond's new best pal, was not always this. I'm sitting opposite them, looking at the haggis, and I feel like shouting at Fulton, Mind the time I fucked you, Karen, after Princess Di's funeral. I've never seen such a big, black, thick minge in my puff. Come on, everybody, let's take a look at former WPC Fulton's hairy pie. It's a fucking jungle. Curly hairs right up to and around the asshole. Drummond's going on about her favourite shite, politics and changes in legislation and how it affects policing. She's looking a bit tired. Too many long nights at the office trying to trace where a hammer comes from. That'll never be detected. I heard that cunt talking about me as well. Her and the fag, Inglis. Poor old Clell. He's deaf or lost the plot since that move to traffic, Ray says. Went to see him the other day. He looks at me and Drummond. He was saying that we were working for the Alcohol Marketing Board. He's obsessed with this drugs fuhrer the government's appointed. No, we are working as enforcers of the law. The democratically elected government of the day makes the laws in Parliament. We enforce that law, Drummond squeaks, in polis rhetoric. Mmm, I say teasingly. Clell may have a point. This new drugs fuhrer wants to attack demand rather than supply. That means sending more kids to jail. If that works, and kids are scared to take illegal drugs, then they'll turn on to legal ones like alcohol as a substitute. Which means more violence. Ray gives us a thumbs up. Tougher sentences, I say. Mayor Polis, Ray laughs. And mayor promoted posts, I rub my hands. It also means mayor prisoners, mayor prisons, mayor wardens, mayor security guards. Pump priming, basic Keynesian economics. Then we'll get Maggie back in ten years' time, telling us we've been spending too much. But we can cut back on education, social work and health and all that shit, Lennox nods. Drummond's looking horrified. We're only the enforcers of the law of the land. I mean... If a left-wing government was elected to power and had a radical agenda which became law, and that law was ignored or opposed by vested interests, then that law would be enforced by us just as rigorously. That's how it is in a democracy, she says smugly. Bollocks, I tell her. If you believe that, then you're even thicker than I thought. Ray raises an eyebrow 
as Drummond pouts sourly. I mean, go back to the miners' strike. Our job then was to crush socialism on the demonstration. He brought us in. He made you eat, Bruce. His methods were his methods. Did you learn those methods from him? He made you eat coal. Black, shiny, filthy coal. Red. Just a wee bit too much like communism. I don't know who asked that queer to open his flaccid mouth. That cunt should stick to thinking about young laddie's cocks or whatever pervy shite goes on in his sick head and leave the politics to the experts. No, we upheld the law, Drummond screeching. Fulton nods supportively. If unions had never broken the laws, we wouldn't have any democracy. In the first place, I say. Wondering why the fuck I'm coming out with all this wank. But that's history. It isn't like that now, Drummond says. Yes, you're right, Amanda, I correct myself. But there are people within the unions now who don't give a fuck about democracy. Maggie sorted them out, but they're still there, just waiting for that Tony Blair spastic to show signs of weakness and let them back in. That was why things got so messed up with the last Labour government. These bastards held sway, scargling the likes. That's why we had to sort them out. That scargle was a troublemaker, English snorts. But Tony Blair, though, game is due. He's got rid of that unions and socialism nonsense in the Labour Party now. As usual, Lennox says fuck all. The best way, I suppose. Right enough, same rules apply. Anyway, I say, enough boring politics. It's Christmas. What's the story with the Christmas do? You were organising that, Amanda. With great restraint, I stopped myself from adding, That's all you're fucking well good for. Yes, well, we've booked the burning ruby tandoori house in Colburn Street for the meal, she says with distaste. Her and Fulton wanted to go to Pierre Victoire's, but no way would the lads have that. I wasn't into any sick frog puss lisping around me while I was trying to eat. I'm surprised English didn't want that, mind you. There is just one problem, though, Bruce, Ray says. Aye? Well, Ralphie Constantine's been on the team, and I suppose he counts as one of us. We've yet to decide whether or not he should be invited for the curry. No way is a uniform spastic one of us. But then again, I know that Drummond's against Considine coming on the Christmas session. Of course Ralphie Considine has to be asked, I tell them. I'm getting a little bit sick of this division between uniformed and non-uniformed officers. We're all on the same team and should reap the same benefits. I'm thinking about these scouse spazwits that did me over in Amsterdam. One of them had that T-shirt on, a red one, commemorating Shankly, I think. Very laudable sentiments, Bruce, Drummond says, and I think everyone sitting here would endorse them. But surely there are other issues to consider. I raise my eyebrows non-committally and let Drummond launch into one about however we may personally feel about it, we have to acknowledge that the force is a hierarchical organisation, and if we try to fly in the face of the organisation's culture, we will set up opposition, division and disillusionment in what are, after all, sensitive times with the reorganisation pending. That's an interesting point, Amanda. I think I'm reluctantly coming round to your view. Maybe it does seem a wee bit self-indulgent to make personal statements of our liberalism at a time when the organisation needs continuity of practice. There's a few nods around the table. All except Inglis, who doesn't look happy. He's in irrelevance. No votes for queers in this section. So Drummond has her way, and we decide that it's expedient not to invite a uniform spastic to our Christmas do. Result! Of course, if I had said, 
No way a uniform spastic gets invited to a plain clothes do. Then Drummond would have been the first to shoot me down in flames. But the last thing I want is to be sitting in my brown, the new black, leather jacket, check shirt, and fawn flannels, and the curry hoose beside Considine, decked out in a white shirt, black polis trues, and shoes. After this little meeting, I get restless, and I feel a chug coming on, a head downstairs with a paper. I do a bit of graffiti in the bogs. Peter Inglis is a fucking HIV spreader, and Inglis equals sick, diseased, queer. I'm sitting there looking at it for a while. I start chuckling and my sides ache. Then a depressed feeling digs in, followed by a steady outrage. It was wrong to do this to a brother officer. The force can't have this going on. I'm the fucking fed rep here. To describe a brother officer in this manner. I'm psyching myself up, getting into role. I pull the chain and flush away my shit. There's some traces of worm, but no sign of the head. I'll get the bastard, though. Sure as fuck I'll get him. I'll get him all right. I go upstairs and stride purposefully over to Peter, tapping his wrist and steering him over into a corner. Peter, have you seen the graffiti in the toilet? I ask in a low, concerned voice. Ach, there's always something there. I never take any notice, he shrugs. Well, maybe you should, I tell him, letting my anger rise. I'm getting a bit fucking well fed up of this shite. As fucking fed rep, I'm no having people's character defamed in this way. I'm going up to see Toll now. I raise my voice and look over the room. Some cunts playing silly fuckers here. I just hope I didn't find out who it is. I storm out of the room leaving them looking bemused. I'm charging up the stairs to Toll's office, and I'm in without knocking. Gaffer, a wee word. Uh, Bruce, I'm a bit busy right now, Toll says, shuffling through some papers. You look so fucking low. I want you to come and see something, some graffiti in the toilet. I don't have time for, as fed rep, I don't have time to see brother officers being slandered by other members of the service. What's this? I explain the graffiti to Toll, and he's following me down to the bogs. The others have come along, their faces like the ghouls when that Colin Sim guy died. They're looking at Inglis for a reaction, and he looks crestfallen. It's just a load of bloody nonsense, he's saying over and over again, torn between trying to make light of it and being genuinely staggered. How did it make you feel? I head back up the stairs with Toll, who beckons me into his office and closes the door. Uh, listen, Robbo, he says. Inglis isn't, well, you know, is he? What? I ask. I'm starting to enjoy this. Like the graffiti says, Brother Robertson, Toll snaps. Toll must be upset to resort to playing the craft card so nakedly. Whether he is or isn't is irrelevant, surely, I say, planting the seed. Peter's sexuality is his business. He's being harassed, and we operate a non-discrimination policy on the grounds of sexual orientation. But he can't be being sexually harassed if he's not a, well, gay, I think the fashionable term is these days. Well... You can call it sexual harassment or just plain harassment, Bob, but the way I see it is that this is the unacceptable face of canteen culture. Oh, whoa, Bruce, whoa, I'm on your side. Now, this has to be stamped out. It just came as a bit of a shock to me. I mean, Peter's a craft stalwart. Peter's a lonely guy, Bob. What he gets up to is his own business, and I don't profess to know much about him but I'm not having a brother officer harassed in this way. Exactly. I'll make sure this is dealt with. I walk out as high as a kite. The concepts, English and puffery, are now indelibly associated. The concepts, 
Inglis and promotion, not so. Ah, the games, the games. You should keep moving when you're on a roll, and I decide to call on Estelle at the flower shop. I'd like to fucking gee that wee shag one. She's probably fear of Gorman and Settington. What she needs is protection from those monsters. Someone she can trust in her life. An older, more mature man who can respond to her needs. If there are damsels in distress need saving, then I can think of no better knight in shining armour than Detective Inspector-elect Bruce Robertson. That old familiar lump in the flannel starts rising as I think about Estelle and a combination of positions and girly sex noises. A threesome with her and we Claire, the hooer of Maisie's. Just what the doctor ordered. That'll sort out my fucking rash, Rossi. When I get to the shop, the only person there is the disapproving old boot who tells me that Estelle is off sick with the cold. A lot of it going about, I cheerfully say. Aye, sure, the old cow mumbles. She doesn't like Estelle at all. That's as sure as another trophyless season in Gorgie. Does she get many callers? Too bloody many, the wife, he says, then crinkles her nose and commences hostilities. What's it to you? Looks like the old cunt just woke up and smelt the bacon. The Scottish working class and respect for the polis go together like Mother Teresa and Playboy centerfolds. I decide not to probe. Just trying to make sure I've no rivals, I smile, heading for the exit. I never thought she was that desperate, the cheeky old boot says. I stop abruptly and look around at the stock and give some of the plants a sniff. Bad time of the year for flowers, I say then. You got a staff toilet back there? Aye, she says. Anything else? Not for now. That cheeky old whore is getting a visit from the environmental health. We're fucking sure the old cunt is. Anyway, it seems a good idea to take the rest of the afternoon off and let the form OTA 1-7 take the strain. Call it stress management, Mr. Toll. Call it stress management, Mr. Nidri. Bruce Robertson, stress management. It's time, though, that Bruce Robertson went to the lavy. I take the warm laxative and drink it all down in a gulp. Eat, that's it. Eat, eat for myself. And uh, what is this? Hold on tight. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Chemical attack. Must weather the storm. Lay head in evidence. I leave the Hunter's Square bogs then stop into the pie shop for a chilli pie. I almost got the bastard worms right out there. There can't be much of them left. I get in the Volvo and head out to Collington. The worms are on the run. The worm called Inglis is being flushed out the system, outed and routed before further infestation can take hold. At home, I cut myself out a big, celebratory line of posh. I'm soon dying on a shag. The only person I can think of belling is Shirley. It's either that or whoring, and she's cheaper. Cheryl, girl. I succumb to the force of libido and make the call, but as soon as she arrives, I can see that I've made a mistake and that I'd have been better off where a wank. She's like a block of ice. She's staring at me, leaning back on the chair, smoking a fag, looking really nasty. I don't know why I'm here, she says bitterly. And I'm about to retort along the lines of, because you're a slag who wants fucked. But I bite my tongue. Carol phoned, she says suddenly, in a gleeful inspiration, hoping to get to me. She told me that she doesn't want anything to do with you. If you try to see the bairn... Ha! 
What does she know? She knows nothing. That's what she fucking well kens. The sum total, I snap, feeling my anger rising. I try to control myself. I mean, she's deluding herself, surely. It's sad. I'm more sad than angry about it. She's unstable. I personally think that she's had some sort of breakdown. I worry about her. She seems all right to me, Shirley says, doubtfully, folding her arms, fixing her eyes on me, her dark eyes. She's a sexy cow from a certain angle. Believe you me, Shirley, the game I'm in, you become something of an expert on human nature. She's obviously had some kind of breakdown that's gone undetected. She's telling lies, lies to poison you against me. Poison me against you? Huh, you've been quite capable of that yourself, she scoffs. Her face contorted in petulance, almost cracking that foundation mask which she wears to cover the acne scar she has. I like the way she does her eyes, but always have. Time to move. I get ready to make my pitch. Look, I know I've been cruel to you in the past, but you know why, surely, to God you know why, I plead. I wish I did, Bruce. I really wish I did, she says, shaking her head. Now don't weigh me up, Shirley, please, and don't insult the both of us. I stand up and walk to the door. Surely the whore can't be stupid enough to fall for it. I'm sorry, Bruce, I don't follow you, she says. Her pupils are widening. That fucking spastic, I don't believe it. She's doubting herself. That's step one. Establish doubt. Step two. Drive the bus right through her fucking doubt. Shirley, you surely to God know full well that I've been trying to drive you away. Because I... Fuck, I'm saying too much. I shake my head. What? What are you saying? I tried to drive you away because I couldn't fucking stand it. What? What couldn't you stand? Danny, Carol, him being with you, me being with her, making love to her and pretending it was you, putting up with sneaky shags and backs of cars when I wanted to take you to my bed and hold you in my arms and make love to you all night and shout to the whole fucking world, this is her, this is the lassie I love. She holds my gaze, and her eyes start to water, and I think of all the injustices that have been perpetrated against me recently, and I hope that I feel sorry enough for myself to make my eyes moisten as well, and I hope that she mistakes this for some of my soul sliding into them. And the spasticated cow does, and I can't hold this gaze for long without bursting out laughing, so I pull her towards me in a tight embrace and listen to her sob. Bruce, Bruce, can we no work something out, Bruce? I love you. And I see my eyes in the mirror behind her, like the eyes on that Tory party election poster about that Tony Blair spastic. I fuck her, and I'm regretting it, and regretting my stupid spiel, even before I've blown my muck inside her. After, I have to listen to her rabbiting on about her plans and ambitions for us. The sex with her is nothing like I imagine it to be prior to commencing it. I feel entrapped by my lust, but when I actually get round to doing it, it just seems so pointless and tedious. She's jabbering away, and I'm telling her about Inglis and his misfortunes. Bruce, she laughs. Why is it you have to savour everything bad that happens to others? I think about this for a second or two. It stems from a belief that there's only a finite number of bad things that can happen in the world at any given time. So if they're happening to someone else, they ain't happening to me. In a way, it's a celebration of joie de vivre. She wants to stay the night, but I tell her I'm on back shift. She reluctantly leaves, and I do some more lines before tanning a bottle of grouse. 
This gives me the shits, and I stagger through to the bogs. I whip down my cakes and look at my airs. No, 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 no,
a horse-faced bird looks at us in embarrassment, and another rotund figure chides the puker in a high, squeaky voice. Come on, Hank, too much Christmas spirit! This is a right spastics convention. I thought that I was with a sad bunch, but there's always somebody worse than you. A spot Drummond giving a disapproving Tolesque gesture, and this immediately instills a surge of goodwill in me for those part-time seasonal drinkers whom I had instinctively hated. I pull some Kleenex out from my jacket pocket. I always keep them handy for wanking purposes, as you never know when the tight-arsed cunts at HQ supplies will run short. I hand the book in mess a couple. Here you go, mate. Thanks, the squeakoid says on his behalf. Office do, I ask. Ah, standard life. Ah, standard life. The citadel of spare fanny in Edinburgh. You don't qualify as a fully-fledged male native of that city unless you've fucked at least a couple of buds from standard life by the time you've hit your quarter century. Mind you, the fanny on display here looks far from impressive. Probably senior minge. Forget the models in suits bullshit in the women's magazines. Generally speaking, the further up an organisation's hierarchy you go, the uglier the buds get. This isn't because tidy fanny have less brains than dogs. It's just that tidy fanny with real brains always take the shortcut by marrying Wedge and getting sorted out with some plastic before heading off with a tidy settlement. I look around and decide that we must be near boardroom level here. We head into the pub vacated by the standard life crew. I get them in, ordering myself a vodka and tonic water. I've got the horn set up and I fancy firing into somebody later on. Fulton's the obvious candidate, but she's taking things quite easy. No like last Christmas, or Princess Diana's funeral, when I got her three sheets and rode her back at her flat in Newington. Not firing on all cylinders yet, Karen, I ask, noting her nursing her drink. I've gone off the drink a bit, she says. Drummond looks approvingly. Mind after Princess Di's funeral? We were three sheets then. I couldn't resist that one, and I drink in Fulton's visible cringing. We ended up back at yours. Oh, aye, Inglis laughs. Tell me more. Fulton winces again, but Drummond interjects. That was a very sad and emotional day. Aye, Gus says. I watched that Mother Teresa's funeral again the other night. I was checking to see what old tapes I could record her. I watched it all the way through again, but it wasn't as good as Princess Di's. Papes, though, what do you expect, Gilman says. Mind you, the papes usually ken how to put on a good funeral. I'll say that for them, Gus comments. I'll cut a bit. Fucking wogs, eh? Gilman rasps. What do you expect? They can't fucking well run the country without us. You didn't expect them to be able to do a funeral without fucking things up. I don't think, Drummond begins. Gilman dismisses her with a contentious scowl. Fifty fucking years they've had to get it right. If they'd got it right, they wouldn't need any Mother Teresa, because they wouldn't have any slums and poverty in the first place. Well, Inglis says cheerily, we've got our own parliament now. Let's hope we make a better job of it. That'll be a load of fucking nonsense and all, I snort. Whose fucking shout is it? If we can't get organised to get to the bar, we're not going to be able to run our own affairs. Inglis takes the hint and gets them in. We lose the disapproving Drummond after a few drinks, but Fulton goes as well, which fucks up the prospects of a gangbang. Still, that's force fanny. No worth the cock that's poking it. The crawl progresses down through town to the St. James Oyster Bar. I end up necking with some tart who's groping my ass. 
and I only decide not to take her back for a shagging when Lennox points out to me that she's a total fucking hound. I sneak out the door and we head down the road. Inglis makes some comment about dubious ladies, and I decide that that poof is too lippy and he's fucking well getting it. I arrange for us all to have a late night drink up at the casino, which I know is closed for refurbishment. It's now freezing and we're walking through driving snow. Shite, I moan, on seeing the boarded up doors. Oh, it'll have to be one of the ass bandit places, I tell them, pointing to the top of the walk. I'm no going there, English scoffs. Doon to Shrub Hill to the Masonic. Who have you got to hide, Ray laughs. He's taking his pint out with him and is drinking it. Inglis looks at Lennox as if it's him that's the graffiti artist. You saying I've got anything to hide, Likes? No, Ray shrugs and takes a sip from his pint. I'm saying nothing. I smile at that. Look, come on, it's just for a fucking drink, Dougie Gilman snaps. Ray drains his pint and hurls his glass at a council gritting lorry. It smashes against its hull. Spastics, he shouts. We head into the club. The bouncer looks piercingly at us. But we get in as soon as he tipples with Polis. It's a drinking club full of all sorts of sad poofs. There's the camp type, the seasoned scene queens and the hard ex-cons who've got a taste for it in Sockton. There's also a smattering of tourist poofs, Wondering what the fuck they're doing here. I go downstairs and spot the man of my dreams, Sinky, a mercenary wee Colton Hill rent boy. I brief him on what to do before returning upstairs to the boys. We're having a good crack. Gilman's already burst one queer's mouth in the lavvy for looking at him funnily. After a couple of drinks, Sinky appears and heads down the floor towards Inglis. Peter! Oh, Peter! He shouts camply. Long time no see. Brought some friends along and notice. I don't need can you, English shouts. Oh, sorry. Didn't realise it was that kind of a scene. So exclusive. Sinky retreats, raising his eyebrows. He can be so immature, he adds as an aside to several shocked parties around him. Gilman is looking at Inglis with sheer loathing, and Lennox has moved slightly apart from him. I fucking didn't can him! Inglis squeals and makes to go for Sinky. I grab his shoulders. For fuck's sake, Peter, we're Polis. Didn't he cause a fucking scene in here? But I didn't can him! Inglis pleads. Well, he seems to ken you, Dougie Gilman says, eyes narrowing into slits of hatred. You wrote that shite, Inglis accuses, his voice in exasperation going all high and fey like a pansy's. I didn't write anything about you. It was probably one of your fucking boyfriends, Gilman sneers, his chin jutting out. You cunt! Inglis swings at Gilman, who steps back and bangs him in the side of the face. I grab Inglis, and I'm hoping that Gilman will let fly again and smash that queer coupon, but Ray and Gus have got a grip on him, and are restraining him. Gilman's tidy, and Inglis knows this, his struggle becoming more pathetic, and those startled eyes making him seem more wretched than ever. Look, let's get out of here. We're all a bit pished. Let's just get down to the Masonic, I urge. We stagger outside into the blizzard, and Inglis is already away, a lonely figure trudging through the snow up Leith Walk. Come on, Peter! Gus shouts. Lee the fucking poof, Gilman says. Fucking ass bandit! Ray shouts after him. Big fucking Nancy boy! Gilman roars, cupping his hands around his mouth. The rest of the boys might pass this off as just a load of drunken nonsense tomorrow, but Gilman's tasted fag blood, and he won't let go of this now. We bay, mocking lynch mob laughter, at the broken figure of the sodomite Inglis, 
as his hunched back recedes up the walk. Ray has another glass in his hand. He chucks it in English's direction, but it falls a good few yards short and breaks with a muffled thud in the road, its impact cushioned by the thick snow. Who'd have believed we had a Nancy boy in the unit, eh? In the craft and all, I muse, as we heave our pished out bodies all the way down to the club. Great fucking time we've had by all of us, that fucking pished night. You need to be at work. You need the job. Hating, yet at the same time thriving on its petty concerns. These concerns are enough to distract you from the self you must only face up to at night, between the extinguishing of the television set and the onset of a jittery and fitful descent into a physically bruising sleep. How can I forgive you, Bruce, after the ruthless shedding of my most significant other? That creature of sublime beauty, that purest of souls who trusted you, our host, who didn't want to hold on grimly for life here in those exploding gaseous bowls. That soul who believed that you had the purest of intentions towards the other, just as the other did to all the others in this world of ours. My pain. My pain! A curse upon any god who visits his most evil tax on that goodness of spirit. Let us curse any unfair and unjust society of souls that chooses to punish that goodness as a weakness and that fills that great essence with cynicism and vileness in preference to knowledge and even greater goodness. How can I forgive you? But I forgive you. I must. I know your story. How can I forgive you? But forgive you I must. Must I? How can I forgive you? Forgive you, I must. Must I? Your story. It started for you in a little mining village called Nitten, just outside of the fair city of Edina. You were the first son born in troubled circumstances to an Ian Robertson and a Molly Hanlon. They were mining folk. You were their first son. But something wasn't right. They were people who were used to a life of struggle. Nothing, however, could prepare them for the personal trauma they would face. The people in the pit communities always knew where they stood. They knew that throughout their history, the governing classes had always looked after their own. The aristocrats who owned the land, the miners dug the coal on, and the capitalists who owned the factories which were supplied by that commodity. Very seldom, if ever, did government take the side of the people who worked in these factories or dug that coal. They did win battles, though, the miners, as they stuck together and were strong and solid. But on the one occasion they weren't, they lost it all. But your family, Bruce, they lost it all the moment they first had it. So you came from a mining town and a mining family. You even went down the pit when you left school. Yet when the police lined up against them to enforce the new anti-union laws on behalf of the state and break the resistance of the mine workers picketing against the closures, you were not on the side of the mine workers. You were on the other side. Power was everything. You understood that. It wasn't for an end to achieve anything to better one's fellow man. It was there to have and to keep and to enjoy. The important thing was to be on the winning side. If you can't beat them, join them. Only the winners or those sponsored by them write the history of the times. That history decrees that only the winners have a story worth telling. The worst ever thing to be is on the losing side. You must accept the language of power as your currency, but you must also pay a price. Your desperate sneering and mocking only illustrates how high the price has been and how fully it has been paid. The price is your soul. You came to lose this soul. You came not to feel. Your life, your circumstances and your job demanded that price. Frightened that you wouldn't cast a shadow when you faced the sun, you stopped looking up at it. Your head stayed bowed, except in the service of your new masters. But this didn't happen with a strike. This happened way, way back. I would have said that you had a journey into the darkness, but in truth, you never made it out of it. The wee bastard had fucked off and hadn't said a word about the incident and had got himself out of it by calling in sick. As Gilman said in the canteen when I was feeding my face, he didn't have to phone in sick, 
because we knew the cunt was sick anyway. So Gilman was the perfect man to send to the forum. That latent Nazi was the man to gee it tight to all they fucking smart bastards. Toll's doing his nut at me. The spirit of Christmas, my ass. I look out the window at the snow falling. Christmas Eve, and I haven't even had time to go Christmas shopping, thanks to this dead wog case. The snow is really falling, though, and Toll has a tree in the corner of his office. It's nice and warm, and his voice is oddly lulling. It raises up a level of sharpness, though. Why, Dougie Gilman, why did you send him? I look intently at Toll, his ridiculous bouffon hair. Toll thinks he's an intellectual. His first fantasy was that he was a manager, after they sent him on that MBA course. That was bad enough. His second, that he's a screenwriter, is just fucking stupid. These, however, pale into insignificance beside his greatest and most damaging conceit, namely that he's fucking Polis. I feel like laughing in his face. Instead, I fire out the spiel. As the responsible officer, I have to consider the development of all the officers in my charge. Dougie Gilman was weak in the community relations area. I made a supervisory decision that he could improve in this area by guided exposure to community relations activity, so I got him to liaise with the forum. Well, I don't know what guidance he got, because they've only gone and filed a complaint against him, a serious complaint. Even worse... It was initiated by the San Young woman, the one who ran the EO's course with Amanda Drummond. Nidri's insisting on a disciplinary. I've had to inform Gilman. I'm not in the mood for this. It's almost tempting to tell Toll that I knew those dykes would be trouble, but I bite my tongue. Well, we have a conflict of interest here. As Fed Rep... Don't even think about representing Gilman, Toll shouts. We'll see, I tell him, standing my ground. Toll rolls his eyes. Look, Bruce, things are bloody difficult here. We've got Arnott on long-term sick, OT cutbacks, and this racism thing. On top of that, there's a bloody Jesse boy in the hat for the inspector's post. Are you referring to Brother Peter Ings? Yes, I am, Brother Robertson, Toll squeals, unawares that he's falling into my trap. Look, Bruce, I'm as liberal as the next man on the force, but I understand how cops think. I understand canteen culture. How can we have someone of his disposition, policy or no policy, leading brother officers? Well, what do you mean? I ask. How many officers could take orders from someone like that? It would be a recipe for disaster. No way. I'm going to have a chat with Inglis, talk him out of applying and I don't want any Fed rep or craft led objections. I say nothing. This is professional concern, not personal prejudice. Toll spits as if through an ulcerated mouth, every utterance causing distress. I won't pretend that I don't find the idea of men doing that to each other absolutely disgusting, but that's by the way. I give Toll a look which I hope says that should be taken as given by all right-minded people, and the fact you felt the need to state it indicates to me that you might be a latent poof as well. He seems to get the drift and coughs nervously. But I'm far more concerned about the professional implications. I still don't see what you're on about, I tell him. Come on, Bruce. If he was to get the promo, what would that do for morale? How can you have respect for a... I mean, how can you have confidence in a man who's going to be constantly undressing you with his eyes, masturbating over images of you? It's going to compromise everyone. Well, this is a bit caveman, Bob. The force in some parts of the country advertise in the gay press, I and mean, we're meant to be hot on non-discrimination with regards to sexual orientation. This isn't is some parts of the country. This is Scotland! Toll bangs his fist off the desk and then looks mildly embarrassed. I shrug. He's a brother officer in the force and the craft. He shakes his head and composes himself. Look, Bruce, 
I know that you feel that because he's up for the same job as you, you don't want to be seen to be gaining advantage by undermining him. I appreciate your integrity on this issue, but I'm telling you straight, Inglis is last Tuesday's daily record as far as promotion is concerned. Toll has swallowed the bait. But I still nod sternly. Best let him think I'm far from amused at this. Inglis may be a sad pansy, but I still object to the general principle that Toll tells me anything. Anyway, I take my leave. I meet up with Gilman in the office, and we go to the rag doll and shoot some pool. He needs friends in the Fed and the Craft, or to think he has friends in the Fed and the Craft. Don't you worry about an internal polis disciplinary. Nay, cunt's gone he day now. Guaranteed, we tell him. I hope no, eh? He shrugs. This cunt acts like he really doesn't give a fuck. For a few coons. Problem is, you can't call a fucking spade a spade, or in my case, a fucking wog, he says, humorously. Oh, no way. I can't mind the last fucker that got disciplined seriously on the force as a result of a complaint by a member of the public. Gilman is a good old boy. I suspect that he knows that the best place for an instinctive man of violence is on the force with total state backup for when things get nasty. Most polis are just ordinary guys doing an extraordinary job, which makes it such a pleasure to come across a genuine psychopath like Dougie. I was impressed by the way he took out Inglis, not the sort of man to let the belligerence of others deter him from his chosen course of action. All it means, of course, is that I have to do him. Gilman will be a worthy scalp. He's in my sights. And maybe he's just a wee bit more worried than I thought. I do, he says. After he hutton, for smashing that boy's head in in the cells. The boy nearly died. Emergency op saved him. But that was drugs. After he had no choice, I tell him. What? You mean the boy was under narcotic influence and was potentially dangerous? Gilman asks. No, I mean Artie. He had just committed detox the week before for his coke problem. He had the heebie-jeebies big time, and this spastic with a show voice started gain at loads about getting a fucking lawyer and making a fucking phone call when Artie was just trying to ask a few simple questions. Gilman smiles in the cold manner of an assassin. It's like looking in the mirror. But he's never a Bruce Robertson, and he never will be. He thinks I'm his only friend in the force. Me, who wound him up like a clockwork toy and sent him into the coon's den. Think again, my simple friend. Don't you worry, Dougie, I tell him. We'll get this nonsense sorted out. When I return, I find Toll back on the blower. He's on about the lack of progress again, which means that Nidri's been on to him and somebody's kicked Nidri's ass. Now it's sure. Not my problem, sonny boy. Busy, busy, busy. I head for the bogs with the paper to have a wank to Jilly from Bath. Somebody has written in magic marker over the graffiti in our favourite trap, New Graffiti. My blood runs cold for a moment. Half man, half spastic, Zero cop, robo cop, the future of law enforcement, my arse. I can't concentrate on Jilly from Bath now. All I see in my hand is a flaccid, flaky, itchy cock. I scratch and claw at my bollocks. Funny fucking joke. Ha ha, ya cunts. I force myself not to think about who could have written this. Toll, Lennox, Inglis. But he's no been in the day. Gilman, Bain, uh, they lack the imagination. Or perhaps a uniform spastic who knows the contempt I hold those losers in. No. I force myself not to think of who it could be, because it means that they've won if you do that. Sorry, my sweet, sweet friend. Bruce Robertson is made of sterner stuff. 
Nice try, spastic works. Ha! No way, Jilly's here, Jilly from Bath, you fucking little whore. Lennox spreading rumours. No, come on, Jilly, your fucking paps are gorgeous. Would you like me to suck and lick them? Toll claims to be above all that canteen culture, as he calls it. Mm. Fuck them. Come on, Julie. Robbie's the boy to do it for you, baby. I bet you shave your little cunt. If only you just slip off these little panties for Robbo. The future of law enforcement. Cheeky cunt Gilman. Represent him. Me? But no. Jilly and me. Jilly and me. Nay cunt else. Just that flesh. Oh, flesh he's put into newsprint. All for Robbo. Fuck all the other spastics who read the sun, they don't understand. This is our wee secret, Jilly, our little love letter. Likes riding horses, I'll fucking bet. Take it, baby, take all of Bruce. I'm coming. I'm spurting mere muck and a Ouija on amphetamine sulphate, and Toll and Lennox and Clellan and Inglis and Lennox won't stop me now. Fuck yous, ya bastards, fuck yous. Bruce Robertson, Inspector Bruce Robertson, you jealous inadequate cunts! That was a good one. After a Christmas canteen dinner, which isn't too bad, Inus pulled out the stops, turkey and trimmings. Lennox and I decide to go out and get hammered. We enjoy a few civilised beers at the lodge, then we're back at Ray's and there's a blizzard, but it's inside his flat. The blizzard is one of cocaine. We're feeling weak, and the drug is giving us the illusion of strength. We're telling Lennox of the conversation we have had with Toll, and know that we are talking too much. Yet to stop will leave gaps, and into such gaps unwelcome thoughts will intrude. We have no alternative but to keep on. Lennox, though, did not do the graffiti. We know that he would not be able to look us in the eye had he been the culprit. Ken, what he says to me? We ask Ray Lennox. No, Ray replies, chopping out another quality line. He goes, The craft's changed. I goes, What do you mean? Fucking spastic. And he turns round, and you can what he says to us then? Ray shakes his head. He goes, if you dig yourself into a hole, then you rely on your connections in the craft to pull you to it. What's that cunt on about? Lennox asks, exhaling in slow exasperation, his eyes wide and wired. That moustache is coming along. Bandito Lennox. I goes, What do you mean by that? He says, Just what I said. Then you rely on the craft to dig you a hole. Cheeky cunt. Scoffs Lennox. See, he's fear, Ray. He's fear of your craft connections, our influence in the craft. Hunts with the hounds and runs with the hares, that cunt. Ken, what he says as I walked out the door? No. He goes, Craft connections can only get you so far. Eh, hey, what a fucking... But wait till you hear this. Then he says, Wait till you hear this, you know. Eh? He goes, Besides... You'll know the only one with craft connections. Ha ha ha! What a fucking wanker! That's, that's, I mean, you can't take the cunt seriously. Exactly, Ray. That's what we felt like saying. You cannot be serious. I could hardly keep a straight face, I can tell you. I just goes, Thank you, Brother Toll. Ray smiles and then lets a silence hang for a bit. I can feel the cunt's been working up to something. Listen, Robbo, I've got something to tell you, he says, lowering his voice. I don't want you getting the wrong end of the stick, that's why I'm telling you first. I want to get on in the department, but I've no real chance of a promotion over the next few years. Not enough experience. You've just got your DS, you cheeky wee cunt. Of course you haven't got enough experience. I don't know, though, Ray. It's how good you are that counts. I was even thinking of applying for the DI vacancy in the reorganisation myself. 
I can't have any chance. But it'd be a good idea to give myself the experience of applying for some of those jobs, of going through a couple of promotion board selection procedures, just so as I know what to expect when I am experienced enough. I'd hate to think that a couple of years or so down the line, when I was ready, that I'd fuck up, simply because I'd no experience of a panel interview. What do you think? I think you're a smarmy wee cunt. I don't see why not, Ray. Can he do any harm? I nod. Ray Lennox now, after our job. Ray Cunty Boz Lennox. Big Dick Lennox in the canteen in the club. Ass Lick Lennox in Tolly's office. Shitey drawers, shriveled knob Lennox when it come down to the action with my hoorie, a sister-in-law. Treacherous Ray Lennox. Not a bad idea, Ray, we wheezingly repeat. Can he do any harm? Puts a marker for the future. That's it, Robbo. Yeah, he just fly up a wee kite to let them know who Ray Lennox is. The cunt smiles and chops up more cocaine. Criminal Lennox. When he goes to the toilet, I watch the whorehouse red cushion covers in his satire retreat under the implacable heat from the end of my cigarette. I do a few more of these, then turn it over. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lennox. Christmas Shopping Canty Boz Lennox, having dropped the bombshell that he's trying to take my fucking job, then has the audacity to all but chuck me out into the snow, and he's off to the paternal home for Christmas. Fuck him. I need to Christmas shop anyway. They're open late tonight. I have a pint in Alan Anderson's old boozer, then repair to the bogs, where I chop up a huge line in the cistern and snort it back. I need it to brave this shopping hell. I get down to the St. James's Centre. I have to use the coke energy to shop. Christmas fucking Eve. Need to get something for the bairn. CNA's catches my eye, as I need to get some new flannels. All my others are getting a bit smelly, and I refuse to wear jeans, as it's the mark of a skimmy. I grab a pair of fawn ones, which look my size, 28 waist, medium leg, and I shakily hand over my credit card. The visa credit limit is fucked, and I face up to the humiliation of the rejection. I pay it by switch, and get the fuck out of here, loudly announcing as I go, Cash flow, that's all! Professional, not a schemey. Man of wealth. Man of wealth! But the vultures are circling. I can't face that fucking Toys or Us place. Where now? Where now? Fucking John Lewis. John Lewis Store Guide. Ladies Fashions. I'll maybe get something for Carol. Something nice. A Christmas Carol. I can't hack this, though. The crowd's in all that shite. I do another big line in the store bogs. I'm still losing outside because I'm standing alone. Can we stand any other way? And they're flying past in all directions, those shoppers in John Lewis's, those eyes every place but mine, just please look at me, and one bitch in leather trousers does, then averts her gaze to the other goods, heading for haberdashery, knitting, wools, customers' collections, dress fabrics, dress patterns. I say, madam, go one floor up, just past cards and lost souls. Then I see it. Two pounds thirty-five for a black paper gift bag to put small gifts into. Gifts. Gifts for gifts. Better to give than to receive. Still to come. The fat, sweating midget spitting tersely into his mobby. The vacant procession of sheep up the escalator. The big cow you want to just scream, Geezer fucking shag! at 
or even just look at me, please, police, please, please look at me. And I feel the hand on my arm, and somebody's asking if I'm all right, sir. And I pull away and whip out my ID and snarl, Police, please me like I please you. And then I move away through the house of the Lord, this great temple of worship to our God of Christian givingness, spendingness, consumer expenditureness, business competitiveness, shop and cheat deathness, and into the street where the excluded Jakeys beg for pennies. Last night I said those words to Puri. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, shell, she reckons you're a craply. Fuck off, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. Please police me. Oh, yeah, like I police you. I'm fucked. And I'm away him with no fucking presence except my man at CNA's flannels. No presence. Nobody to give them to you anyway. No way will I sleep. No way. I chop out a line and watch some porn. I'm unable to raise a wank though and it depresses me. I put my decomposing prick away and watch some of the Saturday night programmes I've taped. Jim Davidson's Generation Game. Davidson's a good comic. He keeps the trash in their place, but the ponces at the BBC don't let him show his full range. It passes the time until the twilight comes, and it's safe for me to crash. Not crashing. But I couldn't crash. So here it is. Merry Christmas... Everybody's having fun. Some may be, but others, we have work to do. These OTA 1-7 forms won't complete themselves, worse luck. So I'm out, bright and early, with Gus Bain, and we're cruising deserted streets looking for a bit of action. The wide cunts will never ease up for something as trivial as Christmas, so neither do we. It's no difficult to find your fucking flyboys in this city. You've got the Leith ones, the Gorgi ones, the South Side ones, and the Toll Cross ones, although the latter two are fewer now, thanks to the redevelopment of the city centre. Theatre and student types have colonised the South Side, with business sorts doing the same to Toll Cross. Ignore the schemies. These cunts are a law unto themselves. As long as they stay out of the city centre, they can kill each other as much as they like on cheap, bevy, fags, drugs and high cholesterol food. Zero tolerance of crime in the city centre. Total laissez-faire in the schemy hinterlands. That's the way forward for policing in the 21st century. Tony Blair's got the right idea. Get those jakey beggars out of the city centres. Dispossessed, keep away. We don't want you at our party. Gus and I are both early birds. I couldn't kip, so that was me. If only I could sleep. But I get the voices in my head at night, and then I start thinking of that thing inside me, eating my guts out. Too many anxiety attacks at night. I wish it was daylight for twenty-four hours. Gus seldom sleeps as well. Less so now that the promotion is on the line. We both want to be seen in early. I sometimes leave my car in the car park just to give that illusion. You don't need to do fuck all, as long as you're seen to be in early and to leave late. This tactic paid handsome dividends for Toll, who was known as an incompetent officer. Look at that cunt now. But he'll fucking well ken. The first thing Gus said to me on this dull, cold morning was, Merry Christmas, Bruce. You and all, Gus. Christmas Day. Gus wants to start early and finish early for the family dinner. I want to start early and never fucking finish. What's your plans for the day, then, Bruce? he asks. Usual family stuff, Gus. Yourself? Aye, me too. Edith's cooking a huge turkey. She's got Malcolm's wife, Sarah, helping her out. 
They've got the two wee ones. Then Angus and Fiona are coming over. They've just got the one wee lassie. Edith will be making that mulled wine of hers. We'll all be a wee bit tipsy this afternoon. I thought, best just get out for you under everybody's feet until it's all ready. I nod, knowingly. I mind of Edith, Gussie's wife. I've met her a few times. A cheery soul. Her and Mr. Big Cop Gus with her family Christmas. No wonder the old hag's always got a dopey smile on her face. Any who are getting that length of Gussie's fucking well would. See her, mind you. Stinking carrying dressed as mutton. I almost feel sorry for old Gus. It's no good having the biggest wedding spoon in the kitchen if you're only using it to stir the same old fusty pot of broth that has long since gone off the boil. So saith Bruce Robertson. Anyway, we're checking on the morning opening bar doing Leith. One part of the bar is full of polis from the Leith cop shop. Same rules apply in the early opening salons, Christmas fucking day or no. They're mostly uniformed spastics have just knocked off, therefore not worth talking to. But it's fun to dish out the odd, terse, serious nod, which makes them para that there's some internal investigation going on, and some of the more corrupt cunts finish their drinks quickly and move on. We dismisseth them. I recognise a couple of faces from the craft. One cunt, who I never even knew was Polis. We're looking over at the other side of the bar, which is populated by the criminal classes. I recognise one face at the pool table straight away. A Begbie, definitely. I'm not sure which one, Joseph, or Francis, or Sean, or some other filthy pape name. They all look the same. I think it's Francis, the worst one. A nasty piece of work. The bastard looks up, then turns away back to the table. That bastard's so paranoid that if you were to casually ask him in a boozer if he remembers where he was when John Lennon was shot, he'd say that he was playing pull up the volley and he had loads of witnesses. But there's no sign of my pal Oki. Tisk, 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 as they say in the comics. Maybe get a bit of brekker in, Gus, then hit the spastic's gaff. See if he's still stoting the ball. Right, Bruce, Gus smiles. Yep, old Gus is a good old boy. A grandfather who dotes on his grandchildren, but still one of the most feared interrogators in Christendom. That's the great thing about cunts like Gus. It's not just a job to them. He's a churchy guy and genuinely hates crime and law-breaking. His problem, though, is he can demonstrate a bit too much Christian compassion at times. We hit a greasy spoon, a place we know down by the docks. Again, it's always open, Christmas Day or no. Thank fuck for those places. What do you think of Ray Lennox putting his name forward for the job? I ask. Well, I can see young Ray's point. It marks his card for the future. To me, it shows lack of respect for the likes of us, Gus. It's his way of saying he Disney rate us. You reckon? I thought that you'd be more fucked off than anyone. A classic recruitment tactic to narrow the field. If you've a choice of three, it's harder than a choice of two. So it was me, you, or Arnott. Forget English. No way they take a pansy on. Gus nods intently, concern starting to show in his eyes. No Lennox goes and throws his hat into the ring. What do the cunts on the board say? They go, it was bad enough with a choice of three, but now it's four. So the standard tactic is to take the youngest and the oldest and knock them out. Just don't consider them. So as you only have to choose between two. I should be thanking the wee cunt. He's just eliminated the favourite. That's you. I point at him, raising my eyebrows in a baleful expression. Gus looks flabbergasted. What the fuck? It's an old ploy, Gus. As I said, standard personnel practices. Same rules apply. Probably been advised by that silly wee lassie Drummond. That's how she got her stripes. Overhauling the personnel procedures. 
Come on, Gus. You saw how tight her and Lennox were on that daft race course. Billy talk. That's the new Freemasonry for you, Gus. The wine bar Freemasonry. New labour, new Freemasonry. That sort of thing. They're setting it all up to feather their own nests. Gus looks in shock as my spiel starts to sink in. He's just shaking his head slowly, watching thirty-odd years' service bubbling down the plug hole. Five minutes they've been in here, Gus, I remind him, shaking my head in disgust. Five fucking minutes. The eggs, beans, bacon, sausage, tomato, black pudding and tatty scones arrive. Gus, though, seems to have lost his appetite. You really reckon that's his game? The words rip from his throat like an elastoplast torn from a wound. Guaranteed, I nod. Pass the ketchup, Gus. Gus is beeling on our way up the walk. Yes, it's a shame for the poor old cunt, but he still needs to be kept in his place. Keep him on edge, keep him nippy and his confidence low, and the daft old cunt will strop out and shoot himself in the fit long before this promotion interview ever comes to pass. Sure as night follows day. We pull up outside a second-hand furniture shop in the walk. Used to be old Rab Vance's place until Franco Begby and Alex Setherington strolled in one day and retired the cunt. They just told him they were taking over the lease, and that was that. Rab was a semi-jakey anyway. He went fully-fledged shortly after that, but essentially harmless, even if as Clark Kent as fuck. It's obvious that those cunts are selling drugs from there. Just look at the fucking dregs who come in and out. Keys Bohalkro. Nellie McIntosh, Spud Murphy, Johnny Swan, Simon Williamson, Ramey Early, Juice Terry, and every casual and clubby wee cunt under the sun. I don't think those fuckers are in the market for old sweets or used fridges. Begby and Settrington think that they're being subtle if they meet somebody in the pub, on the corner, or the calf over the road. Wrong! Their fetid erses are mine. But we're not going to bust cunts like that on something trivial. We're going to put them away for good. Especially Settrington. What him and his mates did to that wee lassie that time was out of order. Conrad Donaldson was defending him. Well, I got that cunt back. And I'll do the same to old Lexo Settrington. No fucking worries. We get up to Ockies, but he's not at home. This is far from surprising, with the filthy wee stoat probably enjoying a family Christmas. Listen, Gus, I'd like to keep tabs on Lexo. Don't worry so much about Franco, that cunt's so predictable. Think she need a passport to go past Pilrig, but watch Lexo, and keep a lookout for Oki showing up. Will do, Bruce. If that Settington goes, his ma's messages, I'll ken about it. Hardly anybody will be in the office today, and the phones will ring through to me. No way am I going to do a uniform spastics job by going out to prevent a bloodbath at some dysfunctional, schemy family Christmas or other. Toll should have sorted out a rota for serious crime staff. Toll. That cunt leads a charmed life. The screenwriter. It's funny. But as much as I want to see the likes of Gorman, Settington and Begby banged up for life, I'd swap it all to see Toll and Nidri reduced to Jakey status. Gus and I depart, having completed our overtime sheets. Christmas Day counts as double time. Public holidays. At home I have beans on toast for Christmas dinner. There's a message on the answer machine. A wee lassie's voice, tired, strained. Happy Christmas, Dad. I hope Santa was good to the wee shite, because I sure as fuck have not been. I'm sitting in front of the fire with the telly on. It's a James Bond film I've seen about a million times. Connery's the Bond in it. He did the right thing. Get the fuck out of Scotland and stay out. 
come back for ten minutes to tell the daft cunts that they need a parliament, but didn't he stick around long enough to vote in it? The daft cunts lap that up as well. I heat up some beans and toss another couple of pages of Toll's manuscript into the fire. It's so satisfying watching them burn. My attention is caught by the next page, though. Interior. Bill Teal's office. Day. A stark, functional police office. There are family photographs on the desk. Bill Teal is a handsome, refined, middle-aged man who has worn well. Teal is unlike a stereotypical cop. He has an urbane, intellectual air about him. A slim, attractive woman, Annabelle Draper, enters his office carrying a report. Bill. Annabelle. Annabelle. Bill, about last night. Bill. Annabelle. Last night was... I mean, this whole thing is getting out of hand. I never meant for us to... Annabelle. Say it, Bill. Just say it. You said enough last night, but that was before you got what you wanted. Bill. Jeez, Anna, I... Annabelle. You never meant for us to fall in love, Bill. Bill. God damn it, Anna. We have to be mature about this. I'm a married man. I'm old enough to be your father. And we're professional police officers. Last night was... A dull, flat, monotone voice from Bill's intercom cuts in. It belongs to Sergeant Brett Davidson. Brett. Chief, it's Brett. We've got a positive ID on the stiff. I think you ought to come and see this. Bill. OK, Brett. I'll be right out. He switches off the intercom. Bill continued. This is going to have to wait, young lady. Annabelle. Oh, very convenient. I suppose you, Bill. I said that's all, Sergeant Draper. Annabelle turns and exits furiously. What the fucking hell are we getting here? Does this shite mean that Toll's fucking leg drummond? Or is it just wishful thinking on the dirty cunt's part? All of a sudden I've become interested in Mr. Toll's budding screenwriting career. I let the manuscript fall onto the floor, but decide against chucking it in the fire. Brett fucking Davidson. Dull, flat, monotone voice. Cheeky fucker. I pick it up and start to thumb through it for more Brett Davidson references, but then I decide that if I do that... If I give in to my curiosity, then I'm letting Toll win. The purpose of knocking off the manuscript was to fuck Toll's head, not to let him fuck mine. I have to be strong. The weak person would look at the script. I have to be strong. I put the manuscript into the fire, watching with rising panic as its bulk starts to blacken and shrivel from the edges. My hands grip the handles on the rocking chair. At one point, the urge to wrench it out of the fire takes me over, and I quit. Put more fuel in the flame, Bruce. More coal. More black, filthy coal. That was the fuel. Eat! I'm sickened by the experience. No way can I stay in on my own. I drive into the deserted city at a loss as to what to do. Then I get a flash of inspiration and head back out to the southern suburbs. Halfway there, I realise that Clell's no longer in the PMR, so I change course for Morningside and the Royal Edinburgh Hospital and its rather colourful annex, the Arthur Dow Clinic. There's some right fucking comedians in this place. Poor old Clell is one of them. It's funny, but I thought that Clell would be sorted after leaving serious crimes for traffic. But it seems he's been a bag of nerves. As if I care. The only reason I'm here is out of morbid curiosity and because of fuck all else to do. Good of you to gee up your Christmas, Bruce, he says flatly. Much appreciated, like... 
I'm wondering whether I know he's saying it because he's doped up, or whether he understands exactly why I'm here. As if I give a fuck either way. He breaks into a wheezing rant, expecting me to just sit and listen, as if I'm a fucking priest. Serious crimes, seeing all that shite, dealing with it day after day, it's bound to fuck you up. I thought it had made me a bit harder and more cynical. I thought I'd weathered it, come through it all. I clock a sexy looking bird in a nurse's uniform. Phew! Tidy wee bird, Clell, you've got it made in here. I didn't have caught on to the extent of the damage. I mean, two marriages doing the tubes in seven years, drinking like a fish. I should have seen it. A wee darn like the one looking after you. No wonder you want to spend Christmas in here. It was only when I got the dream move to traffic. The third day at the desk, I was scraping my pen into the report sheets. Normality was so hard to handle, Bruce. I reckon she's got a boyfriend. Mind you, tidy fanny like that. Ah, bounty. I was paying the price, Bruce. I was paying the price. Oh, she's a lovely all right. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry, Clow, what, what was that? Oh, aye. Somebody has to put in the best control shift. For all the bollocks. I'd rather do that than be a desk-bound spastic. Same rules. No, Bruce. It wasn't the traffic that was the problem. It was serious crimes. It was having the space to think again. To open up. They all come back, Bruce. All the corpses. All the abused bairns. All the twisted and broken people. And I kept thinking, why? It shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't. Why? He grabs my wrist and glowers at me, but I'm looking right past him at the nurse. She's wearing these stockings, which are probably tights, but I choose to think of them as stockings, and they have the seams which run right up the back of her legs, defining those excellent calves and thighs and... Oh! But I can't say anything to Cleland, who's still whispering, Why? Intently at me. I feel like just telling him why, in two simple words. Natural selection, mate. Natural selection. The twisted, broken people go to the wall, and you are one of them, my friend. Same rules. Clell was always a weak, sensitive, commie poof under that jokey exterior. Lacked the big match temperament. Didn't have the bottle. The English factor is well at play here. Personally, I'd rather wade through a stack of bodies than a stack of forms any day of the week. It dawns on me that I don't know what I'm doing here. I feel like that Rolf Harris fucker, or whoever it is, that goes to visit the bairns in hospital on Christmas Day. Only it's the big bairns who are unfit to do a man's job that I'm visiting. Must go, Clell, I say, forcibly freeing my wrist. Carol's pulled out all the stops with a turkey dinner this time round. Call us a traditionalist if you like. But there's something about that family Christmas dinner. Jackie never came in. She phoned, but he says. They tell us that they fair do the business on Christmas Day in these places. You're in the right hands, Clell, I tell him. I clock that wee nurse again. Especially with her there. I'd get a bed bath there. Uh, never mind a bed bath. I'd get a fucking enema after. And return the fucking compliment. Whoa! Anyhow, see you, Clell. Merry Christmas, keep the pecker up. A wink, departing. Mine would be up anyway, in a place like this. Too right. As I leave the gibbering oaf, I see the nurses start to serve up the Christmas nosh for some other enfeebled lunatics on the ward. They're mostly stupid young cunts, anorexic, junkies, and what have you, inadequates who can't cope with life. They should sling the fucking load of them out into the snow instead of wasting the taxpayers' dough, pampering them with turkey and trimmings served up by rides and seamed stockings. It's a fucking disgrace. We'd all like that. I consider trying to take one of the dishes, but there's too many staff around. Instead, I'll go back home and restoke the fire. Toll's manuscript now reduced to a pile of ashes. I heat up some more beans, which I spice up with curry powder and do some toast. I listen to that daft, smelly, rich old cunt talk her usual shite at three o'clock. 
I'm a masonry, and I swear allegiance to the crown as an institution, but as people, the royal family are the saddest shower of spastics that ever walked the third planet of the solar system. Thankfully for Christmas night, there's a do up in the club at Shrub Hill. No many people in, though, it being Christmas and that. Brother Blades is present, though, and we both get three sheets. He has to hold me up for God save the Queen. He's droning on about Bunty, something about an argument and his mother, uh, but, I, but I can't make out a word of it. I lose him and stagger out into the cold. The chill revives me a bit, and I get a taxi from a guy in the lodge and head back home. I get in, and I snort back some more Charlie, and I'm tanning another bottle of grouse. I stick on Van Halen's Women and Children first, as loud as it will go, and play air guitar, specialising in the Jimmy Page chicken dance. In between tracks, I hear a loud knock on the door. Stronach and his wife are on my doorstep. He's playing tomorrow against Motherwell, I think. Boxing Day fixture. I can't hear anything because the next track started up and it's really loud. I can just see the two mouths opening like fish. They're both in their tracksuits. I raise my hand to silence them, then I go through and turn the music down before coming back out. Merry Christmas, Tom, Julie, I shout. God, Bruce, cool your jets, man. We're trying to get some sleep, Stronach whines his stupid belligerent face scanning for signs of me registering his plight. Don't fucking trespass on my property, Stronach. If you've a complaint to make about the noise level, call the fucking polis. It's Christmas fucking day. I push him in the chest and he jerks backwards off the doorstep. I slam the door shut in his daft face. That cunt's got all fucking year to sleep. I'll work all fucking year. I try to watch some telly through one eye. There's a Channel 4 film on, where you get a brief flash of some wee French slag's fanny arse and tits. I think about that wee nurse again, and I resolve to keep up these visits to my mate Clell on a regular basis. It's impossible to read the teletext to see what's due on, and it's just as hard to read the fucking Radio Times. I'm cunted. Car Stereo Chews Up Michael Bolton Tape Big Ben Chimes Radio Times Meant to be fucking Christmas and the telly is shite or he peets. Stronach's got the right idea with that dish of his. I bitterly resent paying a licence fee to those BBC wankers for absolutely fuck all. I'm feeling rough this morning. Channel hopping rough. My heat nipping. I try to light the fire and get a reasonable blaze going. I'm almost tempted to shelve my plan to get bladesy. The fool seals his own fate, though, by phoning me up, reminding me of the Boxing Day game of ten-pin bowling we'd arranged when we were three sheets the other night at the lodge. Ian McLeod from the craft has given me the keys for the alley, he reminds me. I was wondering what these things jangling in my pocket were. Ten pin bowling on Boxing Day, with Bladesy. How sad a name eights can you get? Decline and despondency in all I see. The house is like a toilet. There's rubbish and smelly old clays piling up everywhere. Even I'm beginning to notice the Judy Dench when I come into the house. Those irresponsible weak suicide cases, those druggy kids, and those fucking jakies have got a better deal than me at this time of the year. Carol wants to get it sorted. If she could only see the inconvenience she's fucking well caused me. I'm shaking, sick, and jumpy. I won't drive today. The car stereo chewed up the Michael Bolton tape. I must get a fucking CD fitted in the car. The thing is, you get fucked as the issue of storage always raises its ugly head. That smart wee cunt blades he's gone and got one, the wee bastard. He's run for me early doors for the ten pin, as planned. I look witheringly at his CD. I considered switching to compact disc, but then I thought, storage of discs, the same rules apply, I tell him. 
Well, I um, actually find that they don't really take up that much more room than cassettes. No go. Storage. I snap at the wee cunt. Then this spastic smiling like the retard he is and pulling out this drawer below the stereo unit that's crammed with fucking discs. They fit this storage unit underneath. Takes up to fifty discs. He smiles. Cock-eyed wee cunt. Right, I say, my voice coming out gruff and duty polis like We go indoors and I've accidentally on purpose got the box on. The little creep's looking around disdainfully at the mess, but he kinds better than to say anything. I fling out a preemptive strike in case he asks about Carol and the bairn. So how do things stand with Bunty? You were trying to tell me the other night, but I was cabbaged. Not so well, Bruce. Bladesy looks mournful. Actually, I'm driving down to my mother's this evening, down in Newmarket, just for a few days, see the family and all of that. Bunty's decided she's staying up here. She's making such a song and dance. I mean, I only see them once in a blue moon, for goodness sake. Mm, right enough, I nod. It does seem a wee bit much. So, old cunty Bunty's going to be on her own for a few days. Well, we can't have that. Yes, it's a real problem. A tough one, Brother Blades. So, this creep that's hassling her, what does he sound like? I ask. Actually, I believe he, it's a sort of a nasal accent. Um, north of England. Uh, Manchester, actually. Blades, he says. Manchester! I say crappily. I'm shite at accents, I'm afraid, except for the Cockney, because he used to live down there. All oh, right, mate, down the old frog and tight. <laughs> Just then, as I had planned, Frank Sidebottom's large head appears on the screen as the announcer of the next dire pop act on. The Radio Times does have its uses. My God, that chap on the box. That's exactly the way Bunty does his voice. That puppet on the television. Eh? I say, turning up the volume. Frank's going on about how this act's usually on very late at night on Jules Holland, and his mum won't let him stay up to see them. The chap in the mask. Right. Somebody's obviously impersonating that television personality. We wait for the credits to come up. Gosh, says Bladesy. His name's Frank. Frank Sidebottom. Right, I say, standing up and moving to the phone. I pretend to dial the operator, then I pretend to ask for a number for Granada Studios. Just getting the PR people on the line. Right, hello. I'm wanting to inquire about Frank Sidebottom, who was on your show. I stand talking for a while to a dead line going, Mmm, yes, and doodling on the notepad. "'occasionally winking at Bladesy's huge, startled eyes. "'Magnified under that glass, they look bigger than Frank's side-bottoms. "'Meet Bladesy's new specs, same as the old specs. "'We slam down the phone and give Brother Clifford Blades the thumbs up. "'Right, we have to take off to the record shop "'and find some of Frank's side-bottoms albums and tapes. "'This is where this cook conducts his fantasy world from.' The lassie on the phone was saying that it's easy to do his voice. You just put your fingers over your nose. Bachester, I go, again sounding crap, deliberately. Blades is away, though. Now, listen, I've got it. Bachester. He's chuffed. I more like it, Brother Blades. Nice one. I start to choke as the hangover from last night is really coming on. Now that my kidneys are so inefficient with pish over the years, it takes later and later to kick in, and you sometimes feel that you're going to escape. But when it comes, it comes harder and longer than ever, and I'm as jittery as fuck as we drive into town. Fuck the ten pin. Rose Street, here we come. Hair of the dog that mauled you. Bladesy's on orange juice as she's driving south later on. I don't try to discourage this, as I want the wee cunt to leave Bunty on her lonesome. Although it's Boxing Day, there's loads open in tune. Some of the shops have decided to start the first day of the January sales today. Bladesy gets a couple of tapes from Virgin and HMV, 
and listens to Frank Sidebottom salutes the magic of Freddie Mercury and Queen and Kylie, and the Timperley EP. We hit a few more Rose Street pubs, with me getting semi-pished, and I give a couple of criminal cunts the eye, particularly that fucker from Ox Gangs, Fingers Billy, who's dressed in his regulation white coat and carrying the clipboard he always uses when he rips off shops. Fingers Billy's usual M.O. is to just stride into a shop and order the backroom staff to load up his white van. Then he gets them to sign, and he's away. Billy, I nod. Mr. Robertson, how's business? the shifty cunt asks. Oh, very good, yourself. Fine, Mr. Robertson. You uh, working the day? Would I tell you if I was? And you? Dressed for it, I see. Mr. Robertson. Fingers Billy smiles and turns up the palms of his hands. Then he smiles and departs. A friend of yours? Blades, he asks. Of sorts, we smile. We get back to mines with the tapes and a carriot and spend the entire afternoon doing the impressions of the recorded material. I deliberately screw up, but Bladesy gets it off pat. The wee cunt really seems to be having genuine fun. I'd say it was sad, but in reality it's way, way beyond that. Yeah, you've got it, Bladesy. I think it must be because you're English. Would that mean that the pervert's English too? Bladesy asks eagerly. We choose to humour the dos we cunt. Sharp, brother Blades, sharp. But we don't know that. He might just be better at impressions than the likes of me. But on the balance of probability, it might be a good starting assumption to at least entertain the possibility. We have to start from the principle of the application of the same rules. Bladesy gives a pathetic, knowing nod and grin. Well, I must set off, south of the border down Newmarket Way. My friend, brother Clifford Blades, departs for the bosom of his spastic family in England, while I give Hector a bell to make sure that we're still on for Monday morning. Then I check with Claire at the fish factory. It's all systems go. Just the thought of Monday's frolic sets up the horn in me. I consider calling in at Bunty's, seeing as she's on a tod, but I decide to leave it till the morn. Let Bladesy get further out of sight and mind first. I just realise that he's left the tapes he bought from the record store on the coffee table. I chuck them out with the rubbish, embarrassed at being party to something which gave that simpleton his petty pleasure, no matter how fleeting. I throw some McCain's oven chips into the tray and heat up some beans, adding curry powder. To my great elation, my friend Brother Blades realises that he's left the tapes too. I thought that this would take a while to happen, but no, the stupid little twat is cutting his own throat for me. He phones up later that night, and I don't lift the receiver, letting him babble into the answer machine. Fate can be a cruel bastard, especially to the likes of Bladesy. Hello, is that Bruce Robertson? This is Frank here. I should be so looky, 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 looky. I should be so looky in love. <laughs> I'm on my way to me mum's, but I left me bloody tapes. Look after them for me, will ya? And he does it all in a beautiful, impeccable Frank Sidebottom voice. I rub my hands together and press the save button on the answer phone. Gotcha. To lodge a complaint. Sunday. For some, a depressing day. For me, the happiest day of the week. It means big time OT. I can't find my slippers. I'll go through to the front room, and my heart skips a beat. Her picture's gone from the sideboard. Of course, the top drawer. I open the top drawer and put it back. It was Christmas, and I never got her anything. That was... I look at the picture for a while, then push it back into the drawer and slam it shut. 
that poor wee lassie. What a fucking legacy. I'm better away from it. I'm better away from them all. It's a dormant virus, and it's becoming more manifest. But it was Christmas, and I never got her anything. It was cause of Carol that I... She usually gets her. She would have, surely, she would have bought her something from the both of us. Surely. Maybe, though, that's the way her mind's working, trying to turn us, me, against the bairn. She's living in a fool's paradise. Same rules. I do not give a mat and look goss about her. Not an Aylesbury duck. I pull on my stinking old clothes and defrost the Volvo. Getting the motor charged up and storming round the city bypass to meet Loaf's Bat Out of Hell album restores some cheer. Jim Steinman, probably the greatest rock composer of all time. That cunt is operatic. When I get to HQ, I find that most of the crew are in. They've had their fill of that Christmas shite. For all the bullshit talk of the family, close friends and the festivities, I've always found that most people can't wait to call a halt to all that garbage and get back to the two slice. I find that Polis can't function for very long in the company of non-Polis. "'Who's in the screws today?' I ask Peter Inglis, who's got his paper open. "'Nicky from Somerset. Good tits like. Full paps.' Dirty cow's been tweaking her nipples for the forty. Like fighter pilot's thumbs, he says, in the fake coarse way of the closet homosexual in a desperate fear of being outed. Mr. Inglis has recently dropped his application for the promotion. On the advice of a certain Mr. Toll, no doubt. He holds the page up for my inspection thinks that keeping a low profile and talking dirty about buds will set up a smoke screen. Such an obvious attempt to be one of the boys just grates and only serves to isolate him further. A pump and a pistone, I nod approvingly. You fool nobody, Mr. Inglis. I open my file wallet and pull out my own screws for closer study. No bad. Worth forty wanks later on. I'm as itchy as fuck in the genital region. I go downstairs to the bog and wipe the sweat from my arse crack. Then I line my buttocks and thighs with toilet paper, putting my wise over them. That should absorb the moisture generated. I put the flannels I washed back on and catch a whiff of detergent from them. They seem discoloured as well. I'm not in the mood for some sexual gratification, not even a wank. So I head back up the stairs and join the rest of them doing fantasy fit the league table. Not the it, 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 it. That's the way. Can feel how it was for you. When he came into the house, covered in black coal, you picking nervously at the food he'd put on your table with his sweat and labour, trying not to meet his eye. Then he'd see that you were not eating. Eat! He'd roar. Your mother would look away as Ian Robinson pulled you up to the fireplace and pointed at the coal in the bucket. I've been fucking digging this shit all fucking day for you. Eat! But you still couldn't eat the food. Then he'd pick up a lump of coal and make you eat it. Eat, he'd say. This one is baffling me thoroughly. I'm making no fucking headway at all today. I'm totally fucking stumped. And the whole sordid business remains as unsolved as ever. Yes, there are clues, but it's working out what they mean. Across. One. Urban dweller. Eight letters. Five across. Stinging insect. Four letters. Eight across. Gave money. Four letters. Nine across, joined using a hot iron, eight letters. Ten across, external, seven letters. Twelve, bumptious, five letters. 
13 across, holy place, 6 letters. 15 across, handgun, 6 letters. 17 across, trainee, 5 letters. 18 across, painkiller, 7 letters. 22 across, friendly, 8 letters. 23 across, dingy, 4 letters. 24 across, lodge, 4 letters. 25 across, after today, 8 letters. Down, 1. Outer garment, 7 letters. 2 down, narrow part, 5 letters. 3 down, pondered, 5 letters. 4 down, African river, 4 letters. 6 down, fruit, 7 letters. 7 down, short form of Patrick, 5 letters. 11 down, Iot, 5 letters. 12 down, dry, brittle, 5 letters. 14 down, wine or cake, 7 letters. 16 down, archer's weapon, 7 letters. 17 down, category, 5 letters. 19 down, water vapour, 5 letters. 20 down, scarcer, 5 letters. 21 down, aid in crime, 4 letters. Gus, I shout. Urban dweller, 8 letters. And then he say citizen, because that's only 7. Oh, that's what I would have said. Citizen. Here, what did you get for that nine across? Soldered. Join using a hot iron, I tell him. There's a fucking good one here for ye. Twelve across. Bumptious. Toll. Pity it's five letters, but... Gus's laugh ricochets around the open plan like a workies drill in a built-up area. I turn to the football pages. Boxing Day Disaster is the headline. An anonymous, lacklustre performance by Tom Stronach, normally so full of endeavour in the visitor's engine room, led to his substitution in the second half. Dougie Gilman looks over my shoulder. I shake the paper at him. Did you go, Dougie? A bloody nightmare. That Stronach is a fucking imposter, Gilman scoffs. I ken why he was so crap yesterday, I tell him knowingly. The cunt was up to the wee small hours on Christmas Day, off his fucking tits, no just on bevy either by the look of things. Aye, they're all at that fucking cocaine, they fit my players. Gilman shakes his head. The thing is, they're short change in the fans, Dougie. We pay the cunt's wages. Gilman nods in bitter agreement as Lennox comes in. He has a copy of the screws as well. He sees Gus at the crossword. Seven dun, he says. Short for Patrick. That's easy. Dirty fucking thick Fenian terrorist bog wog cunt. Lennox is now sporting a huge Zapata-style moustache. It seems to grow along with his Charlie intake. I keep thinking that I can see bits of coke stuck in it. No bad, Ray. More than five letters in that, though, eh? I smile. What made Ray Lennox want to be all palsy-wowsy and one of the boys all of a sudden? What about twenty-four across? Lodge. Gus asks, with an edge in his voice, turning away from Lennox. File, Ray says. Eh? Gus snaps, challengingly. To file a complaint, to lodge a complaint, says Lennox, all superior-like. I bet the first thing you thought of was Masonic or Orange, he laughs. And I bet it was the last bloody thing you thought of. Gus almost takes his head off. Eh? Ray asks, bemused almost rocking back on his heels. I'm shaking with laughter behind my paper. Growl, growl. Go for him, old boy. Go on and teach that smart young pup a thing or two. Go on, old boy. You can do it. Ruff, ruff. Then you think your behaviour's no going noticed in the craft, Gus says, pointing the finger. 
What are you on about, Gus? Lennox turns to me and then Peter. What is this? We don't respond. So he looks back at Gus. Just what I said. No why, son. Gus hisses, tapping his muppet head. No wise at all. Then he turns away and leaves. Ings follows him like he was his boyfriend. Yes, buffy boys are the biggest size queens. What the fuck was that about? Ray asks. Listen, Ray, it's what I've been telling you about, I whisper confidentially, as I see Gilman going into the photocopying room. The young stag syndrome. Ray looks flushed. He doesn't he ken anything about the Charlie, does he? He whispers eagerly. I doubt it, I smile. I'm looking at my stars while, yes, I can almost hear it, the slow, delicious sound of that wanker, Ray Lennox, stewing in his own fucking juices. My sign is Taurus, the bull. Fucking appropriate, because that's all I get around here, usually from that sad, spastic toll. Nope, wrong! He is not a sad spastic. He ain't that fucking interesting. Taurus, April 21st to May 21st. The combined influence of Mars and Pluto, two rather volatile planets, together with your ruler, Venus, indicates a time of smouldering passion. But seriously, don't get too carried away, as it could all end in tears. As for someone who is coming on strong today... You need to question their motives. The news of the screws disgusts me after a while. It's all shagging drugs and crime triangles featuring fat schemies. I'll have to get back to buying the mail on Sunday. I used to get it for the politics, but I packed it in after Princess Diana's funeral. Every person that was interviewed outside the palace all seemed to be sad, name eight spastics, sort of bladesy types. Then I read that the majority of people who attended were male readers. That terrified me into dropping the paper. I decide to go and see Bunty. Ray, I'm going walkabout. If that docile mutation toll is looking for me, tell him that I'm away to the forum. Will do, Bruce. When will you be back? A couple of hours or so. How? You want us to bring you back something for Crawford's? I, I suppose a Cornish pasty with chips, Ray says, hesitantly, as if he's thinking of something more tasty. Peter comes back in. Peter, scran. It'll be sun-dried tomatoes, olives and feta cheese for that big Nancy boy. You gone past Bratisani's? Could do. A white pudding supper, then, he says. Probably sees the white pudding as a guy's cock. I'll fucking well bet you the cunt wants one, all right. Well, if you're going by Bratisani's, I'll take a fish supper, Ray decides. Roger, listen, have you looked in the locker? Can you taste it, Bruce? Can you taste the filth, the duck, the oily blackness of that fossil fuel in your mouth as you choke and gag and spit it out? Do you still hear his voice in your head urging you to eat? Eat, eat, eat! Your mother's cries. Do you hear them? You should be, Bruce. Because I know that it's never ever left you alone. Now you can eat what you want to eat. For me, for you, for all the others. Now you can consume to your heart's content or your soul's destruction, whichever comes first. So eat. A Society of Secrets Bladesy's hedge is cut more precisely than any of the others in the street. He's neat. That's what he is, his brother Blades. Probably from a posh family, but thick, and thus only suited to prole white-collar work. Then again, could have come from an upwardly mobile, but not too upwardly mobile, working-class home, where neatness and obedience is stressed as a virtue. And it is. Serve them all my days. This means that the same rules apply. I drop in accidentally on purpose, seeing as I'm in the neighbourhood and all that shite. It's a cheerless morning. There's a pinch in the air, but it doesn't look like snow. 
My lips are chapping a bit, but I've applied the greasy stick. Bunty seems pleased to see me. She bades me enter, and she's got the kettle on. She's wearing a thick Angora sweater, but these tits won't be beaten. They still cry out for attention underneath it. She looks sour when I start to tell her what a great guy I think Bladesy is. Yeah, sure, she says with contempt in her voice. This is too much of a woman for you, Brother Blades. I'm sorry, but yes, the same rules do apply. She puts a pot of tea on a green plastic tray with two cups and a jug of milk and bowl of sugar. It's been a long time since I had tea served this way outside of the office. Every time I go to make a pot at home, there's always used tea bags lying in it and in the sink, and it just got too much hassle cleaning it all up. Besides, I never mind to get milk, though there's generally beer in the fridge. I take a sip and raise my eyebrows. He's weak, that's what he is. No backbone. She spits a bitter elaboration. Well, Brother Blades is in Shit Street, all right. But I have to support the brother here, because to slag him off would show lack of character in her eyes, although I must do it as though I'm being loyal to him rather than sincere, as that would show lack of judgment. Cliff's one of the best in my book, I tell her, forcing a look which I hope is pained and embarrassed. He's your friend, and you're faithful to him, and that's good, she says, swallowing the bait. I sometimes wish I had a friend who was as loyal to me. Is that this Masonic Brotherhood I hear so much about? She drops her voice a little and stares flirtatiously. Well, I hope you don't hear too much about it. I smile back. Oh, not a great deal of interest. It sounds intriguing, though, a secret society. Uh, not a secret society, a society of secrets. I wave my finger gently at her. Oh, I see. And there's a difference, is there? Well, I don't really know. But I do know one thing about the craft. It's basically now a glorified drinking club for silly wee laddies, if the truth be told. You don't seem like the silly wee laddie type. She smiles obsequiously. I'm getting the come on here, big time. It's really just something that you get into on the force. It's a way of meeting people who aren't on the force. Well, not necessarily on the force. You need that break from other policemen sometimes. We tend to be quite an incestuous mob. The shifts, you know. And the job can get quite demanding. Yes, I imagine you see some pretty distressing things. Yes, but you deal with it. It's your lot, and you have to show them all that you're stronger than they are, and you show that by not letting it get you down. Like you. You're a very brave lady. You're facing down this creep, showing him that you're better than him. Sometimes I don't feel so strong. I just wish that Cliff could be of more help. He's not exactly a tower of strength, she says, giving a little bubble, breaking down slowly. For all her tough talk, this hoor can he stand the heat, the Bruce Robertson heat. I'm over in one elongated stride, and I've got her hands in mine. You deserve somebody who could really look after you, a woman like you. Thank you for being so kind. It's hard not to feel... Isolated. Craig's at a difficult age. I just don't seem to have much of a life, I'm afraid. God, I'm feeling sorry for myself, and I hate that. I look deep into her eyes. You'll come shining through. You've got what it takes. You really think so? She says, balefully. I love doubt in a woman. It's nearly as sexy as determination. Listen, I'm going to say something here, something I shouldn't say. No, I'm not a teller, shaking my head slowly. What? She says, sitting bolt upright. No, it, it'll only cause bad feeling and 
complicate matters. Neither of us need that at the moment. Please, say what you have to. I want you to. Please. Her fingers ravel round mine tighten. Please, police me. I inhale sharply, then let it out with a long, slow pant. Right, I will. It's breaking me up what this freak's doing to you, because I've got strong feelings for you. There. I said it. I'm sorry. I shrug. I pull our hands apart. Then I stand up and raise my palms in a surrender gesture. I turn away and let a long silence hang. I go to the window and pull back the net curtains. There's a white Nissan Micra on a double fucking yellow line. M. Reg. Where are the traffic spasmos? Bruce. It's okay. I hear a thin voice from behind me. I go and sit on the couch. I put my head in my hands and let my elbows rest on my knees. I put on a low, pained voice and say, There's nothing I can do or say. I've messed things up. No. I hear her getting up and coming towards me. I feel her light touch on my neck. She's massaging me, her thumbs kneading at the red liver-spotted back of my neck, and she's crying in heavy, halting sobs. I don't know what to say. She bleats. I look up at her and let a tremble come into my voice. Just tell me that you don't feel anything for me. Just call me a creep. No better than the scumbag who phones you up. No, no. Because that's what I am, a dirty, filthy, sick creep, talking like that to the wife of a friend when she's emotionally distressed, when she doesn't know her own mind. No, 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 no. I do know my own mind, Bruce. I want to be with you. I pull her onto my knee. Fucking hell, there's some way in this whore. And move her red, swollen face to me. Holding it a few inches from mine, I slide at her tears with the edge of my finger, like the windscreen wipers on the Volvo. I'm going to brush these tears away, hen. Believe you me, I'm going to brush them away. Same rules apply, I whisper softly. At that point I hear a crackling from inside my pocket. I give her a disappointed look. Foxtrot calling Z, Victor BR. Come in, BR. Over. Roger, Foxtrot. Over. I groan wearily. Specify location. Over. Twelve, Carrick Glen Gardens, Gustorfin. Over. Please proceed to HQ. Over. Roger, Foxtrot. I'm on my way. Over and out. And I was. After I fucked Bunty in the bedroom. I took my time, though. You always do with new Fanny. What I usually do with a new bird is hole up with them for a weekend and spoil them with loads of foreplay, champagne, takeaways and undivided attention to all the preposterous shite they drivel. That usually does the trick for getting into them on a casual basis for months. The best thing to do is to give a new bird the very best possible time. And then she knows you have the capacity to do that again, and she's always looking inwards, blaming herself for not being able to reactivate that passion in you. The best lovers can, that you only need to be a good lover once with one bird. Get it right the first time, and then you can basically do what you like. Eventually, they tipple that you're just a selfish cunt, usually after a few years of fruitless self-analysis. But by that time... You've generally had your fill and are firing into somebody else. Bunty is a powerful woman. But Bladesy obviously hasn't been doing his homework satisfactorily. I thought she'd take some satisfying, but the dirty cow went off like an incendiary device. I suppose after Bladesy, any performance would be more than suitable. As I get dressed after, I'm conscious of the smell coming from my flannels. I hope Bunty didn't notice. I should have fucking well minded to put on the fresh ones I got from C&A's. Fucking stupid bastard. 
What's the point of getting them if you don't wear them? Fortunately, she doesn't appear to notice, and we say our lovers' goodbyes, and I head off. When I got back to the station, it was only Gus wanting to know about the sweep for the Fitba and the Fantasy Fitba League. Shearer's goals last week at Tottenham put me in a nice position, just behind Peter Inglis in some uniform spastic. I'm ready to pounce. Behind Peter Inglis. Mind you, you dinna want that cunt behind you. I'm thinking that I could handle another shot at that bunty, and I call her to arrange to come round to mines tomorrow, which I instantly regret. A real sign of weakness, that was. The problem with whores is not so much the getting into their kecks, but the keeping them at arm's length afterwards. Life can become complicated, which is fine. Only simpletons live simple lives. Trouble is, mines is complicated enough right now. When I finish, I realise I'm still rank, and I need some wine for the two. I miss the other. I miss that soul so much. How can you live like this, Bruce? Like the way you made us live, alone in this world. We need to be together, Bruce, together in our own societies and communities. How can you do this? A Sportsman's Dinner Karen Fulton is looking sexy today. She's put on a bit of weight, which doesn't suit most women, but she carries it well. Festive overindulgence, perhaps, or maybe the classic sex substitute. That's the best dieting plan. Fuck em regularly. No time for munching on fucking biscuits then. Too much munching on carpets with Drummond, that's the problem there. Same rules apply. Looking drop-dead gorgeous, Karen, I tell her. She smiles at me, but there's a touch of frosty lesbo coating which I expect is Drummond's doing. All it takes is the probing tongue of one space dyke for the impressionable to stray from the path of righteousness. But all it takes is some prime scotch beef to get them back on the fast track, I kid you not. She's long overdue a length. Anyway, Bulldyke Drummond comes in with Inglis and Gus Bain. She seems to have warmed to Inglis since he's been all but proven to be a sad bufty boy. If being befriended by a fucking fag hag Disney established the bastard as a rubber wrist, goodness knows what will. Inglis knows this and obviously hates her following him around. I've summoned the team in early doors today, and I can tell that some of them are only too chuffed. As if I care. I've a very busy day. I'm seeing Bunty later. But first, I've got an urgent appointment at Hector the Farmer's out at Pennycook, the old stomping ground, in a couple of hours' time. We need all the light we can get. I give a brief lack-of-progress report on the worry case. Then I open up the discussion. OK, folks, any news from your ends? Gus, I ask. I've been keeping tabs on Settington and Gorman. They're still hanging around that bloody second-hand furniture shop all the time, Gus tells us. The old boy's looking bitter. Lost a bit of pep, that in. Could do with some fucking Charlie in him. Chop yourself out a liney posh, ya you muppet-faced old cunt. Aye. Ray Lennox and some of the boys in DS are convinced that Settington and Francis Begbie are dealing hard drugs from there. I'm chuffed at Gussie's expression of scorn at my mention of Ray Lennox's name. Just keep those beady eyes open, Gus. Peter? But this mystery woman's still no checking out. I've shown pictures to just about everybody from Jammy Joe's, all the stewards and most of the party crowd, but it's still no checking out. You are checking out as a sick, perverted ass buggerer of other men. We still have this mystery woman in our lives. How exciting. I turn to Drummond. Mandy, my sweet, what news from our friends in the ethnic community? 
I don't think it's appropriate for you to refer to female officers in that way, she challenges. Absolutely right, I sing. Apologies for any offence caused, my darling. Force of habit. Bad habit, yes, but habit nonetheless. That's why I rely on people like your good self, who are so much more aware of those issues than I am, to keep me informed of my transgressions in this important area. I'm not your darling either, she says. Karen Fulton nods supportively. Drummond stares at me for a second. Then she says, Look, Bruce, you may think that I'm being pedantic, but it's hard enough getting all the abuse under the sun out there from the public without being patronised and sneered at by your own colleagues. All I want is equal treatment, that's all. Do fucking equal work then, you wee cunt, and stop poncing around with wog groups. Point taken. Now, what news from the forum? She bleats on for ages about the hopes and fears for wogs and loathing around this case. After we finish, Peter Inglis sidles up to me. Needs a good scene to that in, he says bitterly, trying in vain to establish heterosexual credibility. Aye, Inglis, right ye are. And what are you going to do? Strap a fucking dildo on her and shag her up the ass. Too right, I tell him. She wants equal rights. Get her to do equal work. I'd like to see her get into Leith and haul in Lexo Settington or Ghosty Gorman or Franco Begby. All have to do it. You or me, Peter. She'll be shuffling papers or counselling some daft slag whose scumbaggy a fellies tanned her jaw. It's expedient to leave English believing I'm his only pal on the force. He stands, fomenting his rage, as he looks across at Drummond, who is given it loads with Fulton. Inglis is basically homosexual. I'm not saying that he's the sort of guy who would feel your bum in the lavvy or anything like that, but his psychology is homosexual. It makes sense to expose him. The same rules apply. Who's for Crawford's? Gus asks. Sorry, Gus, I'll have to gnash, I announce, slinging on my overcoat. It gives off a stale, rancid smell, but at least I minded to change into the new CNA slacks. The material seems to irritate the rash on my inner thighs, though. I've got a wee lead with a mate of Aukies. Might be something, might be nothing. Have to check it out, but see you later. I hurry upstairs to the audio-visual section to pick up the tripod and video camera that Pete Loburn, the technician, has let me take out for a few days. A good boy in the craft. I hurry downstairs and load the gear onto the back seat of the Volvo. I have to pick up Claire at the fish factory before heading out to Pennycook for the shoot. Then I have to bomb him and do some tidying up, as I'm fucking bunty over there this afternoon. I'm also, in a sense, fucking bladesy. Fucking the poor wee bastard for good. It's all go. Thankfully, the roads are still not very busy. I tear down the walk in the motor and park indiscreetly outside the fish factory. Normally, I'd keep the Volvo a few streets away, but the clock is ticking, Maisie's there with Claire, and fortunately, she's all ready. A cup of tea or something stronger, Bruce Darlin, Maisie asks. I'd love to, Maisie, but I can't. Time is of the essence. Claire, my sweet, are you ready? Aye, she says. She's got a knee-length fur coat on, and I hope she's wearing what I specified underneath it. It looks like it, as she's on heels. Gee's a flash, then, I instruct. She opens her coat, exposing the black bra, split crotch, panties, stockings, and sussies. Oh! Magic. Claire goes to put a tracksuit top, bottom and trainers on, but I tell her to take them with her and come as she is. The car's warm, the engine's running, I urge. Look after her now, Bruce, Maisie half warns as we depart. She's a good yin. She fucking well, isn't he, half? I could gee the hoor one now. You know me, Maisie, I smile. Call me old-fashioned, but I believe that ladies should be treated with the utmost respect. It doesn't take that long to hit the bypass. 
Deep Purple's Highway Star, the original version of Machine Head is blaring at the stereo. I've got the wheels, the hot chick. Now, all I need is a liney Bosch. It's as well that the road isn't too busy, as I can hardly keep my eyes on it, with her sitting next to me and her coat sliding over those thighs, exposing the sussies. At one stage, I thought, fuck it. I'm going to have to pull onto a slip road in a country lane and blow some more O.T. dosh. Funny. What stops me is having to listen to her whinging. She started to have second thoughts about the project. I'm no so sure about this, she says, lighting a cigarette. Come on, Claire, you're getting good dosh for this. Besides, look on it as an education, a new experience beneficial to your career development, I reason. I'm sounding like Toll talking to a juggy or draw recruit of a uniform spastic before sending him down to dry law. It's a good dog, a sheep dog, a collie for fuck's sakes. They're gentle, obedient dogs known for it. And I guarantee that the video is only going to be for private use. Hector and myself. Two grand, Claire, it's good dosh. Aye, all right. It's just as well that Hector's wedged up. Farmers always complain about their lot, but you never see a skint one. They tend to be the one profession that gets on well with the polis. They have the property, and we're in the property protection business, so they have a tendency to be more instinctively well disposed towards us than most. But like us, they tend to have a high depression and suicide rate. It's that seasonally adjusted depression with them. Look at that Ted Malt guy that did the Everest double glazing. We pull off the road and up the gravel track towards the farmhouse. Hector has heard the Volvo tearing up and comes out to greet us in his usual hale and hearty manner. He's a real Fermin Vermin archetype, all right. Stocky, ruddy white hair and beard, tweed jacket, cords and boots. Hello, Bruce. Hector. His eyes open like saucers. And what am I to call this lovely young lady? Claire, she says. His face ignites further. It's an absolute pleasure and an honour, my darling, he says, taking her arm in his and leading her to the Range Rover. I follow with the camera and tripod. It's muddy, very fucking muddy, and I'm trying to watch those new fawn flannels. Is this your farm? Claire asks Hector. All mine, my darling, all mine. Hector's house. From the road into town back there, he stops and sweeps his free arm around to the ugly, desolate brown mounds which tower over us, right up to the base of them there hills. Claire gives an impressed, evaluating smile. Ah, that lassie will go all the way to the top in her profession. She has that premium-range whore's instinctive understanding of value. Hector gives a whistle, and from out of nowhere a collie shoots towards us like a missile. Just as you think it's going to collide into us, it slows down and circles us a few times, yelping with excitement. Well, this is Angus, Hector says proudly petting the panting, enthusiastic beast. We get into the Range Rover. It's freezing, Claire says, lighting another fag. Angus here will warm me up, I say, getting into the back after her, letting the dog sit in the front passenger seat. Claire looks dubiously at her leading man. Silver medal at the Royal Highland Show in 95, eh, boy? Hector says fondly to the dog. "'starting up the car. "'The mutt leans over "'and starts licking my hand "'with its sandpaper tongue. "'He likes you, Bruce,' "'Hector observes, "'starting up the motor. "'The track follows a serpentine route "'over frozen ground, "'cutting through a range of ice-encrusted trees "'into a clearing "'and down the hill towards the barn. "'As it dips, "'the path deteriorates "'into a patch of muddy swamp which has failed to freeze over. I turn to Claire. You should be used to this sort of gig, Claire, coming for Aberdeen. 
You'd have to be good at your trade to compete with all the sheep up there. You'd have to be good. Get it? Nobody does. And the fucking Range Rover grinds to a halt, sticking in the mud. I look at my watch as the car snarls ineffectively, the wheels spinning, failing to grip. Hector turns round in the seat. Sorry, Bruce, but we need a bit of your muscle. I've got to do this, he protests, shaking the wheel in response to my cold stare. I get out of the vehicle, my feet sinking into the mud which covers my brogues. The bottom of my new slacks are fucking... That useless old cunt Hector. I push in exasperation as I look at my watch and the motor springs free, sending a shower of mud onto my shins. When I get back in, Hector and Claire are grinning at me. Sorry, Bruce, but you're not exactly dressed for the firm. <laughs> Mind and no get a mess in Claire now. I seethe silently as we get to the barn. It's a huge, ugly, cold place, but it's pretty isolated. I quickly set up the camera, although not fast enough for Claire. It's freezing, Bruce. Hurry up. The light's still good, but it is cold. The frosted wind whistles around the barn with a clinical, cutting, ozone smell of Arctic origins. Right, Claire, I direct. Off with the coat and out of their panties. If you could just lean over that bar and spread those legs. How's it looking, Bruce? Hector says through pursed lips. Pit that fag out, Claire. A wee bit to the left, that's it. Hector, it's all yours. Hector pulls the dug out to Claire and lets him have a good sniff of her. Then he starts pulling on the dog's cock. At the same time, he's massaging his own through his trousers while staring at Claire. The dug's tongue is hanging out, and his pink cock shoots out like a plastic attachment on a toy. That Darth Vader's lance in Toys R Us. Hector starts the ghetto blaster, which plays the Archer's theme tune. That was his idea. He points the yelp and dug it clear, restraining it by the collar. Then he lets it go. The animal ignores her completely springing at me and attaching itself to my leg, thrusting ferociously. Get that fucking thing off me, I shout, trying to push it away, but the bastard's nostrils flare and a low growl comes from its throat. I stagger backwards, knocking over the tripod and camera. Hector grabs the dug and pulls him off me, by which time my CNA's trousers are covered in canine spunk. Ha! No me! I shout at the stupid panting beast. We set it up again for another try. Once more, this daft fucking thing flies at me and attaches itself to me. Jesus fuck almighty! That thin pink cock rips and sputs against my flannels. Fucking new trousers! Sorry, Bruce. Hector shrugs and grabs the yelping demented beast by the collar. Claire starts laughing, a loud horsey hee-haw. Dugs are fucking queer, I cuss, pointing at the fucker. Hector's got the fucking audacity to look affronted. That dog sired mere championship pups than you've had hot dinner, son, he grumbles. He just likes you. I like you, Hector, but I don't fucking well want to shag you. The dog's are fucking poof, and that's all there is to it. Hector goes to console the animal, as if its feelings are hurt. He's just new to this, that's all. It's no good him liking me. He's meant to like her. I point at Claire, who's back in her fur coat. There must be something we can do. Pit something on her, like dog food or that. No fucking way, Claire snarls. I'm not getting fucking eaten alive by that thing. It was just a thought, I say. I tried to give my flannels a wipe with my hanky, but I'm messing them up more with the snot and the charley. This is a fucking mess of a day. We try the same thing one more time, and again the dug goes for me. My new fucking trousers are ruined. It's totally useless, a complete waste of time. Darkness is creeping in, and we've lost our chance. 
I accidentally on purpose stand on the collie's tail, and the cunt lets out a loud yelp, followed by a series of accusatory gasping whines. Mind the dog! Are you okay, boy? Hector coos. Claire looks disapprovingly at me. She's getting rode, and no mistake. I've just about time for a quick one in the back of the Volvo. I proposition her, but she's informing me that she's staying on at Hector's to earn some more cash from her new sugar daddy. They link arms and smile smugly at each other. Cunts. I head back to mine in the Volvo, stopping at Crawford's for some takeaway food. I wanted those new strides for Bunty coming. Now I have to stick the cunts on the laundry mountain and dig out some soiled, but not quite so soiled ones from the stinking pile. The place is a real shithouse. The Dame Judy in here is worse than back at Hector's barn. I pile everything I can into bin liners, attack the surfaces with a damp cloth followed by some polish, and drag the hoover across the floor. I'm sweating when the doorbell goes. I switch off the hoover and breathe deeply. Bunty comes in, and I'm leading her straight up to the bedroom, where I've changed the sheet and the duvet cover, and I get her on top of it. She's well on, her twat dripping like Niagara Falls, and as wide as the city bypass. I've banged on my tape deck, and Bachman turned their overdrives. You ain't seen nothing yet, it's blaring out. There are noises coming from next door, shagging noises. Strawach is fucking someone, probably that wee tart who works behind the bar at the hotel. I think that was her mini parked outside. Of course, Julie's away in some fucking daft course, he did mention it. I waste no time getting into Bunty. She's game for it as well, a strong, silent type. So Stronach's headboard's banging off the wall, and so is ours. And there's quite a competition going on. We'll show that, cunt. Thankfully, Bunty's taken a while to get there. But after a bit, it starts to become too long, and I can't hear Stronach next door. It's taken her ages, and in truth, it gets a drag, uncomfortable even. But I stick it out even though I'm gritting my teeth at the end. When she does come, I think we're going to go crashing through the wall into Tom Stronach's bedroom. Ha! <laughs> that would show the cunt all right. Same rules. As we settle into a post-coital snooze, I'm satisfied to note the silence coming from Stronach's next door. No fucking staying power, either on the field or in the scratcher. When we get up, I prepare a light lunch with the stuff I'd got from Crawford's on the way home, then absent-mindedly check the messages, playing the one Bladesy had stupidly left. I casually observe as Bunty's blood runs cold with Bladesy going into his spiel just after my daughter wishes me a happy Christmas. Then I witness her going off again. It's like a second orgasm, but this time... The whore freaks on outrage rather than sex. It's him on your machine, she raves. Bunty, that's Cliff, I tell her. He's just mucking about. But it's him. It's exactly like him. Anybody can do that. Uh, Manchester, uh, I say badly. It's him, it's him. I'm calling the police. That sad little bastard. I should have known. Living with a pervert. The things he wanted to do. I should have known. I've been such a fool. She bursts into tears. Her mascara running. I'm going to make him suffer. That worked again. Bunty, we don't want to be jumping to conclusions. There may be a perfectly good reason as to why Cliff... No, don't defend him. She shrieks. I'm not defending her. I'm just saying that we cool our jets, I snap. If Cliff is guilty of humiliating the both of us, then believe me, no power, no fucking power on earth will stop me from tearing him apart with my bare hands. Believe that, I say, staring at her with resolve and almost feeling sorry for Bladesy as the hatred glazes over in her eyes. But we need to be sure... I'm sure. I'm fucking well sure. Oh, Bruce, she moans softly, 
her face twisted and traumatized. She focuses on me suddenly. What did he mean about tapes? He said something about tapes. What was it? I make a show of swallowing some air. Look, Bunty, it's... Oh, God, this is, this is so difficult. Tell me! Cliff was... Cliff and a few of the lads at the lodge, they... She's looking manically at me. They used to get videotapes from some guy at the lodge, a, a farmer guy. It's not really my scene. I obviously knew what they were, but I just thought, well, that's up to them. Cliff wanted to watch them here. He, he didn't want you to know anything about them. He, he obviously thought you'd object. What sort of tapes? I go to the cupboard behind the telly and pull out a couple of Hector's choicest. They're pornographic. I've never looked at them myself, but I can imagine what's in them. I knew it. I want to see them. Put one in. Bunty, I don't think it would be wise. Oh, yes, I want to know everything. I want to know all about him, the real him, she sobs. I acted reluctant, but Bunty was insistent. We watch a bit of Vibrator Massacre, and she runs to the toilet, puking, just as I was getting into it. She's seen enough. I calm her down a little and eventually call her a taxi home. I was certain she'd phone the police and make a formal complaint against Bladesy. I kept half-heartedly trying to talk her out of it, gently urging her to call Cliff at his mum's, give him a chance to put his side of things and all the insincere bullshit under the sun, but I knew that her mind was made up. I get a bell from Gus at the lodge after tea, telling me that they're planning to haul Bladesy in for questioning. Good news travels fast. Later on, Bunty leaves a message telling me that she's gone to her mother's with Craig. She didn't want to be there when he got back from Newmarket. This sets me up in fine fettle for the do tonight, with the earlier debacle with that stupid Doug now last Tuesday's daily record. I've given Ray Lennox my spare ticket, and after meeting for a pint in the antiquary, we head to the Sheraton for Stronach's sportsman's dinner. I'm a wee bit concerned, as I haven't spoken to Stronach since her little neighbourly tiff over noise levels on Christmas Day. I'll be three sheets, but I take the motor. I'll pick it up later if I'm too wasted. I switch on the car radio. It's that Celine Dion bird singing that horrible song. The one she was just made to sing. Lennox is blabbing on about some departmental shite, and Dion goes off, only to be replaced by the Eurythmics. Lennox is going on about how Gus has got it in for him. I've got Annie Lennox on the radio, whinging in one ear, and Fanny Lennox next to me doing the same in the other ear. To my surprise, Stronach greets me heartily. It seems as if he wants to let bygones be bygones, or... Perhaps it's because he senses my potential to wreck his big night, if fucked with. I brazenly install myself and Lennox at his table, which he's not too pleased about, as he's in the company of the former England forward Rodney Dolliker. Wonder of wonders! Dolliker has actually come up for the do. Dalgleish and Souness couldn't make it. Both rise further in my estimation. I'm astonished that Dolliker has, until I learn that the real reason he's in Scotland, with his agent by his side, is to arrange his own testimonial match with Celtic. It's a good crack, with the usual loads of jokes about how fitba guys are the salt of the earth, and women are only good for cleaning, cooking, and shagging. I'm enjoying the fact that Stronach is ill at ease because Dolliker's upstaging him, though Lennox fucks up by saying something sycophantic to our testimonial sportsman. When was the last time Lennox was in Gorgie in a non-working capacity? The meal's pretty good. I start off with the prawn cocktail, then go for steak, chips, mushrooms and onion rings, followed by Black Forest Gatto. Stronach and Dolliker have some pasta dish while Lennox has chicken Kiev. There are quite a few hangers-on at this table, 
loads of minor football celebs trying to catch Dolika's attention, as he's still a pretty big name. Stronach, now bolstered by Lennox's ass-licking, has stopped trying to compete with Dolika and is basking in the reflected glory. I have to give it to that English cunt, Dolika. He's got his daft jocks well sussed out. These arseholes will always bring between five and ten thousand damn, which at our prices could mean an extra quarter million quid in the kitty. All I have to do is play up this old Irish granny routine. Suppose I'd better dig one up from somewhere? He winks at his agent, before elaborating. See, a couple of the lads, English boys, used to play for the Republic. They've been teaching me all those daft mix songs. Someone produces an evening times. It contains an interview with Rodney. I grew up in a large Irish family in North London, and all the folks back home in the old country were mad keen silts. I would have dearly loved to have been able to pull the hoop jersey over my head. I said uh, striped jersey at first, he laughs. I couldn't remember that they played in hoops. Thank God the journalist was sympathetic. Bleed Nora, he snorts. I mean, one jock team's much the same as any other to me. Oh, shit, ain't he? Still, I'll take their gyros. Another ten thousand on the gate? Can't be sneezed at, can it? I saw Stronach go red at that point. Dolica gives a witty speech, as does a Scottish First Division manager. But the rest are just fucking windbags who like to hear the sound of their own voices. Dolica leaves early before the auction takes place. The strip he wore in the England B International versus the Czech Republic a couple of years ago in his last representative game is auctioned and fetches a hundred and fifty quid for Tom's testimonial fund. It was bought by Alan Beach, the plumber's merchant, who's on the testimonial committee. At the end of the night, Lennox departs, and I decide I'm too fucked up to drive the Volvo, so I share Stronach's taxi home. That Rodney Dolliker has a laugh, eh? I smile. It was great hearing his fipper tales. Arrogant English cunt, Stronach spits. I go into my home and Shirley calls. I let the machine get it. Bruce, I need to talk to you, Bruce. A distressed, mechanised tone whines. It's very important. Phone me, Bruce. Please. I put on a private video, one of Hector's, which features some good ass-fucking shots. It never fails to amaze me, the purchase those male actors get on the old ass-fucking. Poles must be well greased. Mind you, these birds, but their assholes must be stretched like a mother of ten's fanny. Shirley. Don't mistake me for somebody who cares, my love. I go to do a shite. I've taken some of Ross's laxatives, but I can't see any of the worm. It's no good just getting its body out anyway. You need to get the whole head, otherwise it just keeps growing. I try to turn in, but I feel uneasy and sleep with the light on. These cunts with their OT cutbacks will kill me. I need a good fucking shite. You were always aware of your mother, but your father was a shadow when you were a child. There was no warmth or tenderness coming from him. When you did try to go to him, he brushed you away. Sometimes you would see him looking at you when you were playing with your toys on the carpet, looking into you, beyond you. You would turn and smile because you were a good wee boy and you wanted to please your father, really wanted him to love you, but he would wince and look away. He stopped trying to go to him. The look was enough. Then he started doing the things to you with the coal, making you taste the coal, taste the filth. You could understand none of it. What had you done? Why was he doing this? What had you done to deserve this? Your mother would come when you cried in the night. You're a good wee boy, Bruce. You're mummy's wee boy, she would tell you. Yet you could sense the pity in her love. You knew right from the start that there was something wrong with you. Then there was the baby. Her baby brother. 
You were only marginally interested, but everyone loved the baby. Your wee brother, Stephen. Your dad, your uncles and aunties, they all loved that child. You thought that if you loved him too, they would see that you were a good boy and they might love you. You looked into the cot and touched the baby's small hand. Your father pulled you away with a violent jerk. Your arm wrenched in its socket as he tucked it. Don't you go near him. Don't you ever lay a finger on him. He snapped. He didn't cry. You just bowed your head. Your mum came and led you away. Her look, that pitying look, which you now were beginning to resent almost as much as your father's sneers. But the sight of my ears. Oh, makes me puke. Shit hanging like tagly a telly from my rear cheeks. No. No. Do not do this. So I can't get the bastard out. Hold. Hold. Hold the pain. I decide that there's going to be no work done today. So I fill out an OTA 1-7 for the overtime and sit back watching videos until I drowse. When I wake up, I note that it's the evening. This is when I come to life. That was a great kip. It's got me going. I've snorted my last half G and I'm on the mooch for mere posh. I call cold round at Ray Lennox's gaff. Always the best way to call anyone. The Polis way. One heavy knuckled rap on the door, and I hear that characteristic sound of the occupants scuttling like disturbed rats, their pathetic lives swamped in criminality. Lennox is doing something he shouldn't be. Then the door opens. He has a bud round. She's just on her way out. Eh, uh, Bruce, Lennox says. Uh, this is Trudy. Pleased to meet you, my darling. I lift her hand to my mouth and kiss it. An extravagant gesture. Worth forty wanks as well. Mm hmm Pleased to meet you, Trudy. Ray's not mentioned you to me. That's remiss of him, I smile. I turn to Lennox, who now looks a bit off-white. I can see why you'd like to keep a treasure like her well away from an old prospector like Bruce Robertson. She smiles and departs, Ray instantly recovering his cool. Tidy peace, Mr. Lennox, I say approvingly. A lovely girl, Lennox replies in fake pomposity. He's already gone to his stash and started cutting out the lines. I'll say one thing for Ray Lennox. He doesn't let the grass grow under his feet as far as the posh goes. Fuck work today, even the back shift. I snort back one of the lines. I believe in law and I believe in order. This is a treat, a perk for enforcing. Jesus, fuck, good shit. Ah, where was I? Aye, a perk for enforcing law and order. I mean, we know that there are shite laws, so there's no point in obeying them ourselves, even if it's our job to enforce them for others. The problem is, most people are weak. So if you don't have laws, even shite ones, then you certainly don't have any order, matey. Same rules. Agreed, Ray points at me, then bends down to the mirror to fill his hooter full of gear. Whoa. Aye. Sometimes I think that the best solution to the whole fucking mess would be if we could just go around and shoot any cunt we felt like at any time. Most of the time, simply through experience and professionalism, you'd get it right. Then wide bastards wouldn't go around with such an attitude. Imagine all the fucking scumbags with big apologetic stares on their faces. Knickers doing in London and abos are in Sydney, all smiling and going, yes, baz, like they did in the fucking fields. Birds coming up, getting your blowjob in the street for the privilege of no getting their fucking heads blown off. But most of all, just fucking well shooting spastics stone dead. I smile, forming a gun out of my hand, putting it to my head, and making a loud exploding noise as I violently jerk the hand and head away from each other. Good coke, eh, Bruce? Too good for spastics, Ray. Too good for spastics. I kid you not, my sweet, 
sweet friend. Ray Lennox, a sound guy and a fucking good policeman. I don't care what anybody says. After another blitz on the posh, we hit a few bars. Then it's back to his, we a carry you in mere posh. The cunt makes me listen to his shite records all night. Starts trying to tell me that the verve, or whatever they're called, are better than you two in Simply Red. Get a life, Lennox. It gets too much, and I leave and head downtown. Fucked if I'm paying for a taxi. I think I might have missed the last copy bus. It'll have to be a night bus. It's fucking freezing out there. I head into St Andrew's Square station to see if there's a bus for any of the outlying scum towns that can drop me off in Collington. My luck might be in, as there's still one or two people hanging around. I see a Jakey out of the corner of my eye. He scrapes along the wall, coming to rest against a bus shelter. The Jakey seems to have a kind of fear in his eyes, as if it's just dawned on him that whatever he's drunk... It's just not been quite enough to blank out the hideous reality of his miserable life. And I know him. Alan! Alan Loughton! Used to be a member of the strike committee back in the day. How's it going, Al, buddy? How's it going now that the pits have been shut down for over ten years? How is it going, now that you're no longer seen as a socialist hero back in the village, but as a boring old pissheed, and that things are the same? The strike. You had two strikes, Bruce. When the filth first came. Three strikes, and you're out. At the old law game. All right. Alan, isn't it? What's this? I nod at his gold tin of Carlsberg special. Nay, all purple tin. Going bourgeois on us. Cleaning up our act, are we? He's looking at me now, trying to get me into focus. Bruce, Bruce Robertson, I tell him. Mindy me. I joint the polis just before the strike. If you can't beat them, join them, I always did say. What about yourself? What are you up to these days? Politics, no doubt. Always did have a way with public speaking. Loughton groans an incomprehensible recognition. Seem to have lost it but me, eh? That silver-tongued oratory. Anyway, I must fly. See you. I turn and stroll across the concourse. Behind me, I can hear a pained growl of sheer anguish. There's two words, though, that I, we, I, we can make out. Filth. The other one is B. No fucking way, a jakey. A purple tinned cunt is fucking with my head. It's me, Bruce. There are no others. I'm not the one he's on about. Loughton, a nothing, a nobody, a set of fucking dormant social problems waiting to be cleaned up. That's the real filth. That's the real garbage. At the other end of the bus park, two uniformed spastics are talking to an eastern Scottish transport inspector. I approach them. All right, officers, I flash my ID. Aye, one says nervously. How old's your granny? I ask. 362, he replies. Good lodge. Dougie Miller, still Grand Master. Aye. Well, officer. Cameron, sir. Well, PC Cameron, I suggest you and your colleague here get your fingers out of your assholes. Are you aware of the policy of zero tolerance of crimes and misdemeanors in public areas? Yes, we, he stutters, a fledgling spazwit. I'm assuming that you are beat officers here. Uh, yes, sir. I'm glad to hear it. There's a fucking jakey over the concourse. I point in Loughton's direction. He's been abusing passengers, including me. You get that cunt, or you're getting it both ways, through the service and through the craft. Savvy? Right, one says nervously, turning to the other one. Let's go. The two uniformed spastics race across the tarmac and grab a hold of the bemused Loughton. I always liked Loughton, but it seems to me that he's been going nowhere since his salad days of the minor strike. 
The best I could do is to help the cunt relive old memories, and it was almost like old times watching the poor fucker get huckled away into the back of a police vehicle by the boys in blue. Come in, Charlie. The new area office in the south side looks tatty already. Those sticky finger-printed glass doors and that fag-bunt public desk with the badly printed and faded posters on the notice board above it. There's a smell of disinfectant, that strong, institutional kind that looks like it's been put down to conceal the smell of pish, even when it hasn't. It. An old cow is giving the desk sergeant a hard time. It's Sammy Bryce, though, and Sammy's too professional to let her face him. I understand that, he's saying, but if it doesn't have a crime number, then there's nothing we can do. How do I get a crime number? she asks. You have to report to the nearest local station to where the offence took place. But they said any police office. She's almost in tears with frustration. Any police office if you have a crime number. I wink at Sammy. Not a bad guy for a uniform spastic. And then I head upstairs to meet Davy McLaughlin. D.S. McLaughlin from the south side is heading up the investigation of Bladesy, who has returned from the bosom of his spastic family in Newmarket to find himself minus a wife and in our custody helping us with our inquiries. McLaughlin is a good choice in this one. A dirty, carrot-topped bastard with a filthy fucking pape name. Not in the craft, an odious piece of racial vomit. It's quite fortuitous, as it's an excuse for not pulling strings for Brother Blades. The pervert Brother Blades. So you know Cliff and Bunty Blades well? he asks. Of course, we find it distasteful talking to a freckle-faced left-footer, but it's serving our purposes. I slip on my concerned face. Aye, Davy, we're friends of the both of them. I've Kent Blades, the eh, Cliff Blades, for a couple of years, but I've only got to know Bunty recently. She was going through a pretty hard time with this sicko hasslinger, so Blades he wanted me to come around and give them a bit of support. Did you ever get the idea that he was the one making all those calls? I give a slow, deliberate swallow. Davy. I've been polis longer than I care to remember, and I've investigated loads of cases like this. At the time, I have to admit it, it was the last fucking thing on my mind. I shake my head. Now I can see that this was how he was getting his kicks, enjoying the element of risk. He was wanking all over me. I smash my fist onto the table. Don't give yourself a hard time, mate. Honestly says the concerned Romanist. Seems not a bad guy for a pape. We all have to switch off and have our own lives. Sometimes we get blind spots about people. But I feel like a fucking monkey, Davy. Bruce, you can't go around in your private life thinking that every single pal you've got can or can be Jackie Trent in some way or another. If the truth be told, when we walk out that door, we all put the job on hold to an extent. Maybe you do, but you're a pape. As your family are, probably all criminals. You have to put the job on hold. I want to see him. I don't think that's a good idea, Bruce. The bead twiddler tells me. Just give me two minutes with him. I won't fucking touch him, I swear. Okay, he says, raising those ginger brows. McLaughlin may be a Romanistic, anti-abortionist cunt, but he's Polis through and through. I head down to the detention room where Bladesy is being held. A uniformed spastic stands over him, but departs as I come in. Bladesy says nothing, but his eyes are burning and eager. He's pleased to see me. This pathetic little bastard's genuinely pleased to see me. He really thinks that I'd be friends with a sad pervert. Best put him right. You fucking little cunt, I snap. Fucking piss-taking little fart, you fucking strung me along from the start. 
All that fucking shit about Frank's side bottom. You are wanking off in my face, you fucking cunt. Blades is now a picture of wretchedness. No, he protests. He looks so bad that it's hard for me to keep looking at his eyes. I turn away briefly, but then the need for sport takes over, as it always does, and I glare at him. Bruce, you have to believe me. It wasn't me. Don't make me fucking punch your head down through your fucking shooters. Right out your fucking arse, you wee cunt. I move towards him, and he cowers away. I stop and turn, then do a full circle back towards him. I think of all the injustices I've suffered. More injustices than that we cunt could ever know. Spreading my palms, I plead. Why, me? Why the fuck did you do this, Cliff? Why did you drag me into it? I thought we were mates. I didn't. I didn't. We are. Blades, he begs, and then breaks down. I didn't. I didn't. He chokes, biting into the sleeve of that check jacket to stifle his sobs. It's pathetic watching a grown man cry in that manner. No fucking pride. Do you see me break down like a fucking wee tart? And all the shite I've had to contend with as well? Do you fuck? We cope. He deserves to die, to be forced into committing suicide and dying, like Clell. Aye, if I had my way, that would happen with the fucked up. A sort of psychic natural selection. I'd take over the fucking do-gooding helplines, and if one of those sad cases phoned up, I'd say, I think you're absolutely correct to feel such despair. Give the world a break and take your own miserable life. If you need any help, I'll be round in a few minutes. Bladesy, he's fucking rubbish. Me, hanging about with that name-mate's trash. <laughs> I think not. I'm starting to hyperventilate as I look down on him. I wish I could believe you. I wish I could fucking believe you. I'm fucking out of here. I storm out the room, knocking over a chair, and I hear Bladesy crying, Bruce, as I depart. Outside, I regain my composure. I thumb back towards the interview room. Damaged, in the fucking nut. Don't give that spastic any fucking coffee. I hiss at the poor uniformed spastic, who's a little shaken. Right, gaffer, he says meekly. I like this officer. I like being called gaffer. It's a term some spastics around this neck are going to have to get used to when that promo comes through. I kid you not. I say tatty buys to the tatty muncher McLaughlin, thanking the Romanist for his assistance and confirming that, yes, Retrospectively, I should have seen that we were dealing with damaged goods in the form of Brother Blades. I drive back to HQ. I'm soon at my desk, studying Monica from Sheffield's full paps, each little goose pimple on them clearly defined. The photographer's done the business with this one, a keen student of the game. The phone goes, external. I skip a heartbeat and then feel a long, tense drawing in my chest. I pick it up. Hello? It's Bunty. Bunty, I state. Have they got him? Yes, I've just been down there to see him. Still denying everything, I'll bet. Yeah, to be expected. They all do it. Not a particularly pleasant experience, it has to be said. Yes, it must have been. Bruce, when can I see you? I've been giving that a bit of thought, Bunty, and I think it's for the best that we keep a low profile with our relationship, at least until this mess is cleared up. What? Bunty, this could cost me dearly. I'm a detective. I should have picked up that Cliff was suspect. I knew what he was like through the craft, with the videos and stuff. We, I could be a laughing stock on the job. There's a promotion coming up. You get my drift? Bruce, I'll be discreet about us until the time is right. I promise I won't say anything. But you must come and see me, Bruce. Of course I will. I say softly down the phone. We've got something special 
haven't we? I'll be round to fuck you soon, you big fat whore. I think so, she says, her voice breaking. But I'd never get in the way of your career. I'd never do anything to foul that up. Bunty, you don't know how much it means to hear you say that to me. All my life I felt that I was meant for greater things, but there was always something holding me back, some missing piece in the jigsaw. That missing piece, I can see now, is the love and understanding of a wonderful woman. That's what you are, Bunty, a wonderful woman. And you've suffered so much. I want to put that right. Oh, Bruce. Just keep mum, my darling, and I'll be round to see you soon. That's a promise. Okay, Bruce. I'll see you soon. Bruce, I love you. Fuck off, fatso. Uh, the moment Bladesy was banged up, that was you and me in the death throes of our relationship. Mind you, I might string this cow along for a bit longer. Asks no awkward questions and keeps a good clean hoose. She'd get a formidable crease on a collar, I ain't. I love you too, Bunty. There's a silence. I have to go, I tell her. I've got another call coming in. I have as well. It's Shirley. Fucking hell. I've heard of the expression Fanny coming out the fucking was, but it's certainly coming out for the receiver. I see Gilman over in the corner by the sink, and he's holding up my heart smug and gesturing at the kettle with his free hand. Shirley, I say curtly. I check for the Kit Kats in my drawer. Still a few left. Bruce, I need to see you. I need to talk. I give Dougie the thumbs up sign. What about... I need to see you, please. This cunt's going fucking loopy on us here. All right, all right. Jeannie Dean's in half an hour. Be there, Bruce. Please, don't let me down. I won't, we tell her. I won't what? Be there or let her down. Then thinking of Bunty, not of how we feel about Bunty, but what we said to her, we say, I love you. You mean that? The even-handed approach. It enhances credibility both in policing and in relationships. I said it. I'm on my way. See you soon. See you. I put the phone down. What is that spasticated cow wanting from me? We have enough fucking trouble on our plate as it is. I go over to the kettle where Gilman and Ray Lennox are in conference. Gascoigne was right, and Best even said it as well. There's never been a man, a real man, who hasn't slapped his missus. All that liberal airy-fairy bullshit. She steps out of line, she gets a bat in the mouth, that's it. Lennox is shaking his head slowly in disgust. We investigate crimes of domestic violence. That's assault, and it's against the law of the land. Fa <sighs> Gilman sneers. And nobody sneers quite like him. If someone told me, in sincerity, that I gurned like Gilman, I would die a happy man. I can tell it's draining the blood from Lennox's face at five feet. I get enough fucking mouth on the job without taking it for some cunt in the hoose. He looks to me. Put this cunt right, Bruce. I have to fly. I'm having woman problems, I smirk. But this is a subject which needs further discussion. The bar, too, need to hear. It's just you and me now, Bruce. Just us. They nod affirmatively, Lennox with reluctance, and I, we, I, we're all here, jump in the motor and speed towards the Jeannie Dean's pub in the south side. We decide to drive through Queen's Park, and we marvel at Salisbury Craig's imposing face which towers above us. This city of ours is truly beautiful, and we like this part where there is not a schemey in sight. Why could we not simply move all the scum to the middle of nowhere, like Glasgow, where they would blend in more effectively? Come to think of it, that's exactly what we did do when we built the schemes. Sent them far, but not far enough. We still have a wrap of coke on us, 
and there must be a good half a G left, and we rub a load of it into our grace goes numb. We need it, or the shirley who are. We know that she is going to make demands on us. We are not to be entrusted with the demands of the weak. It is not in our character. Shirley is sitting on her own at a table in the corner of the empty bar. She looks like a hopeful whore on a day shift. When we get closer, we can observe her distress through her red, puffy face. Apparently, our sister-in-law has been crying. Bruce, I had a smear, a cervical smear. There was something there. I have to go back for more tests. I'm sorry, we tell her. But that's just one of those things. No sense in getting all steamed up until you see what the other test results tell you. But I can't cope. I've nobody since Danny left. I need you, Bruce. I need somebody. I need support, Bruce. Just looking at her there, at her distress, just for a second, we wish we were stronger. I wish I was somebody else, the person she's mistaking me for. The person whom she wants to mistake me for. The person who gives a fuck. Sorry, we tell her. I don't see what I can do. You'll have to sort it out. I've been licking her diseased fanny. Oh, my God. Then I, we, start to think. No way should Stronach be getting his game in the middle of the park with that young boy languishing in the reserves. What's his name? Him that played towards the end of the season. He's fit now, so there's no excuse for such poor selection. Bruce, please, she says, and grabs her hand in hers. We brush her away. Sorry, Shirley, we say, rising, as she starts the waterworks. Nothing we can do. Urgent case, eh? Sort it out and keep me posted. Chin up. Ciao. We dance across the floor in the pub, slipping deftly past two chairs, and as we turn, can see her round, dark, black hole of a mouth, and she's bawling something, but we are spinning away out the door, and she rises to follow us, but we gnash like fuck across the car park, humming the closing credits tune of the Benny Hill show. She's still in hot pursuit, screaming, Bruce! And we realise that we are running in the wrong direction, away from the car. We look back and slow down, regaining breath and then turning round, standing still and smiling as she approaches us, breathing heavily. We then do a quick shuffle and sell her such a Charlie Cook-style dummy that had she been a defender, she would, indeed, have had to pay to get back in the park. Gotcha! Emulate that, Stronach! She falls onto her knees, howling in frustration as we, I, we, dive in the car and start up the motor and we head down the road, watching her broken figure receding from us in the mirror. Shirley brought it on herself. A disease of the fanny, divine retribution for her infidelities. We have our rash, that is our penance. We do not inflict our misfortune on others. We are not made that way. Daft cunt. Our, my, head is spinning, but I feel euphoric and sick at the same time. There's no way that I can go back to the office and be harassed by whores. It's hoggers the mom. Out with the old, in with the new. Same rules for Fanny as for everything else. We, I, radio into Toll, telling him that we are following up several leads. I then head home, via stopping at the offy for more supplies, then driving out to Hector the farmer's place to pick up some books of a specialist nature which will be used to provide our, my, evening's entertainment. Hector's boyn when I get to his. He's smoking that pipe, which always gives him an even more contented air. You know, Bruce, the best thing he ever did was to put me in touch with wee clear. I've turned into a right old sugar daddy. Fantastic wee lassie. My fucking... I feel a surge of jealousy and remember that she's just a whore and it's all commercial transactions. I have a quick malt with Hector and head off. 
As he shows me out, that fucking collie tries to jump me again. Down, Angus. It's just Bruce. He hauls the dug away and I drive off, still annoyed at Claire for going with that old bastard. Women. I can't. Carol. Shirley. I can't. Shirley, find somebody strong. This job, this life, it's drained my strength. I don't need a lame duck in tow. Some bastard beeps me on the bypass, and I think about giving chase, but I don't feel up to it. Our coping capacity is low. I binge on the old Charlie, but in my heat, a niggling voice is telling me to eat something. <laughs> Don't binge on the coke, Bruce. Don't binge on the coke. But Charlie's fucked her appetite, eh? And all I want is more of the same. Fuck eating anything now. Coke for fuel. Coke for energy. Have a coke and a smile. Coking coal. This is white, not black. Clean, not filth. You never eat coke. You just snort it up. Snort the whole fucking lot of it up. I've done the lot, so I try to have a wank to Hector's vids in order to distract the coke craving, but I can't concentrate. My whole body wants the blood my cock needs, and I head up to Ray Lennox's. I'm tanning it in the car, giving a daft spastic the V sign as I cut him up. Cheeky cunt. Polis! Priority! I come upon Ray's gaff, and I batter the door Polis style until his dressing gowned figure appears on the doorstep. Ray! I smile. Sort me out with some posh, pronto, mate. Bruce, I can't, he says. Sort us out, Ray. Hog my name the morn, I snap, grinding my bare teeth at him. The night is but young. I hear a voice coming from inside the house. Who is it, Ray? What's wrong? It's nothing, he shouts back into the gaff. That voice. It sounded like Drummond. I suppose plenty hooers have those irritating, whingy tones. Maybe it's that Trudy bird. Company, Ray? I smirk. Wait there a minute, he says, shaking his head before moving back in. Outside in this cold? My fucking ass! I step into the lobby. He's gone for a second or two and returns, producing a gram. That's it, Bruce. That's my lot. Aye, you'll ken. I say, then I head away, leaving him looking like fucking naughty. Cheeky cunt. I get into the motor, and I want to snort a line on the dashboard, but there's too many cunts around. Desperation takes over, and I do it anyway. It's as strong as fuck. You have to test the stuff, save wasting police time putting it through the labs. One big snort. I'm trembling as I drive through the city back towards Collie. I don't know what I want to do. I'll probably hit the piss in a bit. I need to take the edge off this coke. No. I need a drink. No. I stop off outside a bar I used to frequent years ago, before we went to Oz. It'll have to be one. We realise that our bank cards are at home. Fucking stupid shiting cunt. Our fist slams the dashboard repeatedly until our hand is swollen and almost too sore to hold the wheel. Then we exit and go into the pub. A pocket of shrapnel. Barely enough for a pint of lager. I feel like a fucking jakey as I walk into this tiny dive of a public bar. There's a small lounge separate from it next door, partitioned by a wooden panel and some frosted glass. From behind it, I can hear the hee-hawing laughter of a Ford Bacardi slag when I don't even have enough to stand the cow one. I get the pint of lager up and throw two-thirds of it back in no time. There's a party of all cunts playing dominoes in the corner and a name eights fucker reading the evening news at the bar. I recognise him as Polis. Drylaw, I think. I finish the pint quickly and exit the dive, getting in the motor and driving swiftly back to Collie. 
I'm focused all the way on the bank cards, which are in the inside pocket of our jacket over the chair in the front room. With great despondency, we, I, we, we're all here now, clock a car parked outside our house. It looks vaguely familiar. We consider double backing, but we need our cards and our money. We ignore the occupant of the car, even now we recognise it as Chrissy, and storm down the path. But she's straight out after us. Bruce, I've tried to call you at work, she says. Her swine-like nostrils flare at me. Why pick on Bruce all the time? There's others too. Why can't they fucking well do anything? She's ill, you know. She could be dying, we tell her. We produce our keys and put them in the lock. Who? Shirley, my sister-in-law, she's ill. Same rules apply, we say, turn in the lock. Too bad, she says, pushing in the door after me. We try to repel her, but she's all over us like a cheap suit, and she's shouting, Come on! I want to turn off the gas for you! Come on! And her hands are in my flies. God, this place stinks! Come on, Bruce! It's only fucking well me, only me. I'm on my fucking ain here. I pull away, but she's still coming on, this fucking cackling witch, her mocking vicious whore's eyes. And I'm pulling her hands away, but I'm stiffening against my will. Leave me, leave me. Come on. She's got my cock out, and she's sucking me off. And we're crying, crying for Shirley. No, 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 crying for herself. And she's got my belt off, and I'm saying, No, no, but Chrissy, wait a minute, wait a minute, Chrissy. And she's diving out of her clothes, and she gets the cord from her bag and wraps it round her own neck. I'm shivering and trembling, and I need my Charlie. It's in my pocket. And I need to see Shirley or Carol. She's the one I need. And she's tightened the belt around my neck before I can speak, and her sharp painted nails dig into the foreskin of my semi. She's pushing me back onto the couch, and it's horrendous. And she's pushing her cunt onto it against my will, and thrusting onto me, and the friction's hurting me, and she's choking me harder, and I can't breathe or speak as the grip tightens. Get fucking harder, you silly wee poof. Come on, get in. She's rubbing and twisting harder, and I'm getting harder, and it's going up. She's enclosing me, and I want to fuck this bitch to pieces, but there's no way. Because although I'm hard now, she's fucking the life out of me, throttling out of me. And she's screaming, turn off my fucking gas, fuck harder, more, more, turn off my fucking gas. I'm choking and blacking out as I convulse, and she's screaming and growling, and her teeth bite my bottom lip as she roars and bucks and crashes before she pulls away gasping, and I watch my cock disintegrate. She lies back and lights a cigarette. Mmm, that was great. What's wrong, Bruce? You okay? You're greeting like a wee laddie. Shirley's ill, I say. My sister-in-law, she's no ill. I'm crying for myself. She looks at me and shakes her head. You're no fun anymore, Bruce. We hear voices, Chrissy, all the time. Do you ever hear them? All our life we've heard them, the worms. What? What are you on about? We say this, they say that. We turn the records on loud. It, it's like the messages in the records when they play them backwards, like me and her. We're together still, you can, man. It's all of us, I, we. I hear myself singing in a low, tuneless voice. Why not take all of me? I have to go. She says, pulling her clothes on. Whatever it is that you're on, you should lay off it. We say nothing. We're just willing her not to be there. Depart, depart, depart. Nobody asked you to come. When she goes, we binge on the coke we got from Ray. After a few hits, we wish the cow would come back, because I'd really show that cunt. But no, my cock's still as limp and sad as Ray Lennox's that time with... with Shirley. Cause it was me and Shirley and I let her down, and I can't blame the others. I go to phone, but decide against it. I try to light the fire, but my hands are trembling. A bit of Toll's manuscript has been preserved, brittle and dry. In Bill Teal's office. Anderson. This cycle, you reckon he'll strike again? Teal. What makes you so sure it's a he? Anderson. Come on, Bill, they usually are. 
Teal. I think that our mystery lady may have more to do with this than we imagine. Anderson looks visibly flustered. Anderson. What makes you say that? Teal. Basically, there's two things. One, she's vanished off the face of the planet, which means someone's covering up for her. Someone, perhaps, who knows a lot about this investigation. And secondly, what the fuck? What the fuck does this cunt Toll know? I should have read that script. Fucking Carol! Da fucking cow! Fuck! I should have read that script. Knowledge is power, or so they say. But fuck it. Keep your head down and your heart hard and you'll be okay. Slow breathing. Slow breathing. Easily done. Our hearts are hardened in this business. They have to be as hard as our sponsors' heads, and that's what fucks us up. They can afford to be hard, because they can abstract it all, and they can do that because they are removed from it all. We, on the other hand, must pay the physical and psychic price, so that these pampered rich cunts can flounce around unperturbed. No, there isn't such a thing as a free lunch. We always pay. I get the bank Thank card you. ready and leave. Thank you. You were your parents first born, but something was wrong. Your father had no time for you. Outside, the people in the village seemed to glance at you as if you were a freak. Parents would tell their children not to play with you. At home, you would look at yourself in the mirror and try to see what it was they saw. All you could see was an ordinary young boy. Stevie always played with you. You and Stevie, Stevie and you. Stevie was bubbly and enthusiastic. He did the same things as you did, but people responded differently. Indulgence to him, impatience with you. Sometimes, though, when you hung back, you seemed to get through on Stevie's slipstream. But you and he were inseparable. Your dad loved Stevie, and he didn't like him playing with you. He thought that Stevie should play with his normal friends, the ones at school who were the same age, not two and a half years older. At night in your bed, you could hear your father and mother arguing, his voice rising, your mother crying. You wanted to stop it, but after a while you started to see it differently. You started to become aware of the words he used that would make her cry. You studied him. At first, it was daunting. He seemed an impregnable fortress of power, of fearful omnipotence in your child's world. But then, eventually, under your critical eye, the cracks started to appear. You learnt what got to him, although you knew that you could never exercise that knowledge. Yet. Sick day, where the demons are waiting for us. This morning they come in the thin and miserable shape of Drummond. I am out of patrol with her. Why? I don't know why. I can't think straight. She's going on about the case, victims, suspects, scenes of crimes, reports, forensic, analysis, politics, and I want to scream, Shite! I don't fucking care about this! I'm fucking well dying here! Because I am. I can't breathe in this fucking car. That fucking coke flares up my sinuses, my bronchitis. I'm coughing and shaking and the smell of her perfume is unbearable. She must be on the rag dousing herself like that. A pathetic cover-up job. It's stinking like a whore's cubicle in the red light district on a Saturday night at the height of the tourist season back in the dam. This fucking motor. This isn't a hug, man, eh? This is fucking Halloween. Out with her, of all people. Cruising them. Looking for Rocky. Ha! Huh? Never fucking Polis. But we are fucking Polis. We are sick and shivering and frightened. Lennox tried to poison me with that coke. It was full of shit. He's trying to kill us. We feel like shouting at Drummond. See if we die. It's Ray Lennox's fault. Ray drug addict Lennox. The same Ray Lennox you think the sun shines out his ass, but you don't know what he's like. He won't he fuck you like the way you want. We've seen his fucking cock, and if we die, it's Lennox that's the murderer. 
I'm hyperventilating. We are hyperventilating. I'm, 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 I'm smelling that motherfucking bacon fry. Somebody phone the police. Help, please. Are you okay, Bruce? Yes, okay, I certainly am. But look, you can see it's none of my business. I'm fine, honest. I've just been having a bit of a bad time, we tell her, gaining control of her breathing as sweat pours from her brow. We roll down the window and a frozen blast of air comes in. If you want to talk about it, she lowers her voice, adopting the Miss Hunter in good cop mode stance. Miss Hunter, I'd fuck her eyes out now if I had the chance. Probably an arid, fanned spinster whose vagina tastes of Arizona soil. Who does she think she is to think that I'd take her into my confidence? Don't put on your personnel hat, Amanda. This is real polis work. You have to cope to get on. My head's nipping to fuck, and I'm shivering. Polis work, polis work, polis work, polis work, polis work, polis work. What would you care about that? It's not my personal hat. I'm concerned about a colleague, that's all. Is that all it is? I smile at her, trying to compose myself. Please, don't flatter yourself. I think you're a silly, pathetic man, and I've no interest in you other than us having to work together. I've heard that line before, usually mouthed by a cow with a wide on who wants it filled. You fancy me. That's all there is to it, I can tell. Bruce, you're an ugly and silly old man. You're very possibly an alcoholic, and God knows what else. You're the type of sad case who preys on vulnerable, weak, and stupid women in order to boost his own shattered ego. You're a mess. You've gone wrong somewhere, pal. She taps her head dismissively. I'm seething in my seat. I start to speak, but the cow raises her hand and cuts me off. You were out of order that time with Karen. She was on a low and drunk, and you took advantage. You've really got a problem. You can that. How is none of your business? Consenting adults, I tell her. She wasn't in any state to consent or not to consent, Drummond clucks. You think if she had been sober, she would have went with you? Cheeky fucking whore. Fine. Well, she shouldn't have fucking well drunk then, should she? You're going to stop people for doing that next? She wanted a drink, so she had one. After she had a drink, she wanted a shag, so she had one. Don't talk to me like I'm a fucking rapist. Why all this interest in Karen? You fucking jealous, is that it? Oh, God, she tuts, rolling her eyes. I'm not a lesbian, Bruce. Before you start with any more of your silly, predictable responses... I have a boyfriend. He's far better looking, more intelligent, sensitive, stronger, and younger than you. In the sexual marketplace, you're not even Pound Stretcher or Ali's Cave to his Jenners. You're a sad creature. I certainly don't fancy Karen in any way, shape, or form, but I fancy you even less. You repulse me. Can I make it any plainer? This is neat. This is neat. Well, why are they fucking concerned for me? I hear myself bleat. This cow. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm no, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no. Because you're my colleague and you're a human being. You have to get yourself straightened out. And then you might just become the kind of person you imagine yourself to be. Although God knows what that is. What the fuck is this? Ken's note, Ken's note, Ken's note, Ken's note. Kane's note, Kane's note, Kane's note, Kane's note. Oh, Kane's note. It's I'm, uh, I'm not so good at my job now. Not so good. I've been in it too long. In Australia, I was the best. My family don't talk to me because of the strike. They're a mining family. Newton Grange, Moncton Hall. They don't talk to me. They don't let us in the house. My father. It was my brother. It was the coal, the dirt, the filth, the darkness. I hate it all. They won't let us in the house. It ain't fucking hoose. We tried. We really fucking well tried. I was only doing my fucking job. Polis, eh? It was only the strike. She turns to me, her teeth grinding together like she's been up all night on the Charlie as well. Accept it. Deal with it, she snaps. You have a wife, a daughter, don't you? That's all gone. I'm shaking my head. She told lies. Stupid lies. Who did? Both of them. Stupid lies. We laugh. It's all gone wrong. Same rules apply. We used to be good at the old polis work. I bet they told you that, eh? 
Yeah, they told me, she says, disinterestedly. Well, how would she know, cause she's never fucking polis, but if she could help us, if she could just try to understand like Carol used to, if we could explain, there's something wrong with us now, something bad, something inside. Have you been to a doctor? He can't do anything for us, nothing. That's it, our, I tell her. Now I realise that I can't talk to her. Her? Her of all people? I was weak. Weak to start. Same rules. Look, stop here. I'm getting out, and I'm staking out Settrington and Gorman. Bruce, I don't think you're fit to work at the moment, she says. I turn in the seat and look at her in a grim, tearing focus. That nosy cunt. Get a fucking life of your own instead of nosing into other people's. I'm heading up this investigation, Drummond. Don't you ever forget that. Get on with your fucking job and stop playing the amateur psychologist. I roar with violence, and she cowers under the impact of my words and my hot, slavering breath, stopping the car abruptly, her face crimson and her eyes watering. I jump out. She starts off at pace. Once she's out of sight, I get a taxi home and go to my bed, where I see more demons forming in the swirling patterns of my Artex ceiling. The bed we used to share. Time we acted. It's Hogmanay, and I'm going out tonight. Going out with Carol. More Carol? I've had a lot, and that may be too much, but it's that time of year. I'm freezing, and I'm glad I've put my big coat on. I'm carrying my nice new handbag, the one Bruce got me for last Christmas. Well, that should now be the Christmas before last, but I've not really used it yet. The trone is sectioned off, and the city is heaving. This used to be a traditional Scottish affair, but now it's just the Edinburgh Festival at New Year, another tourist thing. I'm sick of it. I head away from it all, down Leith Walk, passing crowds of jeering youths, couples and tourists are all making their way up the town. I turn off a side street and see the glowing light of a bar. I'm heading towards it, but I'm aware that there's a car cruising alongside me, as if I was a hooker or something. One guy's hanging out of the window making signs. I ignore him. Then it stops a little bit in front of me, and two young men get out. They approach me, and one blocks my path. My grip tightens on my handbag. Happy New Year, doll, he says. You coming for a wee ride, sweetheart? the other asks. No. I, I start, then stop. I don't like talking to strangers. Not when I'm out with. They start to laugh. I start to laugh. We, we start, start to laugh. laugh. Then one man gets out from the back of the car and pushes us into the back seat as another pair of hands grab hold of our wrists. We're in the back seat of the car, crushed between two men, and the other two have got into the front and we're speeding off. It's strange, but we never thought of reacting, resisting or running off, although we had time to do both. This, this seems, seems the right, right way. way. You're a fucking sick fairy. I'm going to fucking cripple you, one young man says, turning around in the front passenger seat. We know this albino skin boy to be Gorman. We know the record of this thug. You shag guys like that, darling. A guy next to us is laughing. He's big. His hands are like shovels. His head is as chunky as Darth Vader's mask. This man we know to be Setterington. They can't talk to us like that. Listen, Listen, we tell them. Police, we're working undercover. They laugh. They just laugh at me. We pull off the wig we've been wearing. We still hold on to our handbag. Carol's handbag, my present. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. The car seems to be moving so slowly, and there is a sickness in our stomach a sickness which makes us feel as if we have eaten too much candy floss at the fairground and gone on the waltzers. Stacy liked the waltzers, 
us and her, heart tucked in the middle, the nuclear family spinning, twisting, disorientated, but still huddled together. Still. Sex your own bit, eh? One guy's laughing. He's laughing at us. We do not recognise him. Spinning, twisting out of control, the wig. It cost two hundred pounds from Turvey's on the Glasgow Road, made specially to look like Carol's hair, long and black. I told the guy it was for my wife. Her hair fell out after chemotherapy. How terrible, he said. She smokes too many cigarettes, I told him. Any cake she wear may be taken down and used in evidence, another one smiles. Liddell, this one is called. I'm detect... I'm... We're a family. We knew a fam. Detectives... We start to tell them. But Setterington has punched us hard on the nose with his anvil fist, and the tears are filling our eyes, and there is a sharp noise of pain spreading across our face and hitting the centre of our brain, and an irregular pattern of breathing fits, a heaving in our chest, half a sob, half a puke. The only thing we can react to is the pain. We can see or feel nothing else. How did it make you feel? We are different to what they think. Where's the fucking backup team? We are fucking bolus. Police. They put a plastic carrier bag over our head. We are now unable to see where we're going. We're remembering how this all started. That when Carol first left with the bairn, we used to set the table for two, and then we started wearing our clays, and it was like she was still with us, but no really. Carol. Carol, why did you dare with that fucking nigger? Those whores, they meant nothing to me. Your fucking big-moothed hoory a sister, fanny like the fucking Mersey Tunnel, and the bairn. Oh, God, 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 we want to live. All we're asking for is some law and order. It's the job. We want to make it up. We're no like the scum they put in the prisons. We want to make it right. We don't know where we're going. We don't know at all. This is Edinburgh. It's winter, but it's hot and sticky under this plastic bag, and we can't fucking well breathe here. We've lost the handbag. And their voices. Need a bag of that cunt seed before I'd fuck it. Gorman's voice. Get away. It's a fucking guy, you poofy cunt. Another is telling him. I'm not going to fuck it with my cock, am I, you daft cunt? But we'll see what we can fund to stick up this queer earse. See how much the cunt can take. Barry. We're bundled out of the car and pushed up a set of stairs. Stairs. We can see the steps under our feet. Pushed. The coon. They make us move too quick, and we go over on our heels stumbling, but they're stopping us from falling and they're shouting obscenities at us. Move, you queer ass, you fucking bufty! Come on, you fucking daft twat! This place is derelict. We can see the broken glass under our feet. It's abandoned. No noise but our own. We reach the top of the stairs and they throw us into a room. Then there's more voices. A girl's voice. I recognise it. I can't. I had seen him for somewhere. Estelle. Did he have a plastic bag out of his head at the time? Wide cunt. I feel a sharp pain in my testicles. I cover them with my hands. My fingers knead the material of the skirt. Nice one, Oki. Oki. I've been kicked by Oki. The thing is, boys and girls, it's Lexo's voice. We have to go all the way with this pig. He can what that means. You can't waste a pig, man, the other guy. I think his name's Liddell, is saying. There's a nervous laugh from Estelle. She thinks those cunts are joking. I'm no wanting out today with this, she says. Don't be daft, Lexo, Liddell's saying. You can't waste a pig. End of. That's it. Fucked after that. Another voice cuts in, gasping, frightened. It's no fucking joke. Come on, boys. 
He can't kill the boy. Not a policeman. My assailant, Oki. You shit your fucking grass and wee mouth, Ghost, he says, and I can sense Oki trembling from here. We'll see to you later. We can all about you, pal. I'm not a grass, Oki pleads. Poor Oki, always between a rock and a hard place. Lexo's right, Ghosty says. This cunt kens the score. We did the boy. We did him and all, Lexo's mocking voice continues. Deep cunts tell me tales. We can touch this place with a cunt in it, or what's left of the cunt in it. One of them whips off the bag. There's a sharp light in our face and we blink. We look at them. Yes, there's four of them. The same four, plus Estelle and Oki. Liddell is holding an old angle poise lamp in my face. The handbag is on the shelf. Setterington is mincing around with it. But we are starting to get in control now. They shouldn't have taken off the bag. Our face is throbbing and sore, our eyes still water, but we're thinking again. We see them. The lamp does not bother us. They look at our unflinching gaze. We see them. Look at him. What a fucking tube, Ghosty Gorman, the evil-looking little albino twat spits. He then smiles and produces a wrap of Charlie and starts rubbing it on his gums. High grade, mate, high grade. Took it out of your bag there, eh? Nab if he DS duty, aye. I say nothing. Should have joined the polis myself, he laughs, and the others chorus him. I'm looking at Oki, then at Estelle. Her face is pinched and angry. She looks at me with a raw hate, as if she's blaming me for putting her in this position. Ghosty sees me staring at her. Like the birdie are they, sexy, eh? No as sexy as you be, eh? No, mate. He pulls Estelle to him and kisses her, pushing his tongue into her mouth. She's awkward and stiff, resisting slightly, then complying. He stops and turns to me. Estelle rubs her lips. French kissing. Ghosty explains, That's me getting into practice for the World Cup. We know she's well. I went to this French restaurant last summer there. You like French grub? No bothered, I tell him. The posh wine after Royal Mile, he urges. A real French job. I like the garlic, me. Garlic snails. He puckers his lips and makes a slurping sound. You ever go to that place, mate? Le Petit Jardin. Ghosty pronounces the restaurant name with an affected French accent. No. I never went there, I tell him. Me and Carol never went there. I never liked French food. I always preferred going out for a curry. The Raj doing at the shore in Leith. Tommy Mia's place. That was always my favourite. A windy table, if you could get in. The Anaclia in Dorai Road. Carol liked the vegetarian options there. It was during the festival, Ghosty tells me, tarrying leisurely. This cunt's worse than toll. I goes in, in a restaurant in the main city. The waiter comes up and says, Do you have reservations? I just looks around. He twists his head haughtily around the derelict room. And I goes, Aye, I do, the decor. Then he looks contemptuously at me like I was the waiter. The service and probably the food. But it's still like a fucking table. The others smirk and smile sycophantically as he goes through the pantomime. Oki and Estelle's grins conceal death masks of terror, and only Lexo is unmoved, looking out the window. Ghosty shakes his head grimly. But no, nay table. No room at the inn, he shrugs. But Le Petit Jardin shut down for a month after that. Within a few hours of us getting bombed out, some wee mob had steamed the place and turned it over, terrorised the clientele. Now, I never have any bother finding a table. Treats us like royalty, so they do. Even with this Edinburgh's hog money, we all the tourists, I could walk in any time and they'd sort us out straight away. There will be no pleading for forgiveness. They are rubbish. They are criminal scum. They are different from us. There is now no fear in us. They are weak. You think that impresses me? 
We laugh, shaking our head. Then you can get a mob of daft wee bairns to do a stupid frog restaurant over. At Disney, we shake our head mockingly, glaring into his dark eyes. Shut your fuck, Liddell starts, putting the lamp down and moving forward. Ghosty raises his hand. Shut up, let the cunt speak. I look around at them all, then back to Ghosty. How can you, mate? You hide in the mob. You are one shiting cunt. Me and you, then. I'm staring at his cold, cold eyes. I'd take you. We look round at them. I'd take any one of yous in a square go. Fucking shitin' cunts, we snarl at them. We can see this pushes the right buttons in their spastic psychology. They're shocked, laughing, incredulous, but taken aback. They know that they are going to have to work for what they thought would just be sport, to have to put themselves on the line in some way. We've cracked their fucking code, and we are challenging them to prove to us that they are what they think themselves to be. One of them, Ghosty Gorman, goes, Right, this cunt dies. I'm taking him. Let's just fucking do the cunt now and stop fucking about, Lexa says. No, I want him. Gorman looks at me and laughs loudly. You die, he says softly. He signals for the others to depart, and they file out tentatively. He has an old key, which he uses to lock us in this room. The key to the house of love, he smiles, putting it on the mantelpiece. It's just him and us, the fucking donkey. Without announcing our intentions, we fly at him, but he catches us with a punch to our face, and it hurts, and he's all over us, and we feel weak and broken under his raining blows, and it shouldn't have been like this, and he's laughing at us, and the fear is here now, and our despondency rises, and we realise we've got nothing to give, we are just static. His head crashes into us, and our nose explodes much worse than in the car, because it's crunched into our face, and we're choking on our own blood, and we can't breathe, and there are more digging blows, and our arms feel so heavy, we can't even fucking well lift them to hit back or block him. We're on the ground. Only Bruce is taking the blows, the boots. He's protecting me, protecting Stevie, all the rest. No, no, Carol isn't here. Stevie isn't here. It's just me, Bruce. Bruce Arm. Mind of that old disco song, Dr. Kiskis. That's me, he says, strutting around. He offers his hand. I take it. He pulls me to my feet. His arm is around our shoulders. We can't move. I've always fucking hated cops, he explains. No, in the normal way, everybody hates cops. I've always hated the cunts in a special way. You're different, though, sweetheart. You can be saved. I'm going to make an honest woman of you yet. He yanks her head back, and he's looking at us in the eye. His long tongue licks his lips. Fucking wide poof polis, he smiles. Now it's time for you to learn something. He sticks his tongue in our mouth, mingling his saliva with our blood. He probes for a while, then withdraws, and we hear his voice. Sexy. Oh! You thought you could take me, you fucking sick poof. You liked that, eh? Sexy, he pants softly. You liked it, eh? Yes. We know that we want him to do this again. This is our last wish. We want to say, please, let us be together like that again, just one last time. But we can't shout, only think, only hope that he can somehow sense this wish. He does. He pushes his tongue into our head again, but now we raise our weary arms to embrace him, our hands locked together behind his back to celebrate our own joining, our own communion, our brotherhood, a grip nothing can break. It's Carol. Oh, Carol. We embrace her, 
and bite hard into her tongue, and she's squealing and trying to push us away like she did when we just wanted to hold her after we confronted her about the nigger. But no, my darling, you can't get away this time, no, cause we're hugging her tight, and as she tries to pull free, we're moving forward. No, no, my darling, we can't let you go, not now, because we need to be together, Carol, you know that. It's just how it always has to be. Our eyes have shut, but through the membrane of our eyelids, we can still see the light, and we move towards it. Move into the light, Stevie. Carol, away from the filth, into the light. But this isn't Carol. This is excrement. What is this thing doing here? Doing here with us instead of Carol? It has to go. At the right time, we release our grip and push and watch him falling backwards, crashing through the rotten window panes, still holding on, but unable to pull himself back in and trying to grab the old, worn curtains. But the material just tears in his hands, and he looks at us with hate and incomprehension, his own blood spilling from the severed tongue in his mouth as he slides out the window and crashes down onto the concrete court below. We look out and down, and we can tell by the way he's bent and broken that he's gone. And then, as if to confirm our suspicion, a huge heart shape of blood forms around his head. The spastics are banging on the door, screaming threats. Ha 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 ha! I go to shout at them, but there's something in my mouth. I put my fingers in and take it out. A piece of his tongue. I reach down and see Carol's handbag and put it in her purse. I'm screaming back at them through the door. Who's fucking next, spastics? We are the Edinburgh police. We kill spastics. We hate niggers, especially the white ones. They call skimmies. Then it stops. It seems like an age. Then we smell burning. They have set the building on fire. We go to the window and see them running out of the stairway. They scream a death threat up at me as they clock their spastic pal, and we shout back, Yous die! Yous get the same as that fucking spastic! Yous die! We get the key from the mantelpiece and open the door. There's a surge of heat, and the flames are everywhere, tearing up from floor to ceiling along the old papered walls. We are trapped. A thick, filthy smoke is filling our lungs. Our only option is to go to the kitchen and climb out onto the back drainpipe. When we get outside, the wind is flapping in our ears, and we feel that we are so high. The sky above us is a lovely pale blue, with a cloud formation the shape of a twisted beggar. The pipe is slippy, but we hold on. Then it wrenches from its brackets, and we lose our grip and fall, and there is no time for us to brace for impact, and we are crashing down into something which takes our weight as it cuts and rips all around us, and we are sinking into a filthy green brittle tomb, which is where we come to rest, in this fucking hedge, and we are unable to move. The hedge grows over a spiked fence, and one spike has missed our head by inches. We can't move. All we can do is think of Carol and sob. We cry for ourselves, not for her. It is important to remember that we always cry for ourselves. Oh, Carol, I am but a fool. Carol is nothing, you see. I am the fool. Poor me. Then we hear voices. First we half see the blood figure of a uniformed spastic asking us who we are. Darling, I love you, though you treat me cruel. You treat me cruel. At some point one of the voices becomes familiar. Well, Robbo, you've really fucked it up this time. We are torn to pieces in a woman's dress, stuck in a hedge, and we hear Toll talking to us, and in our present circumstances it has to be conceded that he may have a point. You hurt me, and you make me cry. All we can say is, you should see the other cunt. We're still scraping that particular piece of shit off the pavement at the front. But if you leave me, I will surely die. Boss. Aye. 
don't leave me. Stay with me. We whine in a voice that is not our own. Don't try to talk, Bruce. Later. I'm here. Toll squeezes my hand. A good man, Toll. I've always said it. He's got a look in his eye like my mother had when she was dying in that hospital bed. When we were trying to tell her that we were sorry for all the fuck-ups. Sorry that we were not somebody different. Sorry that we weren't like Stevie. I look like she understood. But she still pitied me. Toll's all right. But I can see the pity in his eyes. A pity I detest more than anything. I'm taking in an ambulance. I'm worried about you, Bruce. I have to. We are one. The survival of the parasite depends on the continued existence of the host. But things are not going at all well for you, my friend. While I'm becoming more ambitious, thinking about multiplying the self and bringing some more significant others into my life. Even though this will mean competition for the precious few nutrients you deign to provide me with your food intake. Such irony, Bruce. Me worrying about you. You who took away the other, that most beautiful of souls that was ever housed in a living organism, even one as primitive as my own. The lines have been drawn. On one side we have my bonny Bruce and his friend Dr. Rossi, and on the other my good self. I feel the intensification of the chemical onslaught and the vigorous contractions of the bowel, signifying renewed zeal in the attempt to cast me into oblivion. Well, my friend, my soul is firm, and I am determined that I will not pass through your bonny wee asshole into the twilight zone of the plumbing system of fair Edina City, Scotia's darling lavy seat. Must try not to move. Wakey, wakey, Bruce. Can you eat? No, I don't think you can. For the rest of us in here, Bruce. Eat. Something. Probably a sedative. The fairest and most liberal of Scotia's sons, a bonny laddie Bruce, might not be, but fate has decreed that I set up house in his bowels, and, if I'm honest, I have got used to it here. I shall not be moved. No, sir. Even less moved than you, Bruce. Less moved than the time of the first great coal strike of recent memory. From 1972 to 1974, the power cuts when your father sent you and your wee brother Stevie to steal the coal from the ping in order to heat the house. Coal that he had earlier dug from the ground by his own hand, but which was the property of others. Stevie. You were older. You were supposed to watch out for Stevie. This was understood. It's the way things always have to be. The pair of you were just kids, and you both saw it as a big adventure. For you, there was the added incentive of perhaps being able to do something that would please your father. It was easy enough for the pair of you to slip in through the overlap of the corrugated iron fence. You gasped as you looked up at the big mountain of coal in front of you. Let's climb the mountain, you said. Or was it Stevie who said it? Who charged up first, and who followed? Does it matter? It was just we boys playing. Just a game for boys. Games for silly wee boys. But you hear him shouting. I'm the king of the castle, and you're the dirty wee rascal. Stevie balls that at you, looking down on you, his face set in a caricature of a cruel and despotic monarch. The wee boy is faster, and he's beaten his older brother to the top. This wee boy is better at everything. He's more outgoing, has more personality, everybody says, than the quiet, brooding boy, than the other laddie. That was how they referred to you both in the village. We, Stevie Robertson, and the other laddie. You're angry at this humiliation. Another one, another reminder that even here, on your own, away from the glare of the adults and the other kids, he is still we, Stevie, and you are still the other laddie. Fuck off. Fuck off, you cuss, as you push Stevie back down the hill, and the wee lad loses his balance and falls. 
picking up momentum down the steep loose pile of coal. He slides down the other side of the mountain to the bottom, right down into the open hatch to the bunker, which usually stores all the coal. But now it is chronically overstocked and he's trying to climb out, but he can see the mountain above him being shifted by your movements. You don't mean to move the coal, but you still experience a strange elation as well as a crushing fear as it starts shifting and comes sliding down on Stevie, sealing him in. Now, you are falling as well, riding down on it, but you're not going into the hall with your brother because it's been sealed by the coal which has rushed in ahead of you and you come to rest only partially buried in the pile of stinking dark fossil fuel which has entombed him in the bunker. You can see nothing, though. You try to gather your senses as you scramble out from the cold towards the light. It seems to fill your lungs, that thick black dust, but you scream, Stevie! The night watchman comes as you emerge blackened from that pile of coal. He shouts at you, but you stand your ground and tell him that your wee brother's in there. You are back into the pile, kicking, screaming. Move into the light, Stevie! Move into the light. The filth. It's so fucking dark, man. Just so fucking dark. The night watchman is digging as well. More people come. There is talk of getting a pipe for oxygen. People keep digging. Time passes. The mood darkens. Your father arrives. He arrives as they pull Stevie out. Battered, broken, lifeless and black. Battered. Broken, lifeless, and... Carol! The man you knew as your father. He is crouching, crying beside his son's body. Your mother has not yet arrived. Your father looks up at you and points. The villagers fall into a silence as if to accommodate his words. You know what he is going to say so it doesn't shock you. Or maybe you are already in shock because everything seems in slow motion and the people slightly further away and their voices more detached than you are used to. This thing killed him, your father screams. This bastard spawn and the fucking devil killed my laddie. You look straight at him. You want to deny and affirm his assertions all at once. You know my son. You've never been my fucking son. You're filth. He stands up and moves towards you. You feel a hand on your shoulder. A man leads you away as your father is restrained and comforted. You will later work with this man. Know him as Crawford Douglas. He takes you to your grandfather's where you will now stay. You know at this point that the man you believe to be your father is not. This does not bring you comfort. All you ever wanted to do was to belong. Now Stevie is gone. You can't feel a thing for him. That is not true. That is not true. The Tales of a Tapeworm The Hospital Discharge Procedures The discharge in my pants, in my flannels, I wait for the taxi for Robertson in the A&E. Is there nobody who can take you home? A concerned nurse asks. No, I say. She looks at me with a sick pity and then leaves to attend to her duties. She's replaced by a jakey who sits sucking on a purple tin. He hands it to me. I take a swig, expecting to wince as the sickening syrupy liquid hits my gullet but I feel nothing. I've been coming here for ages, he tells me. Got off the skag, but I was straight on this stuff. Tenants never advertise the purple tin. It's not a recreational drug. They know it's as strong a drug as heroin or crack. They know that you don't need to market hard drugs like those. The desperate will always find them. Scotland's greatest export, next to whisky. The white man cometh. He take your land. He give the whiskey. Just when you think it's safe to go back in water, he give you old purple tin. The white Caledonian 
Q Klux Klan are coming. Taxi for Robertson. I'm going home. The nurse is back. She has a nice smell. Not like the hospital. Not like the Jakey. Not like me. I wish there was someone you could stay with, she says, touching my wrist. I'm never really alone, but the voices are silent. For now. I smile and follow the cabbie. I wish there was someone I could stay with. You went to stay with your granny in Pennycook. She did not tell you much about your real dad, other than that he had not been well and that he was dead now. The man you once tried to call dad, the one who gave you your name, you became happy to think of as Mr. Robinson. He was not your dad, not your real dad in any sense. He was the man who married your mum. The purple tin will destroy America once they import it over there. Those Russian jakeys begging in the streets under capitalism will do those cunts as well. Obliterate surplus labour. Obliterate them with the old purple tin. Don't give them ecstasy. We don't want them dancing. Keep them dulled, staggering and incoherent as they die. Make it glamorous. Put it on celluloid. Put it on hoardings. Just keep the real thing as far away from us as possible. Life was better for you out in Pennycook. Your granny was eccentrically kind through her alcoholic stupor, and your mum would sometimes come and visit. On occasions, she would bring your new half-sister. Mr. Robertson was never to hear of this, she insisted, although that omnipresent look of pity on her face began to disgust you so much that you often felt like maliciously informing Ian Robertson that you had seen the new baby. And the white race of Caledonia will stalk the earth as juggernaut super-beings, like from that album by that shite heavy metal band. Who the fuck was it? As your half-sister grew from infant to child, your mother stopped bringing her. She had another son, and her visits became less frequent. Eventually they all but ceased, by which time you scarcely noticed. At school, you were quiet. You worked hard, and the teachers liked you. While you enjoyed their approval, you had difficulty in forming relationships with the other kids. Peer friendships made you suspicious. You couldn't wait to grow up. You wanted to be bigger, stronger. The night held terrors. You would sleep with the light on, always. Once you went to church with your reluctant granny where you made up sins for a grateful priest. She loved you in a strange and twisted way and she did not get on with her daughter, your mother. Carol. You standing there, and me bending your fingers back, loaded up with cocaine and alcohol, and you looking at me with your large eyes in a weird state, way beyond fear, and me trying to think of why I should stop, and trying to feel something that will make me stop before that crack. That crack. And your scream changing now, more broken and desperate than ever before, me making you feel, but me still feeling. Nothing. How did it make you feel? But it wasn't me that did it. We all have to take our share of the blame. We can cope with this nothingness. We know it too well to be disabled by it, but it's so cold. The central heating seems to have broken down. The pilot light has blown out. Carol knew how to fix it. We, I, we consider getting a fire together, but it all seems too much. The fetching of coals, the finding of fire lighters. Is there a new pack? The kindling, the lighting? No. We have knocked on Tom Stronach's door a couple of times, but there's no reply. We once heard the television... So we know that Julie is in. The New Year's Day game. Stronach will be playing in that. But no, the papers said that he was dropped. I would think that he would attend, though, surely. 
We venture out to safe ways for food. We cannot move our head as we walk. We hear our breathing in the cold air, rhythmic, deep. It puts us into a kind of a trance. We are still alive. We are in the supermarket, breathing. The tins and packets on the shelves are just colours and shapes to us. We cannot recognise the products, cannot read the labels. If we take one of each, then the chances are that we will have enough of the right things. This one. That one. This one. Detective, sir? Mr. Robertson? I hear a voice at my side. I turn round to see her. A woman. She looks. She has a large smile on her face. Her hair is nice, and her teeth are so white. She wears jeans and a beige polo neck sweater under a brown-lined leather jacket. There's a sadness in her eyes. Who is she? I'm befuddled and besotted by lack of sleep and all those voices in my head clamouring for attention, for recognition. All I can say is, how have you been doing? Not bad. Not good. Her face screws up, and she laughs bitterly. I really want to see her smile again. She looks so beautiful when she smiles. I'm really missing him. Why is it only the good die young? She asks me. And she asks it in a real way, as a real question, looking at me as if she thinks that I might know the answer. Ah, uh, I. Uh, now she's seeing me for the first time. She sees my surgical support collar from where I hurt my neck in the fall. She sees the six-pack of the old purple tin in my shopping basket. I hadn't realised it was there. It was like they just jumped in of their own accord. She's seeing me now. She's seeing a jakey with a four-day growth, a manky overcoat, stained flannels and old trainers. Are you all right? she asks. Eh? Oh, this, I laugh, looking down at myself. Undercover, I whisper, conspiratorially. Isn't it a bit extreme for shoplifting? Oh, this isn't shoplifting. This is huge-scale corporate fraud I'm investigating. I nod over to the staff offices at the back of the supermarket. I see, she says vaguely, as her son comes over to her side. You remember Mr. Robertson, the policeman? He tried to help your dad. Hiya, the wee guy smiles. But as he clocks me, he takes a step back. I smell my flannels, wafting up the inside of my coat under my nose. It's okay, Ewan. Mr. Robertson's doing detective work. He's dressed up as a tramp. It must be exciting being undercover, eh, Ewan? The wee guy forces another smile. Hiya, I smile back. I look at his heart's tracksuit, the new one, a Christmas present. I point at the crest. So you're a jam boy. Did you go yesterday? No, he says, sadly. Colin used to... His mother begins. Who's your favourite player? I ask, expecting a Neil McCann or a Colin Cameron. Tom Stronach, I suppose, he says, then smiles doubtfully. But he's not as good as he used to be. My next-door neighbour. I'll have to get Tom to sort us out with some special tickets for Tynecastle. Would you like that? Aye, that would be Barry. Speak properly, Ewan, his mother says. She looks at me. You're really kind, but I couldn't let you. It's no problem, honestly. We exchange addresses and phone numbers. That's a really kind man, Mr. Robertson. A good man. I, we, hear her tell the kid as they depart. Our hands are almost cut in two by the handles and the plastic bags, but we are unaware of this until we reach home. Who are we? Who are we? How did we feel? 
We put the hands under the warm tap to help our circulation, but the water is boiling from the electric immersion. We flinch with the scalding pain and shed tears at the iniquity of the situation. That transgressors are living better lives than we are currently able to. More festive television and a load of fucking... Why not fix us a snack, Bruce? I'm getting a little concerned at your lack of eating. Think of me, if not you. All those noises in your head, voices clamouring for your attention. Well, as I'm getting no response from you, I might as well carry on with your story. You were brought up by your grandmother, a drunken, bitter, kind woman. There was a gap in her life since her husband, your grandfather, had departed, which was an occasion inadequately filled by various men who didn't quite measure up. Crawford Douglas had been one such man. Sometimes in that house you think about her and your grandfather. You think about him being there, sharing it with her. You think about the gap he left, how there were still traces of him everywhere. You think about how much she hates this man. He must have been horrible for you to hate him so much, Nan. You once ventured to ask her as she sat on the couch stroking her cat. She looked at you for a couple of seconds, then gazed off into space. In a slow, whimsical voice, which seemed not to belong to her, she said, No, son, he was a lovely man. He went away, though. The good ones always do. It's the trash that stick around. But you always hate the good one who goes more than the bad one who stays. The current bad one who was staying was Joe Cochy, who worked as a night watchman at the supermarket. If Joe would come back to your grandmother's at closing time on Friday and Saturday nights, he smelt of aftershave and alcohol, but you always associated him with the smell of shite as he would wipe his ass with the towels in the bathroom, which were always streaked with it. Whether he did this deliberately or whether he didn't wash his backside properly when he had a bath on Saturday and Sunday mornings, you would never know. You were fascinated by this because as a child you were very interested in urine and feces. You would spend ages on the toilet withholding your shit, forcing it back into your bowl before letting it go. You would pish under the fireside rug and wait until it dried out, the smell of urine stinking out the house. Your granny blamed the cat and put sheets of the evening news under the rug, which was stained yellow. It excited you watching the rug absorb that lake of pish, wondering whether or not you'd be detected. Eventually, she was to throw the rug out after having the cat put down. Billy's gone feral, she explained. He was a dirty animal. She threw out Joe Cocky as well. She suspected him, but not you. She'd never throw you out. Your grandmother had had a son who died as a child. You didn't know how this had happened. You knew that she blamed God and had tentatively renounced her Catholicism. On vulnerable occasions, when badly hung over, she'd returned to the church, racked with guilt. Later, she would drunkenly sneer that she would never set foot in that place again. If he's there, he doesn't stop the badness. If he's no, then we shouldn't worry about him, she would say. Alcohol and bingo. Once compliments to marriage and religion expanded to take their place in her life. Your granny hated the devout qualities of her daughter, your mother. But in her own way, she loved the son her daughter left her. So we watch television. At some point, Toll comes to the house. My first foot. At least he comes here, rather than compelling us to go in there, that evil, evil place. Some of them would have. Nidri would have. We have been officially on the sick, our neck in a surgical port collar. It might not really seem appropriate, Bruce, but Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Bob. I hear a voice coming from my stiff, cold, numb lips. Toll explains to us that we are now suspended following an inquiry of the internal variety, the type of all our inquiries. Don't worry, we'll do what we can, he tells us, looking around our house. He's not taken his expensive-looking camel coat or his leather gloves off. He looks like a football manager, like the guy who manages Wimbledon, him that played for Spurs. Steaming breath comes from his mouth. 
A few feet away in our fireplace lie the ashes of his manuscript. We cannot nod while we are wearing our support collar. Appreciate it, we say meekly. Toll is trying to be firm and compassionate at the same time. He must make us aware of the gravity of the situation, but also offer hope that things will improve. We cannot even feel sorry for ourselves any more. This is a bad sign, we think. Listen, Bruce, we've obviously had to withdraw your application for the promotion. Now is not the right time for you to meet with the promotion board. You see that, don't you? We understand what Toll is saying. We cannot be bothered responding. They've now taken the job we coveted, the one which was ours by right, but the sense of loss that we feel is strangely negligible. Toll's looking around the house with distaste. It's a mess. Aluminium takeaway cartons, chip shop wrappers, beer cans. Purple? Aye, it's found us at last. Plates with rotting scraps of food on them, even a pile of dried sick in one corner. Listen, Bruce. Toll's face pinches as he allows his nostrils to acknowledge the stench we have long been oblivious to. You can't live like this. Is there nobody we can get in touch with to make sure you're being looked after? No. Bunty. Shirley. Chrissy. Carol. Carol. The only one who could give us anything. The rest would just take. We have nothing to give them. But Carol will never return. You sure? I'll sort it out, boss, we tell Toll. His face looks sourly down at us. Honest, I try to force a smile. I want you to, Bruce. The police welfare people will be round to see you soon. They'll be able to offer professional help. I know things seem pretty bleak at the moment, but you're not the first officer on the job who's lost it, and you won't be the last. Busby's had his problems. Then there was Clell. He seems on the mend now, Bruce. Toll looks a bit sheepish. He's rubbing his gloved hands together. Aye? You've got friends, you know, he says softly. Then he smiles slightly. We're no as daft as you think. Your wife. We know she was having an affair with a black guy. It's no a big city, Bruce, and it's a very white one. Things like that get noticed, no matter how discreet the parties are. But, as I said, you've got friends. We look after our own. His words hit me in a slow, stupefying flood. I feel like a test crash dummy on low impact. I'm trying to work out what he means. You mean you knew all the time? You... Don't say anything, Bruce, Toll says sternly. Don't say a word to me. He turns and pulls the net curtains and looks out the window. Then he faces me keen-eyed. Sometimes things are best left the way they are. There's reputations, morale, and careers at stake. In some ways, aye, it's penny-wise and pound-foolish. We're a bit short-termist in our thinking. But then again, we are burdened with this wee problem of three score and ten. Needs must, he grins. Same rules apply, I try to smile, but I feel my face frozen, as if all the muscles and nerves in it have been severed. You know, all this stuff about a mystery woman. I wasted a lot of time on her. He laughs and shakes his head, looking at me, slightly embarrassed. I overheard Bob Hurley saying to you in the bar one time, They're all fucking Jackie Trent. You know... I thought that this Jackie Trent girl was involved and was having it off with most of the guys on the investigation in order to get them to cover things up. 
I spent ages looking for a Jackie Trent to run checks on. Then I realised it was all just some canteen in-joke, a bit of silly rhyming slang. Yes, Jackie Trent. I hear the words reverberate in my head and parrot mindlessly out from between my lips. Anyway, I'm sick of it all. Funny, Bruce, I misjudged you. You see, somebody half-inched a private document of mine from my office. The bastard stole the hard copy, erased the file and the backup disk. I had my suspicions. He looks at me and shrugs. We know that our face is too blank to register anything. I got a bit paranoid for a while. I was testing out everyone, trying to find cracks. I mean, all that stuff I was giving you about poor Inglis, as if I care who he shags. You were good, though, Bruce, so I'll give you that. Anyway, I was daft to have this stuff at the work. I was doing some private stuff, during breaks, you know, maybe when I had a spare minute. Sometimes I'd stay late and work on it. It's quieter at the office than at home. I thought that perhaps you knew, well... What we knew. You see, Bruce, I was writing a screenplay based on the case of a racist murder. I based it loosely on the Wurry murder, with my own fictive embellishments, of course. In my screenplay, the murder is being covered up by a racist cop who has a motive, not to solve the crime. How does it end? I ask, too quickly. Oh, we fit up some thugs, a happy ever after story. I nod. The sort of ending people like. Yes, I got a fright when the document was stolen and the files erased. At first, I suspected the certain parties. But I knew that the person would have had to have read it, and I would have been able to tell. Of course, I had another copy on the hard disk at home, so it wasn't too much of an inconvenience. You can't be too careful, eh? I still might finish it and send it off to a production company. A pipe dream, but nothing ventured, eh? Aye, that's good. That you've done it. I mean that you have an interest. Aye, I'm fed up on the force. Add it up to here. A leather glove salutes his forehead. Clell's right. The law spends too much time demonising ordinary people who are just trying to get on with their lives. Society's changed, and the law hasn't kept pace. So it's us, the mugs, who have to enforce them, who get it all in the neck. I'm sick of it. There's enough genuine bad guys to lock up without sending some daft kids on an HMP University of Crime course for smoking weed or selling pills. You can't criminalise people for a consumer preference. Might as well jail them for preferring cornflakes to all bran. A load of fucking nonsense. He shakes his head. Anyway, I have to go. I feel an anxiety rising in my chest. I want him to stay. No, I want him to tell me something. I have to ask. Boss, one thing. What happens to the guy in your script? The uh, racist cop? Not got to that bit yet, Bruce. Maybe you could help me, he smiles. Anyway, the welfare will be round soon. As I said, try to hang on in there. Toll departs. A good man. We are alone. We switch on the television. There is nothing on. You loved ones before Carol. No. We love only ourselves. You loved once. Surely everybody does. No. This is not us. We are thinking of somebody else. Rona. 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 We have to think of Rona. The mob of hate reminded me. Always the mob of hate. 
There were the pit villagers, and then Gorman and Settrington's thugs, and between them another mob. Who? No, it does us no good to think of that. Why not? Why not? Because it's done, and it's in the fucking past. Think of food, then. Lovely, lovely grub. I can't even eat a thing. You're becoming hard work, Bruce. Too much of the I, not enough of the we. You're eating for two now. If you can't think of Rona, I'll remind you. Rona! Rona was the wee lassie you never really knew, but who was your first love? You first saw her in the playground in the secondary school. Can you still see her standing there? In front of the art block with her pals. She did art as well, but she was the year below you. You were a 15-year-old virgin with your hormones all over the place. She had a copy of a Mott the Hoople album. Mott. You thought that this was cool, her being into that. You wanted to speak to her. Everybody probably did, but no one had the bottle. Yes, it was the way she looked that made you want to talk to her, but the way she moved repelled and Embarrassed you. Embarrassed you for you and embarrassed you for her. And then you said to Dermot, your friend at school, that you were going to talk to her. And that was that. As you approached her, you could feel your face going red, your eyes starting to water. You said something stupid like, eh, that is no as good as all the young dudes. It's better, she replied, looking at the sleeve. No, it's no. You inanely retorted, a prisoner of your own inarticulacy. Aye, it is, she insisted, and things were going nowhere until she added, It's just cause you've no heard it right. I've no got it yet, you said. You still couldn't even move in, Bruce, could you? It took a friend to say, We're playing at the night, up at her bit, eh, Rona? Rona looked embarrassed, but you took your chance then. Can I come up and have a listen? She told you, come if you want. Come if you want, I'm telling her on the phone. Just come if you want. I put the receiver down in the cradle and I realised that I don't even know who I was talking to. It was her, though. But I don't know who it was. Bunty? Chrissy? Shirley? The Polis welfare woman? Carol? Nah, it wasn't Carol. I'm sitting here inspecting the rash in my thighs. I've taken a felt-tip pen and drawn the border around the extremity of the infected skin. This way I'll be able to calculate the rate at which the infection spreads. If I could calculate my entire skin surface, I could work out how long it would take for me to be completely covered in the rash. I'll fucking well tell Rossi. I'll have the information before that useless quack can get it. In three years, four months, twelve days, and six and a half hours from now, your patient, Detective Sergeant... No, not now, Detective Inspector. Detective Sergeant Bruce Robertson will be just one big festering scab. Is that news? You question my method of calculation. My methods are my methods are my methods. I do not give an Aylesbury duck. I rise and go to the window. Those are snowstorm clouds gathering. You were in the clouds, Bruce. But part of you was unsure as to whether or not she was setting you up for more of the same ridicule and humiliation that had been yours ever since you were aware of breathing air. But you went. Hormones are a powerful force, more so in Bruce Robertson than in most young men. But you were scared, Bruce. You went down to her place on the edge of your scheme and by the river and the farm. When you got there, everything was fine. It was great just sitting in the warm and talking about music and especially to girls. You went home and masturbated about her as much as you tried to avoid thinking about her caliper. As much as you tried to erase it in the image you formed of her in your head, it almost always resolutely reappeared in all its cold, gleaming, metallic, leathery splendor. You felt guilty afterwards, but why? Every young man masturbates. You wanted to kiss her, though, Bruce. You wanted to kiss her so badly. The next day you went to her house alone. You 
listened to the album with her again, you said, would it be all right if I kissed you, like, just on the cheek? She laughed and said, nip, no, on the cheek, I want a real snog. You trembled and said, all right, well, it was strange at first, your lips and hers, they felt tight, different to how you imagined. Then you considered the saliva and germs, but soon you relaxed and got into it. Both of you, your mouths and tongues started to disappear. Your cock got hard and your head went dizzy. A couple of days later, you met her in the playground. She smiled at you and one of her friends said something. You came over. You always got a red face when you talked to her in front of her mates. In fact, any time you talked to her at the school, but it passed. After a while, you grew comfortable in the jealousy and aggression you felt from the other young men, whom you knew were looking at you and her. It stopped bothering you. You knew what they were for all their tough talk and posturing, virgins to a boy. They talked incessantly about all the lasses they had fucked, but you never saw any one of them with a butt. You confronted them with that inadequacy. That way you strutted around with Rona. After a while, you fed off their outrage. You felt yourself getting stronger and them getting weaker. It was satisfying. You started to thrive on this difference. You had always felt different, but inferior. But now you were coming to feel yourself to be different, but superior. This was how you were coming to be seen as well. All you needed to do was to accept that difference and accept the consequences. Rona made you strong. She was so proud as she lurched along with her twisting, loping stride, her head raised in a defiant serenity. There were some people around who felt themselves to be at the bottom of the economic and social structure, who had nothing to look forward to but more humiliations. They loved the idea of this beautiful young lassie in a caliper. You remember the term they used, that word which came out of their mocking, pinched, sneering mouths. Spastic. Soon you weren't a virgin anymore, you nor Rona. You couldn't do it in her house or your granny's place, so you did it up against the pillars of the old bridge down by the river. It was dark and quiet, and a sweet smell was rising up from the river as you maneuvered through the broken railings towards its bank. Rona stalled and gave you an accusing look as you turned back to face her. Come on, it's all right, Betty, you urged. A canny she spat, entangled and irritated. You freed her calipered leg from its entrapment of wire and shrub. You shifted your weight and, putting your arm around her, pulled her to you. You let her momentum, as Mr. Conroy in science used to say, pull her through the gap towards the verge. She panicked, tensing and letting her to scream, but you held her tightly and swung her onto her feet. You felt so proud that you were so strong and that she was so light. You liked it when you could get close to her like that, that warmth of her next to you, the smell of her hair, the scent she sometimes wore, her mother's probably. You had to sort of wedge her up against the old bridge to stop her from sliding down the bank into the river. She was not too pleased, tutting away, so you moved quickly, hiking up her skirt and getting her knickers down to her ankles so that she could step out of them using her good leg. You pulled them up her gammy leg and wedged them in between the thin flesh and the straps to stop them from getting dirty on the ground. Your trousers and pants are down next, but you both freeze as a car makes its way over the single lane bridge above you, crunching at the gravel as it goes. You push up against her and she helps you to get it in using her hand. She is gritting her teeth and you are as well because it's sore and you realise that you should have touched her up first to make it juicy and easier to get it in. But you are desperate, worried that she'll change her mind at the last minute, or that somebody will disturb you. The second time is like the first time. But it was the time after that, or the next one, the third or the fourth, you can never remember. That was the last. Now why can't you remember? Your mind plays such tricks on you. The last time, just like the other two or three. You are thinking that one day it would be great to shag in a bed, although this would do for now. Yes, you put your hands over the cheeks of her arse to stop it from grinding against the stone wall as you fuck her. 
She is into it now as you are getting right up and she's whispering, gaze it, gaze it, and you have your tongue in her mouth and she has hers in yours and you are making love now. It has gone way past the sordid, uncomfortable entry into a state of sheer fucking brilliance. You finish first and cannot carry on. Just like the first three or four times, you feel her frustration. You think that you should take your time. Now that it's over, you have a powerful urge to run away and leave her. She now seems like what they call her, a cripple, a spastic. But your pal Dermot says that it's normal to feel this way after you've had your all. Chemicals are exhausted in you, and they take a while to build up again. No way would you have ever run away, though, with her having a caliper. You think you love her? You lie awake at night, not thinking of Stevie and the filth, but about how good it would be if you and she were married. Not just for the sex, but so that you could have a house together and you could take care of each other. You know that her mum and dad would not agree to that. You think it is daft and soft to feel like this, but this is how you feel. Your grandmother found out. Her friend Agnes saw you kissing Rona on a park bench in town. You came home one evening and she is sitting up with a half bottle of whiskey and a few cans of Carlsberg Super Lager in front of the telly. By this time, she is in an advanced state of alcoholic disintegration. Aye, they tell us that you've got a wee girlfriend now, she said. One that can't be run away for you, one with a gammy leg. You ignore her witch's cackle and head up to the refuge of your room. Outside, they all play the same game. They call you a pervert. The son of the beast and the spastic. Rona never wears makeup to school, so she looks younger, like a first year instead of a second year. But back to that night, the night of your fourth time. You take her home, then you see them ahead. Brian Meldrum and his crowd. They are there with some bigger guys. You don't mind them calling you the crippled shagger. You can handle that. You know that it's just jealousy because your girlfriend is so gorgeous. The best looking girl in the school, easily, in spite of the caliper. You can handle what they say to you, but you don't want them saying anything to her. She doesn't deserve it, and you love her. Maybe cut across the golf course, you tell her. I, she replies, knowing what you mean straight away. She squeezes your hand and looks down. Your heart feels heavy, and you wish that you were strong enough to destroy them all, to destroy anybody who would hurt her. But they hadn't seen you. They seemed out of their heads on glue and cheap wine. So you go back down the road, through another wire fence to the golf course. Elated at having escaped at best a bad taunting, you pick up the pin from one of the holes on the course and throw it like a javelin. You are showing off to Rona, but she is saying, Dinner, Bruce, dinner, as she moves over to the lip of a bunker. Then there is a rumble in the sky, and the rain comes teeming down. Then you see a large flash, followed by another rumble. Then you hear Rona light out a strange yelp, like a small dog that has had its paw trod upon, and you turn to see her briefly shrouded in an electrical glow as she is struck by a bolt of lightning. You run the fifty yards or so towards her in the semi-darkness, the rain lashing down on you. All you can hear is the halting sob in your chest, and you can't even call her name. Rona! Carol! Stacy! I take out her picture and stick it back on the sideboard. She used to wear braces on her teeth, the wee in. They really straightened them out. A good thing, though I was against it at first. She never wore anything on her leg, though. The kitchen's smelling bad. Something has died in here. I open the back door. It's cold and I'm wearing only my boxer shorts and my dressing gown, which hangs open, but it's good to see the snow fall again. Like the Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye film, White Christmas where they open the patio doors of the General's Holiday Inn in Vermont, and the snow tumbles down, and they burst into song, and the closing credits come up. I sip on another purple tin as I watch the snow cascade down. I sing to myself, 
I'm steaming, it's a shade, Christmas. There's something on the ground, in the garden. You look down at what is on the ground, and then you have turned and are crossing the fence again, walking over into the scheme from the farm. They are shouting at you, but you can hear nothing distinct. You stop and look at the pink blossom trees, the ones Rona always pointed out to you. She loved their fragrance. Then Brian Meldrum is barring your way. Robertson, I'm fucking well talking to you. You're looking at him and thinking how hideously ugly, willful stupidity can make people look. Remember when you used to think those kind of thoughts, Bruce? You are thinking how much this boy is letting himself down without really being aware of it. Bruce Robertson, the cripple shagger, where's your wee spazzy bird today? She's away. Tidy wee piece, my hey, another guy says. I'd ride it. Fuck off, you pervy cunt, Meldrum laughs. No, but, the older guy says, she's a fucking wee doll. Just cause you cunts have not got the bottle to ask her out, doesn't it matter about a gammy leg? It's the coupon and the tits and the fanny you have to worry about. That wee Rona, wee honey man. Meldrum's still staring at you. What's up with your face, Robertson? You got a knockback? His whiny breath is on your face. Not like Rona's perfume. You hear the rain crashing off the bus shelter roof above you. Oh, she's away, gone, the golf course. Does she do lineups? The other guy asks. She's on the golf course. You're shivering now, thinking of her. How you did nothing. How it was all because of them to avoid their ridicule. In this weather, let's find her. They drag you out of the shelter into the rain, onto the bridge and over the gate. You take them to the spot where she is waiting. It's pissing doon. She'll not be here, one guy says. Aye, she will. She's maybe fucked up her leg. We'll need to take her home. Where is she? The thunder has stopped, but the rain has soaked you all. Over there, behind the bunker, you tell them. Meldrum runs over. Hey, baby, hey. He stops on the lip of the bunker. What the fuck? Fuck it. He turns back to the rest of you. Get the fucking police. He punches you hard in the guts, knocking all the wind from you and spreading a sickness throughout your body. What did you fucking roll well into her, you fucking pair? You are aware that he has you down and is putting into you. They all are. You are crying, but not for yourself. You are crying for her. And the police come and take you down to the station. They tell you it was silly to throw away the pin on the course as the lightning strikes the highest point. So it was you that killed her. No. An accident. Another accident. But the police are good to you. Kind. Understanding. Sometimes you can still see her face, so cold and stiff, her freckles like they had been painted on, not like Rona, not like when she smiled and you talked and kissed and shagged. She was your first love, but you never really knew her as well as you wanted to. She liked music, and she looked and smelled nice, and she wore a caliper, and your heart used to and still does break, if you're honest with yourself, every time you think of her. Sometimes you can't help yourself, but the games help, or at least they used to. Now they are no longer enough. What is it? A sack of coal? A find? I drag it into the cold, dark room. I slowly build up the fire and light it. It catches on quickly. I sit transfixed by the lapping flames which provide the only light in the room, except for a small, annoying flash on the sideboard next to me, which throws a dull, sick red tint over Stacy's picture. I switch on the answer machine to play back my messages. Bruce, Bunty, please call me. Bruce, Bunty, I'm worried about you, darling. They said you were sick. I called, but you weren't in. Call me. It's Chrissy. Call me sometime, sexy. Hello, Bruce. It's Gus here. Hope all is well and that you'll soon be fighting fit again. 
He's a wee dinkle. Mr. Robertson, it's Heather Sim here, Ewan's mum. It would be great if you could get tickets for Tynecastle for the Celtic match on the 21st. I don't know if that's convenient or not. If you could get back to me on 612-7443. Thanks again. Brucey baby, it's Chrissy from behind here. The last of the great pretenders. You haven't been answering either your calls or your callers. I was round yesterday. I know you're in. There are roadworks outside. Your gas needs turned off. What's the matter, big boy? Can't you stand the heat? Call me if you just happen to rediscover your bollocks. Anybody home? Oh, well. Bruce, please, please, please call me. It's Bunty. Please, Bruce. Bruce, it's Shirley. Bruce, call me. Call me. Bruce, Gus. I didn't get it, Bruce. They didn't give me it. Phone me, Bruce. I want to take this up with the Federation. You can who they gave it to. Hello? Enough of it. I disconnect the phone. More television. That's what I need. More television. No. The channels, the voices, always the fucking voices. Then I knock on my door. I can't be bothered, but the knock's getting louder and louder, and it's just like whoever it is is going to kick the door in, Polish style. I'm opening up, and he's here, standing in front of me in the doorway, and I'm looking over his shoulder, watching Tom Stronach's BMW pull out and head down the road. The winter sun glints in my eye. The snowstorm, it's gone. It's just away. Fucking hell. I had to come, Bruce, he says to us. I was worried about you. You've been through the fucking mill. I had to come, he repeats. We want to close the door, but it seems easier to let him in. We say nothing, but we go through to our kitchen and sit down. We look outside at our garden, a dead mess. It was once so lovely. Carol liked working in it. I never did. I appreciated her efforts, though. Like to sit out there with a can of lager. Simple pleasures. Stacy's swing. Got that a few summers ago now. How many? Ray follows me in and sits down opposite us, a concerned visitor. Of course, Bruce, I didn't need to tell you that while I was chuffed about the promotion, it's been a bittersweet experience for me. If you hadn't had that, well... The problems you've been having. Well, you'd have walked it, mate. Has to be said. Aye, Ray. That's the way it goes, we nod. This is what it's about. This is what Gus's message was about. Lennox's face is set in an evaluating smile, tight round the mouth, eyes searching, but strangely dead and mechanical, the polis way. You can what your problem is. He laughs coldly. You didn't practice what you preach. We can say nothing. Lennox is talking to us in the manner that pretends it's all for our welfare rather than his gloating benefit. You tell me, Bruce. Mind what he says. You need to suss out what the party line was and then spiel out the script. Aye, I mind, we tell him. You see, Bruce... You have to learn a new script. It's like all that equal ops bullshit. Just spout that at the cunts and do it with conviction. It's just another wee code you rely on. That's why the likes of Gilman. He shakes his head in a condescending smile. He's rehearsed this speech all right. Your behaviour has to be non-racist and non-sexist. You can the score. All this equal ops stuff started when mass unemployment took its toll. You couldn't have upwardly mobile schemies taking jobs from the sons and daughters of the rich. So you bring in a handful of overprivileged coons as a Trojan horse sop to equal ops while making sure you keep the good salary jobs for the educated bourgeoisie. 
You start to introduce minimum qualifications, make a uni degree essential where it had never been needed in the past. That way, you weed out people that can bullshit your script. Of course, fuck all changes. In London, coons just get to be truncheoned by a member of their own race once in a blue moon. You know the score. Lennox gives me an I've got it sussed wink. Yeah, this is true, Ray. I'm no saying you're a dinosaur, Bruce, but you've allowed these cunts to paint you that way. Keep the cards close to your chest, mate. Close to the chest, Ray, like I always told you. That's what you told me, he says cheerfully. He looks around the room, and he can't hide his distaste. He stands to his feet, Lennox the victor, Robertson the vanquished. Who would have thought it? Lennox, perhaps. Anyway, Bruce, Scott and Ash, there is just one thing, and I suppose it's something that everybody feels when they get a promotion, you know, how to relate to the old mates and all of that. He looks closely at us to see as if we understand. We are looking at him blankly. We have nothing to say. I can say this because we are both law enforcement professionals, Bruce, but your methods and mine's are very different. Now, I ken that we've pulled some shit in the past, but that's finito now. All the coke and that shit. He looks hard and searchingly at me, with an authority he's never shown before. The authority of the man who knows he has the state queuing up behind him on his side. Savvy. Sure, Ray, we say. Just as long as you realise how the old song goes. These days are gone now, and in the past they must remain. OK? OK. And Bruce, nay hard feelings, eh, mate? No, Ray, you know me. I'm no one for living in the past. I'm sure you'll do a great job as inspector. Ray grips her shoulder harshly. Thanks, mate. Right, I'd better nash. See, things today, people to see. Aye, cheerio, Ray. Cheery bye-bye, Bruce. Oh, Bruce, I saw that bladesy the other day doing the club at Shrub Hill. We all gave him the cold shoulder treatment. He looked a bit sheepish. Then Gelman went up and put him in the picture, in Dougie's own inimitable style. So I doubt whether our Mr. Blades will be showing his face in the craft again. Cheers, then, Ray winks, making a clicking noise from the side of his mouth as he departs. Click, click, click. Channel hopping. Clickety click. You grew up and started working in the same pit as the man you thought was your father. You could sense his hatred, but you had your friends now. There was an old miner, a man from Skye named Crawford Douglas. You remember him from when you were a child. He was the one who led you away from the coal bing and Stevie's broken body down the street and onto your granny's house at Pennycook. You got on well with Crawford. Your gran also did at one time, but no longer. He had lived in Newton Grange for a long time. Crawford did not get on with your stepfather, Ian Robertson, and that was a strong enough basis for you to befriend him, and he inducted you into the ancient and noble craft of Freemasonry. One night, when drunk, he told you the true story of your blood father. He wasn't dead. I'm hearing the voices, and I'm pressing the buttons on the handset to change the channels, but it's the voice in my head. That same insistent, soft voice eating me up from the inside. I change channels. Molly Hanlon's family originated from Ireland and via Edinburgh's old town found themselves working in the pit villages of Midlothian. She grew up in Newton Grange and found herself in love with a local lad, a young miner named Ian Robertson, who worked with her father. Ian did not understand the need to be married in a Catholic church, but agreed for Molly's sake. After all, he loved the girl. Then something terrible happened, something which would test that love to the full. I change channels. A Bond film. This time it's Roger Moore. 
when she was putting flowers on the grave of her dead brother, Molly was attacked by a man. She was beaten and raped. Molly gave a description and the man was apprehended. He was tried and convicted of a number of rapes and sexual assaults on women and men. It was revealed at his trial that this man suffered from mental problems, acute schizophrenia, depression, anxiety attacks. This terrible tragedy was compounded when it was established that Molly had become pregnant by this man. She asked her local priest for guidance. Father Ryan told her that as a Catholic it was her duty to bring this life into the world. Ian Robertson, though devastated, stood by her. The wedding was brought forward and the child bore the name of Bruce. I changed channels. Cartoons. Walt Disney, Beauty and the Beast. Ian Robertson stood by his wife, but every time he looked at the baby, he saw the face of the man from the front page of the Daily Record and the caption, the face of a beast burnt in his skull. You knew you weren't like him, like that thing. You had to prove it. I changed channels, adverts, real Scots read the record. You came to know that face. The old daily record was on the microfiche in the Glasgow room of the Mitchell Library. You would stare for hours at that face, trying to find something in it, some humanity. That strange pilgrimage you made into Glasgow, it took up all your free time. Sometimes you would take time off from your job in the pits, take time off to look at the face of the beast. You had to tell yourself that you were nothing like him, but the women, you wanted them, you always wanted them, but so did all the young men. It was normal. I changed channels, repeats of please, sir. You remember Miss Hunter? Bruce? At the primary school in Pennycook? You have to remember her cruelty towards you. She was the brittle, stick-like woman who victimized you with a zeal far in excess of the casual sadism she displayed towards the other pupils. It seemed so personal. Sometimes she would take you aside and shake you and hiss softly in your ear. I I know everything about you, you nasty, evil little man. The harder you worked, the harder you tried to please her, the worse she would be towards you. The telly goes off. I don't know whether it's day or night. Some empty purple tins lie in front of me. The fire still flickers. A welfare woman called at some point. I can't remember what she said. I need to do something. I pull on some clothes and go outside, making my way towards Collington Village. The only person I can think of visiting is my physician, Dr. Rossi. The waiting room is full of smelly old cunts, but I've got the upper hand on them now. I'm minging in this old coat. Take some of that, you snobby old cunts. I produce a purple tin from my coat pocket. You can't drink in here, the receptionist tells me. I flash my ID at her. Police, I tell her. Working undercover, I explain to the old wifeys. One makes a twisted gun with those old, dried-out lips. I want to grab a syringe and fill it up with the contents of the old purple tin and shoot it right into those old lips, rehydrating them instantly. Plastic surgery, I tell her. Modern techniques, everybody can afford it. As my can to toast technology. The receptionist calls me and I go in and see Rossi. His jaw drops as I enter. And if I gave a look and Matt Goss... I'd say his lack of bedside manner is unprofessional. He's the McDonald's of medicine, and it takes him a shorter time to come to a diagnosis than it does for them to serve up a Big Mac. You're depressed, Mr. Robertson. 
I don't do this lightly, but I'm going to prescribe Prozac. Fine, we tell this physician. Rossi, though, something is different about him. It's as if it's just dawned on him that he's approaching middle age, and he's never going to reach surgical greatness. This prescribing pills to sad old cunts, and being a glorified clerk, like polis, teachers, social workers all are nowadays, this is as good as it gets. A normally buoyant physician is giving off the defeated, depressive stink of a man whose own limitations have caught up with him. It's a smell we've grown accustomed to lately. It oozes from every sick pore in my own body, as surely as the stale whisky sweat which accompanies it. When we, I, we are leaving his surgery and walking through the village, we screw the prescription into a ball and sling it in the water of Leith at Collington Dell. Then we go to the Royal Scot for a pint. This is the only fucking drug we need. Peeve. It was that fucking coke that fucked us up, that cunt Lennox. Brought us down to his level, then nipped in and stole the job that was ours. We should have picked that up, should have seen the signs, but we were weak. We must now be strong. Sleep fails to take us during the night. Thoughts are flying through our head like an endless merry-go-round. We can see the merry-go-round, our wife and child waving to us from the stupid horses as we sit and drink our tea in the piazza of Princess Street Gardens, always distracted, lost in our own thoughts, our dreams of revenge against those who transgress the laws of the state. We cannot break the cycle by having a fucking wank, because every time we conjure up a picture of a woman, we see the yob's faces, or those of Lennox, or Toll, and arousal to our relief is impossible under those circumstances. Terror's grip on us seems physical. Sometimes it slackens, but it never lets go. We are walking again, through the dell, through the long passage, which is like an old railway tunnel. There is one point in this tunnel, the point we have now reached, where it bends and you cannot see the light ahead, nor can you see it if you look back. A couple of steps forward and the light shines, a couple of steps backward, and a glance over your shoulder and it's the same story. But here, just at this point, this is limbo. There is the sense that if you stay at this point for too long, stop at this point of oblivion for a certain amount of time, you will just cease to exist. And we cannot move. The air blowing from the polar regions across the inhospitable sea and directly into your tobacco-ravaged lungs is so frozen that it feels like an arctic core in your body. I can feel it here, Bruce, and I don't like it. You feel that warm mammal flesh wrap around it like layers of blanket assimilating it, allowing its goodness to flow to the organs of your body, breathing. Breathing, I don't like it. Get out of the tunnel, Bruce. The tunnel swirls around us, the stone configuration visible, starting to spin through the filthy, bruised darkness. We hear voices, but we are not tense. Then we are sadly not in oblivion. We have no sensation of leaving the tunnel or the wooded glen. But we know that we have somehow gone back up onto the main road, through the noise of the occasional car and its lights. Then the Napier University, and the rise of twilight, and the chirping of birds up towards the gardens at Gilmore Place, and then we are at the King's Theatre. Stacy and Carol, and Stacy's wee pal Celeste with us at the pantomime, to see Mother Goose featuring Stanley Baxter and Angus Lenny out of Crossroads. We saw it. Oh, no, we didn't. Oh, yes, we did. It's light, and we are cold. Our teeth chatter together. A jakey coughs an insult at us, or it could be a request for money. We look in our pockets, and there's a twenty-pound note and some change. We take out the twenty-pound note and hand it to the jakey, who sees the pain in our eyes, and his own eyes focus in a grateful, then fearful sobriety as he takes the note and mumbles something approaching a grunt of some... Shortly before the minor strike, on hearing this news of your true father, you left for London and joined the police. You pored over the press cuttings from the Scottish Library. 
You thought of your own conditions, your own problems, and related those to your natural fathers. This man, the most feared and hated in the prison system, kept isolated for his and others' safety. The man who became known simply as the Beast. You needed to keep going, to keep busy, to shut out thought. You were normal. You left the pits and joined the force, then got married. You settled down, you had a child, you were normal. Only there came the anxiety attacks, the depressions, the desires. We travel in the opposite direction, back the way we came. In a shop window we see our thick, dark growth. We should have shaved. What is there to do but go home? Home. Home is the darkness. I don't have any photographs, only memories. I can still vividly recall the time I went in to see him. My own father, the one who never abused me, never forced me to eat coal, never called me the spawn of the devil, but he was still the one I hated most. I'd got used to places like this with my work. I'd started not to notice them, but not this place. You had to notice it, had to feel the omnipresent, sickening bleakness of it on your approach to it, that huge perimeter fence seeming to run the length of the ugly void of shite-house towns, schemes, industrial estates, factories and old mines which spread between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Inside, the smell, the disinfectant. No other smell like it. Similar to a hospital, but staler and more rank. I was shaking as the screw, Josh Hartley, opened the cell for me. All my data of him was gleaned from that one twisted photograph in the daily record. I thought he would look like the most evil thing I had ever seen. It was anticlimactic. My anxiety fell away, but I felt loathing and contempt rise as I looked at this slight old figure. Could this really be the beast? His eyes. They were not the eyes of a killer, but the eyes of an old sweetie wife, privy to some malicious gossip. His nose, hooked, not like mine. Mine's is like my mother's. I wanted to haul him down onto the floor and stomp on his head to crush the life out of him, to take his just as he'd given me mine. I thought of my mother. I resented her weakness. How could she have let this pathetic thing do that to her? How could she not have fought him off? Did she want it? Did she want him? Did she want that? No, never. How could she have grown the seed of this scum inside of her for some fucking stupid church run by cunts who didn't even get their fucking hole, or only fucking supposed to at any rate? It's against regulations. It's against regulations for a prisoner in this category to be left alone with one officer, let alone a visiting cop, but the screw was a craft stalwart. He gave me time alone, just five minutes. More than enough when you've been schooled in the discipline of the slippery stairs. I thought that I would have wanted to say something, to accuse or to question, but I never spoke. There was no point. I just moved towards the beast. What do you want? What do you want? He cackled at me, picking up the hatred and the focused intent. When the officer returned, my hands were round the beast's neck and his split head was bouncing off the wall. The screw stopped me, hauled me off. The beast still rots away in the psychiatric prison, he is used to being assaulted by prison staff, but I hoped that he remembered that one as a little bit special, but probably not. Listen to me, Bruce. You're different to him. He made his choices, you made yours. You chose to protect people from predators like him. You chose to uphold the law. You are too hard on yourself, Bruce. You had a family. You were different to that monster. They wanted you to be the same, 
right from the start. You were the one thing an isolated, terrorized people could kick out at. That was the role you took on, but you're different, Bruce. You're different from him. Never mind, Rona. There was Carol. You had Carol. Carol was the other. You fall in love, and after you have returned from London, where you were working with the Met, you get married. I change channels. A documentary on Margaret Thatcher. But the impulses are still there. The impulse to hunt and control in order to try and fill the void inside. You think of the man who sired you. You are repulsed and proud. The urge to hunt, demean and control is great in you. To somehow get back at them. You consider politics as a career. How wonderful it would be to start a war, to send thousands of people to their deaths. You idolize Thatcher over the Falklands. You try to imagine the buzz she must have felt when the word rejoice came from her lips. It makes you feel like you did when you were a child. While other children fantasized about killing in wars, you wanted to be in the position to send others to their deaths from the safety of an oak paneled office. In your head, you practice speeches condemning the enemy. You look at the job and curse your own limitations and the ones set upon you. From circumstances like your own, you know that you cannot achieve power without going through interminably boring processes. But you must have protection because the normals will incarcerate you in order to protect themselves. So the police force always seems the best bet. I change channels. Holiday. Judith Chalmers explores the Great Barrier Reef. You are restless, however. Australia beckons. The New South Wales Police, with its reputation for petty corruption, greatly appealed to you. But you are not a bad man, Bruce. Whatever you did, you always came home to Carol. You had Carol. I switch off the television. I had Carol, but I fucked every other woman I could get my hands on. Didn't matter what they were like. Prostitutes, relatives, birds on a night out who were up for it, workmates. If I'm being honest, I liked quite a few of them, although it was always easier never to admit that. I did it all the time, at any opportunity. Carol only did it once. Carol got back at us through shagging that coon. She said she loved him. That was all I knew about him. He was black, and she said she loved him. We couldn't help it, finishing that cunt off. It was when we were with her, dressed in her clothes, in that club wearing her clays with the specialist large shoes we ordered from the shop in Newcastle. These jobs had set upon the cunt, kicked him unconscious. We just had to finish him. We didn't know whether or not it was the guy Carol was with. We did him with the claw hammer we used for our protection on the streets. We bought it in Chelmsford on the way back from Tony and Diana's. Drummond could search all over Scotland. We needed to have it. There were people who would try to hassle us. We needed to have it, Carol and I. Aye, we were in Jammy Joe's, and we saw Ethan Worry dancing, drinking. We tried to talk to him, but he was dismissive of us. We thought he was the same guy that Carol was with. We just wanted to talk to him, to find out if he knew her. But he dismissed us, rejected Carol and me. He never loved her. He just used her. It was the principle of the thing. Fuck it, anyone will day. We wanted to hurt. That Estelle Davidson lassie was looking at us all night. She had seen us in the women's toilet. She had pointed us out to Gorman and Settington and the other thugs present. That was when we had to leave. We had to leave and wait on them. We had to do this in order to pay them back. But they got the coon. They got him first. I finished him, but they got him first. I don't know why. I don't care why. Probably just because he was there. Perhaps he was chatting up their buds. I don't care. I only care about me. Even that is a lie. Don't do this, Bruce. Don't do this. 
Don't do this. You're better than this. Don't do this. There's more. I only care about me and about why I don't care about anybody else. She thinks that she can do what she likes. Well, there's no fucking way, and she's poisoned the bairn against us with these silly, stupid lies that she tells, the festering whore, and it's all gone wrong, and she has to be shown, has to be made to pay, because this is no fucking use. When we call her at her mother's, all we can say is that we want to see the bairn again, that we want to talk, sort out the divorce. Her voice is not the voice of the carol we know. There is now no room for the words that she had waited for for so long, the words we were not capable of speaking, the ones that might have made a difference. In the absence of the words she became meat, a repository for my cum. To be fucked, to be wanked over, to be made to do things she would not otherwise have done. In the sex clubs we joined, bent by the will of my... Need? It's not her voice. I almost like this woman. She sounds like Carol before. Enough. Now that we've told her to come, all we can do is sit and wait and prepare. Prepare to do the cow. For good. Be reasonable, Bruce. Nothing is so bad that it can't be made better. Maybe not with her. But you have your whole life ahead of you. Please, please, don't do this. It's not fair. Don't. I've made the T-shirt we're wearing. It has You Caused This on it in big black letters. The noose feels tight around our neck. We look up at it. Strung on the rafters of the attic, and we're now just waiting, ready to drop out of the hatch as soon as she turns the key in the lock and pushes the door open. We'll land right in front of her in the hallway, so she'll have that on her conscience for the rest of her fucking life, the fucking whore and liar. Bruce! 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 We wait and think and doubt and hate. How does it make you feel? The overwhelming feeling is rage. We hate ourselves for being unable to be other than what we are, unable to be better. We feel rage. The feelings must be followed. It doesn't matter whether you're an ideologue or a sensualist, you follow the stimuli thinking that they're your signposts to the promised land. But they are nothing of the kind. What they are is rocks to navigate past, each one you brush against, ripping you a little more open and there are always more on the horizon. But you can't face up to that. So you force yourself to believe the bullshit of those that you instinctively know to be liars. And you repeat those lies to yourself and to others, hoping that by repeating them often enough and fervently enough, you'll attain the godlike status we accord to those who tell the lies most frequently and most passionately. But you never do. And even if you could, you wouldn't value it. You'd realise that nobody believes in heroes anymore. We know that they only want to sell us something we don't really want and keep us from what we really do need. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we're getting in touch with our condition at last. It's horrible how we always die alone, but no worse than living alone. Don't press! Don't Now I'm ready, and I hear the key. I jump, and I'm falling. Then I feel myself rising, 
I hear a crash, but there's no pain, and there's a figure at the frosted glass of the door. But it's not her, it's too wee, it's Stacy. No, Stacy, for fuck's sake, don't open the door, don't. And I care. I want more than anything for Stacy not to be there and see this, and I'm trying to shout, no, go away, and I hear her screaming, Daddy, and I want to live and make it up to her, and Carol, and I can hear her now too, screaming, Bruce, because I care, and I've won and beaten the bastards, but what price victory? Stacy, please, God, be something else, someone else. I feel myself slipping out of my host in a large pile of his excrement and sliding down his leg inside his flannels. Then I'm away from him. There's a piercing scream. Somebody's in pain, like the other was when the host was disposing of it. The other I loved. Now the host is gone, and I cannot sustain this any longer. I can't sustain life outside of the host's body. Like the other... I am gone, gone with the host, leaving the screaming others, always the others, to pick up the pieces. That's the end of Filth by Irving Welsh. Read by Jonathan Hackett and Jacqueline King.